Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin the, the opening session of the 16th World Policy Conference. Uh, for those having breakfast, uh, please uh, find your seats in the plenary ballroom and feel free to take your coffee with you if you like. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin the opening session of the 16th World Policy Conference. Please find a seat in the plenary ballroom. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to address you once again and welcome to Abu Dhabi, to the United Arab Emirates. We are thrilled to open the doors for the 16th edition of the World Policy Conference in Abu Dhabi for the third time. This conference has been a cornerstone of our annual calendar for the last three years as it continues to foster and drive forward insightful dialogue and discussion on a wide variety of issues, challenges, and opportunities, all led by foremost thinkers, leaders, and dear colleagues. Your considerable expertise forged across years of dedicated service in every field manageable will all assist, assist to create the kind of open, honest, and meaningful discussions and spirited debates we have come to expect and enjoy from the World Policy Conference. We must never pass up an opportunity to learn from one another. As we strive every year to do so, the organizers have gathered together an impressive group of attendees and speakers so that we might better understand today's and tomorrow's most pressing issues. It is important that we discuss these topics because as challenging as 2022 proved to be, 2023 has proved even more so. Before we can start though, we must acknowledge the devastating events happening in our region. Since the war in Gaza broke out, we express our deepest condolences for the loss of civilian lives and our thoughts go to those who have lost loved ones as a result of this conflict. Tragically, the loss of civilian lives in Gaza continues to this day, the ongoing damage being uh, perpetrated upon the people has created a humanitarian catastrophe unfolding before our very eyes in real time. We are working relentlessly to reach an immediate and full humanitarian ceasefire so the, li the life-saving aid could be delivered to the Gaza Strip. Every effort must be made to protect civilians and to immediately put an end to this conflict which we were witnessing as a result of decades-long failure to make progress towards a political horizon that ends the occupation and brings peace for Palestinians and Israelis alike. And as we continue working to stop this war, we cannot ignore the wider context and the necessity to turn down the regional temperature that is approaching a boiling point. The risk of regional spillover and further escalation is real, as is the risk that extremist groups will take advantage of the situation to advance ideologies that will keep us locked in cycles of violence. Therefore, as our region is facing a critical test today, we must also consider the wider problem of extremism and terrorism within and across societies. There is no peace for extremism in the world. It is a scourge that is not home to any particular religion or any country. We must use all available tools and the wisdom occurred through often painful lessons to solve this shared challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, recent events in the Middle East, including the situation in Gaza, other ongoing conflicts and simmering socioeconomic cleavages across the region and the wider world requires strong diplomacy and cooperation among us. This is also the case of the war in Ukraine, which continues unbattled, causing further polarization on the geopolitical front and affecting the global economy and food security. We have largely recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic, but there is much concern, as there should be, on what we will do when the next pandemic occurs. Artificial intelligence has entered the mainstream and impacts our daily lives, while climate change makes itself felt more each year. As all this going on in the world continues to undergo systematic change, as new players emerge, the old, the old order comes under strain and calls for more inclusive world order, find more space for discussion. We have our work cut out for us. Despite all of this, there are clear opportunities for all countries and actors to seize if they possess the political will and courage. And so we embark on this path. I want to assure you that the United Arab Emirates will remain a true partner and a bridge builder. 
were committed to upholding aspirations of peace and prosperity for all in real and practical way. Because in the modern world, crises have far-reaching implications for all of us. This also applies to the greatest long-term threat of humanity, climate change. Though climate change is often discussed, it is time that we take stock of our progress and make sure we are heading where we need to go. The UAE is proud to host COP28 this year and only a few weeks which underscores the seriousness with which we'll treat this issue. We have striven to be a leader in our efforts, but ours is not a solitary effort. COP28 is fundamentally a collective effort and our aims for this conference must cover multiple lines of effort because addressing climate change requires further and ambitions each year because solutions are possible. And we must make progress towards an inclusive and results-oriented COP that keeps the 1.5 degrees goal within reach and significantly scales up investment in the coping capacity of vulnerable communities. The struggle to address climate change includes opportunities to alleviate the crises, including food and water insecurity, as well as global health challenges. We have learned just how vulnerable supply chain systems are in previous years, especially for more frequent climate disasters. Addressing food and water insecurity is of paramount importance and in many ways the base for which to build on. And in recognition of the significant impact climate change has on global health issues, this year COP28 will host the first ever Health Day and Climate Health Ministerial at a COP which will introduce an official high-level health initiatives, emphasizing establishing robust and inclusive, uh, inclusive healthcare systems that can withstand the challenges posed by, by it. Fortunately, we are more equipped than ever to meet these challenges and seize these opportunities both technologically and institutionally. The rapid spread of uh, AI has only just begun to be understood and AI is only growing more capable. Yet, technology can only be developed and realized through an educated workforce. The UAE is naturally focused on building a knowledge-based economy that creates a diverse and inclusive workforce with special attention to investing in youth and women, whom we believe will be crucial to creating the necessary solutions. Additionally, at the institutional level, we have developed existing and new institutions to assist us. In the UAE, we also believe very strongly in the importance and role of international organizations as they reflect our deeply held belief in the virtue and necessity of cooperation based on shared values to advance cooperation and build up regional and international integration. Regional organizations, new and old, serve an, imp an important purpose in helping tackle our pressing issues. Organizations like the African Union and the League of Arab States play a crucial role in their understanding of their prospective contexts, the problems they face, and the best solutions for tomorrow. They furthermore serve a complementary role to traditional international institu institutions that still fulfill a vital role in cooperation. For despite the changing global order, the UN remains the key institution for international cooperation. At this difficult geopolitical time in our history, polarization is growing within the UN Security Council, making consensus harder and harder to reach. We have witnessed the first hand during our tenure at the Security Council these past two years as we have worked to overcome this issue, reform and renewal is needed for the UN. Still, there remains no viable alternative to the UN for achieving cooperation through our shared values. It is these values, ultimately, that define our shared humanity. They are the reasons we recognize the need to combat climate change and to resist falling prey to, to base our instincts. instincts. Tolerance and coexistence are our greatest legacy. Helping each other is, not very, is in our very nature. It is keeping these ideas in mind that we inaugur inaugurate this year's World Policy Conference. We do hope that this year 
we can spark the types of discussions and generate the ideas that stick with all of the attendees and speakers, that they carry with them what they learned and to their lives, into their work, and from, to, and from there towards a meaningful change. My true best wishes to you for a very successful and a very fruitful conference. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, for this uh, excellent introduction to our debates and uh, thanks uh, to the Emirates through you for their hospitality uh, here today, especially in those uh, tragic circumstances that you have uh, alluded to. So now I'm going to say a few words myself, and as usual, I will alternate uh, French and English. Uh, well, French, well, English, French, and, uh, and French, okay? Or French and English, French, okay? That's clear. Uh, lorsque, ça va tout le monde a le, le casque, lorsque, uh, autour de 2005-2006, je réfléchissais à ce qui allait devenir la World Policy Conference, l'utopie de la mondialisation libérale qui avait pris corps en même temps que la chute de l'Union soviétique avait déjà perdu une partie de son éclat. Ma façon de présenter cette utopie en quelques mots est sous la forme d'une sorte de réaction chimique abstraite qu'on pourrait appeler la formule de Fukuyama, du nom du théoricien de la fin de l'histoire, enfin le vrai théoricien de la fin de l'histoire, c'est Hegel, bien entendu. Donc cette équation, c'est quelque chose comme démocratie plus économie de marché entraîne paix plus prospérité, dans les deux sens. Démocratie plus économie de marché entraîne, comme dans une réaction chimique, paix plus prospérité. Intellectually, the equation falls flat on two counts. First, None of its four terms is completely and unambiguously definable. Second, even if assuming such definitions did exist, they would tell us nothing about the historical processes likely to pave the way for democracy and the market economy on the one hand, and peace and prosperity on the other, when the starting point is far from an ideal objective situation. There is no such thing as spontaneous generation in life, in this or in any other realm. Le premier grand rappel à la réalité fut le choc du 11 septembre 2001, dont les effets se propagèrent instantanément sur toute la planète. Depuis ce jour-là, on sait qu'il suffit de petits groupes fanatisés résolus à exploiter une religion à leur fin et à recourir aux méthodes du terrorisme pour accroître la haine et finalement l'instabilité partout dans le monde. The end of history ideology would have held up only if major territorial, economic or other conflicts had been settled first. But then, Assuming that such a situation could even be imagined, Fukuyama's formula would amount to a simple tautology. For example, the harmonious pairing of democracy and the market economy would necessarily imply a social contract capable of addressing the sense that wealth and power are unjustly distributed a tall order about which great intellectuals such as the Indian economist Amartya Sen have extensively written. Dès son origine, le projet de la World Policy Conference repose sur une vision objective 
et non pas normative du monde. La mondialisation contemporaine est une réalité sans précédent dans l'histoire, car elle provient, à partir des États-Unis, d'une vague de technologies qui n'a pas cessé de grossir depuis une bonne soixantaine d'années. Cette vague est caractérisée par la transmission instantanée de l'information en quantité toujours plus grande. Selon l'image que l'on s'en fait, pareille capacité est la meilleure et la pire des choses. Elle peut favoriser l'évolution dans la direction du bien commun comme dans celle du déchaînement de la haine. Mais alors que le progrès, mais alors que le progrès se construit pas à pas, la haine se répand à la façon des épidémies. Elle finit par s'éteindre, mais seulement après que les foyers qui l'entretenaient ont disparu, longtemps après, parfois. Three simple ideas have underpinned the WPC project from its outset. The first is that the objective foundations of globalization are irreversible. This means that all of us must adapt to it the best we can. Not by tearing down borders in the literal sense of the term, which would be the quickest way to bring about the shock of civilizations that kept Samuel Huntington up at night, but by fostering cautiously openness to others, cautiously openness to others, so that everyone can benefit from the diversity of an international society that is heterogeneous by nature. In reaction to the consequences of too much openness, we risk closing ourselves off from other to such an extent that the world might again be divided into blocks. What I am expressing is the concept of reasonably open world. Reasonably open world. La deuxième idée est celle de gouvernance. Ce terme est rarement défini avec précision. Il ne s'agit pas d'un gouvernement mondial, inconcevable pour très longtemps encore. Il ne s'agit pas non plus du droit international comme si la régulation du système international pouvait être déléguée par les États à des juges, autant dire potentiellement à l'intelligence artificielle. Pendant longtemps encore, pareille régulation ne pourra que reposer sur une collection de groupes d'États, une collection de groupes d'États et d'institutions œuvrant de manière cohérente pour assurer la stabilité structurelle du système. En termes simples, l'objectif est de ne jamais trop s'éloigner d'un équilibre non pas figé, mais qui se déplace continuellement sous l'action de multiples forces sociales, économiques, politiques ou autres, puisque la figure du changement est indissolublement liée à celle du temps. Les équilibres dont je parle ne s'identifient pas à un simple rapport de force. L'exigence de stabilité structurelle implique la recherche en commun d'un équilibre entre les intérêts fondamentaux de chaque partie prenante, ce qui oblige chacun à tenir compte du point de vue des autres, quand bien même, quand bien même il en réprouve certains aspects. Je n'hésite pas à me déclarer Kissingerien à cet égard. « Good governance » means not allowing imbalances to grow so severe that conflicts could not be resolved by peaceful means. Without claiming to assign responsibility, it is clear in my mind that the fall of the Soviet Union upended the security situation in Europe and that the main stakeholders have never addressed the issue as such. Likewise, As events in recent weeks have painfully recalled, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been simmering on the back burner for years, but was always about to boil over. The first condition for progress in the idea of governance 
is for states and institutions concerned to clearly share the objective. If they do not, opening up the international system increases geopolitical and geostrategic risks other, rather than reducing them. La troisième idée à l'origine de la WPC est celle de puissance moyenne. En créant cette conférence, j'ai précisé d'emblée qu'elle ne serait pas d'esprit occidental dans le sens des alliances scellées après la Seconde Guerre mondiale autour des États-Unis ou même du point de vue des cultures ou des civilisations. Je ne vois aucune contradiction, au contraire, entre la nécessaire fidélité à la culture ou à la civilisation à laquelle on se rattache en tant que citoyen et le respect que l'on doit manifester pour les autres. De ce point de vue, je m'inquiète lorsque j'entends le président des États-Unis situer son pays comme le leader naturel des « démocraties » entre guillemets contre les « autocraties » puisqu'il ne précise ni ce qu'est vraiment une démocratie ni ce qu'est vraiment une autocratie. Comme dans son regard, cette ambiguïté ne s'applique manifestement pas à la Chine, pareille posture compromet, compromet tout progrès d'ampleur dans le domaine des biens communs, comme la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique ou contre les pandémies. La WPC se refuse à toute taxonomie politique simpliste et son point de vue ne s'aligne pas sur celui des plus grandes puissances, quelles qu'elles soient. Elle entend privilégier la voie des puissances moyennes, c'est-à-dire des États qui, sans être nécessairement dotés de ressources importantes, sont néanmoins résolus à en consacrer une partie pour contribuer positivement à la gouvernance globale. The first great global shock of the 20th century came on September 11, 2001. The consequences of this event and of the American policies that ensured especially in Afghanistan, are still reverber reverberating across the globe. But that was just the first in a series of major events which together revealed how fragile the international system remains today. The first WPC took place in Evian on October 6, 8, 2008, at the same time as a critical moment in the subprime crisis when Lehman Brothers failed and the specter of the 1929 crash and the Great Depression loomed over the horizon. Those attending Evian, and some of them are here, included Jean-Claude Trichet, who is, where is, is he? He's not far from here then president of the European Central Bank, who, with his central bank counterparts, played a key, the key role in averting a crash. Since then, the international monetary system has withstood several tests, including the tremendous structural shock caused by the West's response to the Ukrainian war. This event largely, but not only, fueled the return of inflation and of policies the likes of which had not been seen in 30 years, and those effects are partially enforceable. The second major jolt was the poorly named Arab Spring of 2011, which set the Middle East ablaze, not to mention Libya, whose breakdown contributed to the destabilization of the Sahel. One consequence of this overarching fiasco has been uncontrolled migration to Europe. I imagine that here too, historians will pass harsh judgment on how these crises were managed, or rather not managed at all. Plus près de nous, la pandémie de COVID-19 a bouleversé les sociétés et les économies du monde entier et aurait dû nous servir d'avertissement pour renforcer la gouvernance sanitaire mondiale notamment l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. Malheureusement, comme on le verra au cours de cette édition de la WPC, la dégradation d'ensemble du système international paralyse les réformes nécessaires, de sorte que nous pourrions nous retrouver n'importe quand 
dans une situation comparable à celle de 2019-2020, voire, voire pire encore. « No sooner had the pandemic ended, in quotes, when Russia's invasion of Ukraine opened up a new chapter in the history of Europe and in the West's relations with the rest of the world. This period is all the more fraught with uncertainty given that the war is likely to drag on or freeze over in a Korean-style scenario with immense global consequences. Enfin, l'agression d'une barbarie inouïe d'Israël par le Hamas le 7 octobre dernier a encore ajouté à tout cela une couche supplémentaire d'incertitude, d'ampleur naguère encore difficilement imaginable. La surprise a été totale pour Israël et ses alliés et, et montre une fois de plus qu'on ne doit jamais s'en remettre totalement à la technologie pour assurer sa sécurité, sans parler d'une catégorie de supplémentaire d'incertitudes qui sont intrinsèquement liées au progrès technologique lui-même, comme pour l'intelligence artificielle dont les effets sont largement imprévisibles, même à moyen terme. That, in a nutshell, is where we stand. There are very few places where personalities from the five continents in search of effective governance that will benefit international society as a whole can express themselves in confidence. The way forward must be inspired by deeper collective reflection on the idea of justice. Because, I repeat, a sense of injustice is the main fuel for hatred. A minimum, of, a minimum of justice, even more than material prosperity, is necessary for peace. Many, may, may all of us, organizers and participants, remain faithful to the spirit of the WPC and never forget that, however modest our contribution to peace, it is expected and therefore useful not to say necessary. Je vous remercie. Et maintenant, nous allons écouter un message d'Emmanuel Macron, président de la République française, qui va être lu par Laurence Boone, secrétaire d'État chargé des Affaires européennes. Donc, nous allons écouter un message d'Emmanuel Macron, président de la République française, et il sera lu par Laurence Boone, qui est secrétaire d'État pour les Affaires européennes. Mesdames et Messieurs, en vos grades et qualités respectifs, c'est une joie pour moi de pouvoir transmettre quelques messages aux décideurs, aux chercheurs et aux leaders d'opinion du monde entier réunis dans le cadre de la World Policy Conference. Cette nouvelle édition est la preuve que malgré les crises, la communauté internationale continue de raisonner et d'agir ensemble. Et donc je tiens vraiment à remercier les organisateurs de cette conférence et en particulier son fondateur et président, Thierry de Montbrial. Mon message pour l'ouverture de cette conférence est très simple. Nous vivons une période de prolifération des crises. La guerre revient sur le sol européen, elle revient au Moyen-Orient, le Sahel est plus que jamais menacé par, la, par le terrorisme, et sur le plan économique, le choc de la pandémie a créé les conditions d'un retour en arrière majeur dans l'histoire de la mondialisation. Et pourtant, nous n'avons d'autre choix que de coopérer. Soyons clairs, cet impératif n'est pas tant un impératif moral qu'un impératif existentiel. Car qui peut encore dire aujourd'hui que le changement climatique n'est pas une menace sur notre sécurité collective Qui peut encore dire, à l'âge de l'intelligence artifi artificielle générative, que l'émergence et la dissémination de nouvelles technologies par-delà les frontières n'est pas l'affaire de tous Enfin, qui peut croire que l'extrême pauvreté et les inégalités qui s'accroissent dans le monde ne créeront pas les conditions des conflits de demain. Pour toutes ces raisons, la polarisation du monde n'est pas une option. 
Mais soyons lucides, c'est l'immobilisme qui fait le jeu de ceux qui souhaitent voir le monde se fracturer. Nous devons inventer une nouvelle gouvernance globale. Et vous avez un rôle à jouer, car le monde a besoin d'idées nouvelles. Les institutions internationales doivent être repensées. Le Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies s'impuissante car il n'a pas donné de voix à ceux qui pourraient, par leur poids, participer à la sauvegarde de la sécurité collective. La Banque mondiale et le FMI n'ont pas intégré à leur juste place les économies émergentes. Le poids relatif de ces institutions dans l'économie mondiale décline par conséquent et nous perdons en capacité d'action collective. Un système à double régime est en train de voir le jour, ce alors même que nous aurions urgentement besoin d'un nouveau partenariat entre pays développés et pays émergents et d'un choc massif de financement pour la transition énergétique. Sur le climat, nous devons repenser notre méthodologie. La COP28, qui sera l'occasion d'un premier bilan mondial de l'accord de Paris, nous offre l'occasion de le faire. D'abord, nous ne pouvons plus penser que l'aide publique au développement est le seul budget de l'action climatique à l'échelle des pays en développement. Davantage de pays, à commencer par les grands pays producteurs d'énergie fossile, doivent participer au financement de cette transition. Le secteur privé doit intervenir car ce ne sont pas de milliards dont nous avons besoin, mais de trillions. Ensuite, nous avons besoin de trajectoires beaucoup plus claires pour la sortie des énergies fossiles. Je l'ai dit à New Delhi et je le redirai à Dubaï, il n'y a pas de scénario crédible où l'accord de Paris soit compatible avec le développement des énergies fossiles, à commencer par le charbon. Enfin, nous devons inventer un nouveau logiciel pour l'économie mondiale. Nous entendons beaucoup parler de « de-risking ». Prenons garde toutefois, là encore, à choisir la bonne méthode. Le dérisking de nos économies, ce n'est pas le retour du protectionnisme. Le dérisking, c'est trois choses. D'abord, c'est la multiplication des partenaires, plutôt que la relocalisation généralisée, dont le coût serait exorbitant. Ensuite, c'est le meilleur partage de la valeur ajoutée, car si nous voulons plus de partenaires fiables, nous devions mieux partager les technologies, les emplois et les richesses à l'échelle de la planète. Enfin, le dérisking, c'est la tarification du carbone, car c'est une économie qui continue de sous-tarifer ce qui pollue le plus, est une économie qui met en risque ses propres fondations. Sur tous ces sujets, inventez avec audace les solutions dont nous avons urgentement besoin. Repensez la gouvernance globale avec la même détermination que d'autres l'ont fait avant nous, après la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Enfin, mettez au cœur de votre propre réflexion l'impératif de solidarité sans lequel il ne saurait y avoir de gouvernance globale véritablement efficace. C'est le sens du pacte de Paris pour les peuples et la planète, lancé en juin dernier avec plus de 40 chefs d'État et de gouvernement. Ce pacte repose sur un principe clair et en même temps exigeant. Nul ne devrait avoir à choisir entre la lutte contre la pauvreté et la protection de la planète. Nous nous retrouverons pour beaucoup d'entre vous, d'abord au Forum de Paris sur la paix, que la France accueillera à nouveau cette année les 10 et 11 novembre, puis à la COP28 de Dubaï. D'ici là, je vous souhaite une excellente conférence.
think that we'll all speak in English. So I think I was checking the uh, mic. It functions admirably well, uh, apparently. So uh, we will start our panel. We are uh, privileged uh, with, uh, I have to say, a very, very impressive panel on this issue of the major mid-term, long-term issues for the global economy. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the members of this panel. The, the first on my left would be Gabriel Felbenmayer, uh, director of the Austrian Institute of Economic Research, the WIFO, and professor at Vienna University. He is also, he was also the head of the IFO Center for International Economics in München, the very famous IFO Institute. And he was also president of the Kiel Institute of the World Economy. So an extraordinary career, if I may, in chairing a very, very important institution. We will then hear what uh, Sébastien Jean has to say. He's a senior associate of the IFRI and a professor of economics in Paris at the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers. And he holds the chair Jean-Baptiste Say, which is a very, very good mentor, if I may, <laughs> on uh, industrial economy. He's also a member of many, many council and he has previously been director of the CP in Paris. So thank you, Sébastien, thank to you. come. We are very honored. John is a, an old friend, I have to say. I have to declare. <laughs> John is a friend. <laughs> Senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute at John Hopkins. Uh, he, is, uh, he was first deputy managing director in the IMF, was also acting managing director of the IMF, and uh, he was... Uh, uh, he had very important uh, uh, position in the private sector. So again, John, you're a globetrotter. We see you in Shanghai, in Seoul, in uh, everywhere in the world, in Delhi. And uh, you were kind enough to come. Thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, we have Marcus Nolan with us. So thank you, Marcus, very much. Executive Vice President and Director of Studies at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. <coughs> and uh, you have been senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in the executive office of the President of the United States. And uh, you, held, you hold research or held research and teaching position in ma many universities, top, not universities, including Yale and John Hopkins. So here we are blessed with uh, your presence and uh, I think uh, we could say that we are prolonging in the economic sphere what uh, uh, Thierry de Montbrial said a moment ago at the level of the globe and uh, uh, on, on all dimensions, if I may, including technological dimension, political dimension, social dimension. We will be more modest, uh, we will perhaps try to elucidate what are your main messages as regards precisely the main issues for the global economy in the present time. I would certainly say that there are many, many numerous uh, dimensions uh, to the uh, questions which is asked uh, explicitly in our panel. I will only list those questions, but as I said, each of us has messages, will concentrate on some message, and it is what is important, taking into account their experience and uh, what they have done in the world until now. So I would only mention technology, as said uh, Thierry, is a major, major driving force, and uh, we are experiencing with artificial intelligence something which... Uh, is particularly striking, but it's not near a start. It's only a start. Science and technology are progressing on a very large front. I will note climate change, don't insist, green transition, 
we are in on a single spaceship, which is planet Earth, and we recognize that we had to take care, all of us, without any exception. And if there is a domain where it is absolutely clear that uh, all countries concerned have to take care, it is certainly taking care of the single spaceship in which we are. As another point would be, of course, uh, reflecting on global trade, what happens in global trade, what happens in the hedging of the global, long global value chain. The change of attitude with the global change is very striking, has a lot of, uh, I would say, counterproductive consequences, both as regards the growth on the planet and as regards also the push for inflation of the planet if we are not optimizing <coughs> the global value chain as we did before, but clearly this is a very important trend. We have, of course, the fight against inequalities, which was also mentioned by Thierry. I think is a, it is something which is generalized the world over. Advanced economy, emerging economies, all uh, countries and economies on the planet have this threat, uh, which is the looming inequalities. And of course, I will uh, uh, say a word on inflation, which is uh, one of the big, big challenges that we have today. On that, I would only say that I am reasonably confident that the central banks will regain control when time comes. I take it that uh, in the year 25, we will probably have inflation, core inflation, say, in order not to be too depending on the volatility of some prices, but core inflation around 2% in the medium term, which is the single goal, the single definition of price stability that we presently have the world over. It came out of the crisis of Lehman that, uh, again, uh, Thierry mentioned. And I have to say, one of the major <coughs> consequences of the Lehman crisis is that all major central banks that are uh, members of the basket of the SDR, whose the currencies are uh, part of the basket of the SDR, so namely the US, Europe, Japan, and the UK, have the same definition of price stability. I consider that this is something which is extremely important, underassessed, underestimated by, I would say, academia in general, uh, unfortunately, because, again, it's one of the de facto uh, transformation of uh, the international monetary system that should be uh, analyzed and, uh, and uh, studied much more. That being said, I don't want to take much of, of the time, and I turn to my neighbor. What would, you, what would you say? How would you send your messages? I know that you have slides, yes. and I thank you for that. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Jean-Claude, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Thierry de Montréal for setting this up. It's always a pleasure to be here, an event that I'm looking forward to the whole year. My privilege and uh, honor this morning is to start this session off, uh, and I'll do so with a number of slides. Uh, first of all, the state of the world economy, summarized uh, with a very Eurocentric view here, uh, for economists, uh, the Eurozone, the United States, the UK, and China. And what we see here is a state of fragility. You know, we see that those bars uh, go up and go down. Um, the Eurozone's not growing. Uh, these are quarter on quarter growth rates. The third quarter is just in, flash estimates, so quite fresh. The Eurozone is at the brink of a recession. The United States are surprising us with relatively high growth rates, quarter on quarter in the third quarter 2023. The annualized growth rate would be almost 5%. Uh, this is a lot. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, you say, uh, Jean-Claude, but uh, uh, in, those, in those times where we need to cool down our economies to get rid of inflation, this looks uh, red hot, uh, too much, and unsustainable. And China, the engine of growth for so many years, is uh, 
not growing steadily. It's up and down. And uh, one of the, the major impressions that this slide gives to me is how similar the Chinese and the American experience look like if you look at those, at those bars. And the United Kingdom here uh, looking very much like uh, the Eurozone. The world as such growing with a rate at, of about 3% uh, in this year, next year, a little bit more, but certainly below the uh, levels that uh, we have seen over the last years. Now, that is not surprising given the shocks that we have been under. Uh, and I would say what we should take away from that is not only divergences across uh, the Atlantic and across China and, uh, and Europe, but a relative uh, lack of uh, collapse, no? because resilience is uh, what we should see here. Even for the Eurozone, uh, the feared recession, if it comes, will be a mild one and uh, uh, we're not uh, facing a big, big disaster here. The next year, some improvement in the Eurozone yeah. in our estimates, some improvement in the United Kingdom, uh, <laughs> decline in the United States uh, and the shift sideways in China. The big issue for us economists over the last uh, two years or so, of course, has been inflation. The good news is that uh, headline inflation is coming down uh, on the uh, on the right hand side, you see the, the United States, on the left hand side, the Eurozone. In both, it's coming down. Core inflation is very much the same now in those two areas, uh, surprisingly, something like 4.2, 4.1%. Uh, <laughs> but what you also see is that um, uh, the Eurozone has uh, a larger uh, trajectory to run through. We have been at higher rates than the, than the Eurozone. And what uh, worries me, me here is uh, that um, the 2% target is still quite. Uh, uh, far away from us. Uh, if you look at the green, the green bars in this uh, in this picture, this is services inflation, uh, and you see it's very high, both still in uh, the United States and also in the eurozone. And the services inflation, of course, reflects wage growth most uh, or more than all, all the other categories. And so I think we we must say the job's not yet done. Uh, the central bankers are gaining back control. That is true. But um, uh, I fear that uh, uh, we're really in a situation uh, higher for longer, uh, as, the, as the professionals say. And uh, the fight against inflation will define the world economy for more than the next one or two years. My fear is that um, uh, the strong increase in interest rates uh, uh, will feed into financial risks and we have not seen everything yet. So on top of all the geoeconomic uh, struggles that we're facing, the climate disaster, financial risks I think are high. Uh, the rates will be longer for, higher for longer, I've said so. But we know that monetary policy comes with a lag and uh, that lag can be substantial. Um, and uh, my view is that uh, were a, a large share of what monetary policy will achieve has not yet, is not yet visible in the data. Uh, we see that fiscal policy needs to, be, needs to become sustainable again. That's true in the Eurozone, but it's very much true in the United States. Um, uh, and that too will put pressure on, uh, on growth and on, uh, on uh, the financial markets. Quantitative tightening has not really fully started uh, and that uh, uh, will also uh, uh, affect uh, interest rates, the long-run interest rates and the growth perspectives. Only 20% according to some uh, um, estimates of the total impact of monetary policy tightening is yet in the data, so more to come. Uh, and um, uh, what I fear is that um, the financial crisis that we have seen you know, uh, showing its face um, uh, earlier this year is not yet over. Somewhere all those fixed income uh, assets must be that have uh, come under pressure over the over the last uh, years with the high interest rates and we, we only need a big shock you know that forces uh, insurances for example to liquidate their holdings uh, to see more financial stress in the system uh, so i'm a bit fearful on this side and i'm also a little bit fearful about the eurozone inflation differential differentials across the zone are huge uh, uh, in the october uh, inflation rates the difference between Slovakia and Belgium is something like 950 basis points. That's enormous uh, and uh, something that worries me quite a bit. Uh, we are far away from, a, from a, an optimal monetary area in Europe. This should not be possible uh, if we were really having an integrated single market. And the interest rate spread uh, across the Eurozone is up um, 
uh, look at Italy with almost 150% of debt over GDP and the, and the interest payments more than doubling. Uh, that puts stress on the system. Now, if I, let, if I may look at the international arena, what we see is that uh, the boom uh, in use of economic sanctions is going on. This is the, the translation, if you like, in, in economics, what we see in the political world, um, war by other means, as the political science colleagues say, political conflict that's fought out with economic means. The trend's not good, so this is data from the global sanction database that I'm putting together with US colleagues at uh, exponential growth. Um, that is certainly something that's weighing on, uh, on the growth perspectives of the world economy and shows that the political risks are, of course, translating into economic risk because sanctions mean uh, disruption of global value chains, mean uh, decoupling, at least at the bilateral level. And so that's what we see here in terms of globalization. That's my preferred measure of globalization is just taking a quantity index of international goods traded divided by quantity <laughs> index of industrial production. So we're hopefully comparing here apples with apples and uh, not bananas. Uh, and what we see here is resilience on the one hand. No? So the world has not deglobalized, but, it, but the hyperglobalization here in blue has stopped and it had stopped like 15 years ago. But what we do see is at the, at the, in, the, in, the in the newest data that uh, the world economy is slowing down, a significant decline in this measure, so trades falling faster than industrial production. The World uh, Trade Organization's trade reports are relatively alarmist, you know, the last, latest version of it. Um, and I think what we can say is that the decoupling that's happening, for example, at the bilateral level between the United States and China, is also eating into the aggregate data. Trade diversion uh, can only go some way to mitigate the bilateral effects uh, of uh, less trade, for example, across uh, the Pacific. And then uh, something I would like to bring our attention to is uh, uh, the enlargement of the BRICS group uh, the, uh, to six more members. I think this uh, is significant. Uh, it's under discussed as far as I can say. There are implications on the world financial system as the BRICS have their own bank, for example, and setting up uh, uh, more autonomous currency systems. Uh, and the enlargement, of course, involves uh, this country here, the United Arab Emirates. And so I thought it's important to bring it up. In terms of numbers, share of the BRICS plus six uh, in global GDP or in global population, this enlargement is not making a big change. But what it does is it brings in countries that have been outside of uh, uh, of the inner circle of, uh, of policy making, like Iran, for example, uh, into, the, into the BRICS. And I believe that is a challenge uh, for the world order as we've seen it. Uh, the hope is that this does not lead to more polariz polarization, but certainly uh, it should, uh, uh, th this event tells us something about the situation that we're in in the world economy, and we should uh, take note of this. Here I'll stop, Jean-Claude. Thank thanks you. for having me again. Thank you very much, Gabriel. You, you stick to the concept, <laughs> which is give messages, short, concise messages. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, on, on the inflation, I will only say I share entirely the views. Uh, that being said, I was struck myself that core inflation on both sides of the Atlantic is now exactly the same figure, yeah. which says something and gives credibility to the fact that they have the same goal. They have the same definition of price stability which is reassuring, all taken into account, even if, uh, as you said very wisely, the challenges are still there, of course. So thank you very much. Can I turn to Sébastien? Thank you, you Jean-Claude. <laughs> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, I, I'd like to share a few thoughts about uh, the way the world economy interacts with uh, world politics somehow. My starting point would be, uh, will be to observe that what makes probably the present situation quite unique is uh, the intensification of grid power competition in a context of uh, close uh, inter economic and financial interdependence. Uh, this has uh, translated uh, recently in a situation where we see that the multilateral frameworks are somehow destabilized and overwhelmed, as witnessed by the spread of uh, economic <coughs> restrictions uh, on trade and uh, investment flows, of uh, exceptional duties, uh, tariff duties, on uh, the spread of economic sanctions, uh, and so on. 
um, on the witness also uh, by the, the, the spread the, the spread sorry of um, uh, uncoordinated uh, uh, industrial policies and, and state uh, increased state interventionism. So this is a, um, a situation uh, marked by uh, increasing geopolitical tensions, but I think it's fair to say that at least until now, the result has not been, or at least not to a large extent, uh, it has not been decoupling or fragmentation. We've seen a kind of plateauing, and Gabriel uh, uh, showed it in, in figures a moment ago, in terms of the intensity of world trade. Uh, but there is no established trend toward decline in economic and financial uh, relations at the, at the world level. There are some, case, some, uh, um, some cases, some specific places where this is uh, indeed uh, there is a, um, a decline. Uh, and this is, for instance, the case in, um, in terms of the bilateral trade relationship between the US and China for well-understood reasons, but it is remarkable that even in that case, for instance, study after study, it is shown that when the intensity of direct trade between the US and China is declining, uh, indirect trade is actually uh, increasing, meaning that uh, the US is sourcing less imports from China, it will be sourcing more from a variety of countries, say Vietnam, Mexico, for instance, and these countries themselves source, are sourcing more uh, components from China. Meaning that aiming at decoupling what we are observing actually is not decoupling of fragmentation, it's more diversion with uh, ensuing costs and opacity. And questions about uh, uh, whether uh, uh, this is reducing in any, any meaningful terms uh, uh, risk or, or uh, um, degree of dependence. So I think we, we somehow we have to live with this inter economic and financial interdependence. Of course, the situation of geopolitical tensions and economic interdependence create a very strong temptation to leverage interdependencies for political purposes, to weaponize them. And I think that's really a, a difficult uh, uh, defining feature of the present situation. But it's also a very difficult uh, objective. Difficult because economic and financial exchanges are defined by a principle of mutual benefits. They are taking place because they are benefiting both parties. Meaning that it is very difficult for one of them to uh, usefully leverage uh, them. When is it possible? Well, when there is a situation with a very pronounced asymmetry. Uh, um, and only in such case is it possible really to efficiently leverage uh, these economic and financial interdependencies. And I think this is the reason why in the uh, recent examples of weaponization of economic dependencies, we are seeing the increasing importance, the, the overwhelming importance of finance of information and knowledge, because these are uh, dependent, dependent interdependencies, uh, uh, these are activities that rely uh, upon very concentrated networks. Think, uh, the monetary si think about the monetary system with the role of the dollar, think about international banking transaction with the role of the SWIFT uh, uh, system, think about information with social networks or uh, uh, about high-tech and semiconductors, for, uh, for instance, with uh, intellectual properties. In every, each, each of these cases, you have very complex networks where uh, a, a few shock points, as uh, Henry Farrell and Abe Newman uh, uh, have called them, are uh, taking uh, uh, a central importance and can be uh, uh, leveraged and have been leveraged uh, for many of them recently. So it's a situation that in a recent paper uh, uh, published with, together with uh, uh, Thomas Gomar, we uh, define as geofinance, meaning uh, to, to reflect the fact that it is marked by an increasing politicization of financial and information flows. 
And it's somehow different from what we used to uh, seeing in terms of geoeconomic competition in the 1990s or the 2000s, which was mainly taking place within the framework uh, of multilateral institutions. Here, in many cases, uh, uh, this, uh, um, this competition and this uh, um, weaponization is in breach of uh, international commitments. So, I think it is not surprising, given this uh, uh, situation, that economic security is becoming an overarching concern for uh, governments. Um, with mainly two uh, objectives. The first one is to reduce vulnerability and build leverage uh, with regard to these shock points, to these critical nodes in the world economy. And the second one is to control or at least master to some extent foundational technologies. And here I think the interaction is very strong with climate change because climate change is already an ongoing revolution in terms of for industry, for trade, for raw materials and, and uh, uh, energy. It's redefining the, the key technologies, it's redefining the, the, the way markets are, <coughs> uh, are working. So, uh, the, the challenge today for many governments uh, is how to um, uh, reach, a, how to improve economic security in a context where increasingly, for the reasons I described, they are not considering international markets, world markets, as secure enough. In a context as well, I think it's worth emphasizing that where isolation is clearly not the solution for two main reasons. The first one is efficiency. International division of labor is a sine qua non of efficiency today, especially for uh, sophisticated technologies. And the second one uh, could be term, uh, a was term uh, relational power by, by Susan Strange, the need to have allies or at least to have partners to support your views. And we see that in this context of tension, this is <coughs> increasingly important. So uh, relational power requires openness, requires uh, 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 significant economic and financial relationships. Um, so. Uh, this is a challenge. I think it is um, uh, really important to emphasize as well that uh, increasingly the response of governments um, is uh, uh, using more ambitious, uh, more widespread industrial policies. Um, and uh, it's worth as well uh, uh, emphasizing that while uh, in the 80s, for instance, will be uh, economists were commenting uh, a lot the fact that uh, some policies were used uh, as a, a, a way to kind of uh, appropriate rents, as rent shifting policies. This is a typical example for that was uh, the competition uh, uh, between Airbus and Boeing, as uh, the efforts of government to somehow appropriate the, the, the oligopolistic rent in this sector. Today, it's more about control, about power, than about rent. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the same kind of logic I is taking place, uh, a logic where uh, every, everyone is trying to appropriate and everyone needs to somehow to retaliate to what others are doing. So I'll conclude just in, uh, by emphasizing the, the threats um, uh, involved in these trends. The threats, of course, are additional and useless costs from an economic, uh, economic point of view linked to these additional obstacles and constraints. It's also in the additional rigidities uh, uh, ensuing from, from this constraint, and I think that uh, uh, means a lot in terms of uh, adjustment capacity for the world economy in the time to come, with, of course, a, a significant risk of escalation. All this uh, for a benefit which uh, we, we can discuss it, but I think so far uh, is very limited in terms of uh, uh, de-risking, uh, as uh, uh, the term, the fashionable term uh, put it. And the, finally, the, the last and probably most dangerous threat is that all these uh, uh, constraints jeopardize the capacity of coordination at the world level. So I think the, this is a very important challenge in terms of economic governance globally. And I think part of the re response should lie uh, around somehow ring fencing uh, the security concerns 
in the world uh, economy and the world finance, and um, as a precondition, probably to uh, update coordination and rules in other sectors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sebastian. I, I take it that your exploration of the uh, impact on global economy and trade in particular, and also the over overall industrial diversification associated with the tensions associated with this will to de-risk to uh, have a, a world in which we would uh, incorporate uh, uh, precisely these major changes in the global tensions is something which is very important. I take it that uh, uh, with uh, global trade uh, being under the impact of this uh, French shoring, uh, reshoring, uh, or whatever. Of course, it has a cost first, and second, it has a, an impact on the global growth, and it has also an impact on inflation, to be frank. So uh, all this is intertwined in a way which is very striking. Thank, thank you, you very much, mm -hmm. Sebastian. <coughs> John, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first, uh, to Thierry Montréal, congratulations on this new edition of the World Policy Conference, and thanks for including me and having the chance to appear on this uh, panel with my friend Jean-Claude Trichet and his other illustrious colleagues. Let me make a, a few comments on the uh, the outlook. It's, it's quite appropriate that uh, the timing of our conference today comes just weeks after the G20 leaders uh, summit meeting in New Delhi and the IMF World Bank annual meetings in Marrakesh and as we heard from the minister, and we know, in just a few weeks, the COP28 will be meeting here in Dubai to discuss uh, progress, or hopefully to make progress on climate change issues. Uh, I'll take as my uh, starting point the, for the outlook, the World Economic Outlook of the Fund. No offense, Gabriel, they're, they're, very, they're very similar. They're very similar. <laughs> the, uh, the IMF noted that uh, global GDP grew 3.5% last year, 3% this year. Their forecast for next year is 2.9%. And that's compared to the, in the space between 2000 and 2019, that's including the global financial crisis, world GDP had av growth had averaged 3.8%. And the IMF's forward-looking forecast is for the next five years of growth of 3.1%. In other words, by historical standards, this is a very mediocre outlook at best. They also characterize the outlook as rather uneven and quite uncertain. And notably, they don't expect inflation to return to its pre-COVID uh, performance until at least 2025, not, uh, not a very uh, pleasing uh, result or forecast. So what are the key issues? Uh, to me, one of them is exactly the outlook for inflation. Right now, central banks are advertising that their rate policy is likely to be higher for longer. Of course, that depends on their expectation that inflation is going to be relatively sticky. It certainly seems reasonable at this point, but we also shouldn't forget that it wasn't that long ago that central banks were advertising their policy as lower for longer. It really is going to depend on the, on the outlook for inflation. And here it's possible that there will be not differentiation in target, as Jean-Claude underscored, but differentiation in, res in outcomes. And if so, this will uh, have a substantial uh, impact both on global markets, but also on the status of financial risks. Right now, a substantial uh, perception of, an, of financial risks is related to the substantial rise in long-term interest rates, especially in the US, and the combination of losses that that implies for uh, current holders of these securities and interplay with likelihood of uh, continued high policy rates. So simply to say, I'll leave it with saying, 
if inflation outlook is more favorable than the consensus, just as it was turned out to be more difficult than had been the previous consensus before the COVID-related inflation hit, uh, these worries could uh, uh, diminish. But it remains quite uncertain. A second key issue, of course, is one of the sources for both the differentiation in economic uh, outcomes, but also the pressure on long-term capital markets has been the substantial run-up in debt, in especially uh, in the fiscal sector, especially among other places in the U.S., and the assumed pressure on budgets going forward that uh, also are an important element of the perception of likely uh, financial and, and economic risks. Once again, this remains controversial in many countries in Europe, but especially in the U.S. The outlook for uh, the uh, uh, election in the coming year, and I know we'll be having a session on these things uh, later in the conference, could have an impact on the outlook for uh, public deficits and the growth of debt. There is an obvious linkage that is often overlooked. One of the reasons why the run-up in public debt that occurred in the wake of the global financial crisis was not as anywhere near as destabilizing as many thought was because of the continuation of very low interest rates, including long-term interest rates, which meant for many years following the crisis, despite the increase in the stock of debt, the percentage of government revenues that were dedicated to, to debt service was declining, not rising. It's only in the last few years, last couple of years, that that trend has been reversed. Hence, the centrality of the, of the future performance of inflation and the uh, outlook for, uh, for, fiscal, for fiscal policy. Another key issue, of course, and one that's uh, been discussed already, is that for trade. For sure, we've seen the following. For the, essentially, for the 60 years following the formation of the Bretton Woods system, Global trade grew faster than global GDP, almost without exception. In other words, it, just as the architects of the, of the post-war system had anticipated that the restoration of a global trading system was going to be a key element driving global development. Since the global financial crisis, or the, let's call it the end, for the past 10 years, eight of the past 10 years, global trade has grown more slowly than global GDP. And that remains the case this year. And the outlook going forward certainly remains problematic. There are various forces that are uh, at work here. One is for sure the uh, use of sanctions and protectionist measures that Gabrielle's slide showed us. These uh, are, and the, the threat of additional uh, use of protectionist measures is, is an ongoing threat. At the same time, however, in response to COVID, the experience of COVID, there's been a much greater attention paid to the resilience of supply chains. So some of what we see in the changing direction or the changing nature of supply chains in, uh, in various markets <clears throat> is certainly trade diversion, as, as, as Asian was telling us. But some of it is, let's call it more organic, uh, attention to, um, to the issue of resilience and reliability of trade in, uh, in, of supply chains in, extreme, in more extreme circumstances. Time will tell, but the recent G20 um, Leaders Summit pledged to uh, restore 
the uh, functioning of the WTO and to work towards a more open trading system. However, when you read the content of their undertakings, it is far from certain whether this, this is going to happen. Why this is particularly important is because of the, in, the uh, growth in trade and services that is, of course, complicating because it is not well dealt with in, uh, in trade legislation. And secondly, the prospect of new technology that could once again bring forth a, an improvement in productivity growth similar to what we saw in the 1990s. So this, the development of technology and the evolution of the trading system is going to be is going to be very important. And in that context, I should have mentioned already, the increased, uh, the increased use of subsidies and other forms of industrial policy and its risk of complicating the, the trading system. So was there something new that has come out of this round of meetings at, uh, of uh, global leaders? And I would say yes. And that is a greater, much greater focus on the provision of what are called global public goods. Matters to deal with climate change, environment, health, food security, etc. What has happened so far is a much greater attention at the level of intentions to deal with these issues that would imply potentially non-trivial changes in public policy and in the, uh, 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 the provision of these goods at a global level. But what is also clear at this time is the lack of clarity about how this will be accomplished. So it's an inten a substan potentially substantial new public policy initiative at a global level that so far in the, if we look at the latest round of, of uh, meetings, is more intention so far than real action. But it's something to watch closely. I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, John. I take your point on the longer, higher, for longer, uh, coming from the central banks. My interpretation is that they have to fight permanently against market participants that are calling <laughs> for interest rates decreasing as rapidly as possible. So it's, yes. a, it's a way to counter a yes. spontaneous, uh, that we, uh, I would say, move that we understand pretty well because they are talk, talking their books and uh, it's uh, normal that uh, the market would give that signal. And I take from all what you said, and it, it's also valid for the other speakers, this uh, idea that uh, de-risking is okay decoupling would be totally catastrophic, yes. which is more or less a message coming from Europe also uh, in the difficult circumstances in the geostrategic tensions that we are uh, experiencing. So I turn now to Marcus. We are up to you, Marcus. What would you say? <laughs> well, I think we've reached the uh, point in the morning where everything has been said, but I haven't said it. <laughs> Um, when I was when I received the invitation to participate in this panel, uh, I eagerly accepted because it's a great honor. I looked at the composition of the panel. I saw that we had so much talent on uh, macroeconomic and financial matters that I thought I would focus on effectively microeconomic issues as kind of a compliment. I think we are in the midst of a transformation of international trade and investment relations uh, driven by the revival of industrial policy in the major economic centers. Compared with the previous international trade regime, this system will be more complex and considerably less transparent. It will be vulnerable to political capture by, by uh, special interest groups. Uh, it will possibly be accompanied by overall reductions in economic efficiency and uh, will give rise to international tensions. So how did we get here? 
there are two principal drivers. The first, which I hope, uh, if not all, most of us could agree on, is global warming and the need to adopt policies to internalize externalities that the market will not um, uh, do on its own. The second is more controversial, and that's the geopolitical uh, justification. And I think the best intellectual um, uh, rationale for this was actually provided by Canadian Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christia Freeland. She argues that, um, in essence, the West, during the Cold War, the West got lucky. Uh, the Soviet Union self isolated, so the West was free to construct a liberal uh, open order, and there was no contradiction between. Uh, engaging in trade and investment relations, everyone prospering together in military security. In contrast, in the present, China has embraced the global economy, and so this creates a tension between economic integration on the one hand and military security concerns on the other. Um, that is the intellectual justification for what uh, uh, was called decoupling. Uh, uh, President uh, uh, von der Leyen of the European Commission more politely called de-risking, which you, which you just referred to. In the case of the United States, these two concerns have been um, uh, met by two sorts of policy thrusts. In the case of the geopolitical objectives, the, the concern centers on semiconductor chips, the two main policies have been the CHIPS Act of the United States and then a set of export controls uh, aimed at restricting uh, export of chips and manufacturing equipment to countries of concern, mainly China and Russia. In the case of climate change, the thrust has been through two big pieces of legislation, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, often called IRA. And for uh, these remarks, I will focus on uh, electric vehicles and batteries. In both cases, the policies are complex. They're not entirely transparent. They make considerable demands on government competency and ability to implement effectively, and they've caused car heartburn in partner countries. Um, the CHIPS Act uh, allocates a bit over $50 billion for subsidies for production and uh, research and development over the next four years. Uh, it prioritizes uh, supply chain security, that is to say chips currently made in Taiwan. It is open to both um, uh, domestic and foreign firms, in particular uh, interest of firms from Taiwan and Korea, uh, and it excludes China and Russia. Uh, and companies receiving that funding uh, have to, uh, cannot build new capacity in China for 10 years. The export controls uh, aim at deterring pr high-end production in China, which means that the policy is dependent on third-party cooperation. This is a case where the U.S. government got lucky that the nature of the semiconductor industry is there are some choke points that require minimal cooperation from third parties in order to implement. But there's no guarantee that will be the case in the future with industries of very different industrial structure. Think, for example, biotech. The U.S. is not alone. Europe has its own CHIPS Act. Japan has adopted a similar set of reshoring or friendshoring incentives and, for example, is providing subsidies for uh, an American firm, Micron Technology, to build a plant in Hiroshima. So while the U.S. is leading the charge, uh, it is not alone. In the uh, climate change, uh, again, I'll just focus on electric vehicles because that's where a lot of the current trade action is. Uh, the U.S. legislation creates consumer incentives. It builds out the charging infrastructure, encourages domestic production. But the way it did it had uh, a strong domestic uh, preferences, which caused problems with our partners. Um, and enter, one of the things you need to understand about this legislation is the IRA is a thousand pages long. The Congress didn't know every detail of what it was voting for when it enacted it. It has all sorts of unintended consequences. One of these was to make those consumer incentives uh, apply to American built automobiles, but not ones from Korea or European Union, who understandably got upset. Some enterprising bureaucrat at the Department of Treasury, who probably deserves some sort of Nobel Prize in applied economics, discovered that there was a provision written for trucks, which are normally leased, 
which if reinterpreted could be applied to cars. And the Koreans and the Europeans could continue to export to the United States and get the consumer subsidies. Likewise, the legislation incentivizes use of non-Chinese uh, minerals in the production of the batteries for those cars. Um, and it's created uh, because of a provision that uh, uh, essentially endorses production and free trade partners. It has created the strange uh, phenomenon in Washington where Korean firms who build the batteries are lobbying the U.S. government to conclude free trade agreements with Indonesia, Philippines, Argentina, and other potential sources of supply. In it, it, it appears to be kind of a software patch, so to speak, and it wouldn't be surprising if the Congress went back and revisited some of these provisions if the Congress could actually act, which given the dysfunction is, um, is, is an open question. Implementation is uh, complex. Uh, it depends significantly on administrative regulations. It's not transparent. It is costly to remain informed, and that non-transparency creates uh, opportunities for political capture by special interest. Europe has its own CHIPS Act. Um, it also has the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, which is going to create problems as well. So more broadly, the European Union is tackling these problems with an emphasis on taxes. The United States is emphasizing subsidies and tax provisions. Um, and there is a need to bring, to reconcile these differing approaches to generally commonly shared goals. Um, there is a real question to me whether the U.S. government is currently constituted, is up to the task of uh, implementing uh, a policy as complex as this one. And I heard that uh, President Macron has closed uh, ENA, the uh, French school for training uh, public uh, administrators, he might consider reopening it in the United States. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent conclusion, if I may, Marcus. <laughs> uh, to be frank, uh, the name is different. I'm not sure that uh, the education will be that different, but we will, we will, <laughs> we will see. So uh, I guess that uh, uh, usually we, we go for a new round for second mm -hmm. remarks to be made, particularly to criticize what had been said by the other uh, members of the panel, or to compliment, or to do anything. But <laughs> any of us has the, the will to communicate something that would be complementary to what has been said. Otherwise, I, I go again, Gabriel. <laughs> you would be the, the first for this second remark. Would you agree? Yes. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, no, I. There's, there's not much uh, disagreement here, I think, uh, amongst the, the four of us, uh, unfortunate for the, uh, for the conference, of course, uh, but uh, uh, I think what we, we must uh, stress more than we did uh, in these last uh, 45 minutes is the internal uh, frictions that we're facing uh, in, within the United States and within Europe, uh, probably also within China. We don't see much into it, but, uh, but I, I guess it's, it's, it's there as well as an explanation for what we see in our external relationships. And yeah. uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, regional elections in Germany in the last months, uh, you see an increasing polarization uh, that's fed by inflation, uh, but it pushes countries into a, into a more, let's say, um, aggressive external policy stance as well. Uh, and uh, the conundrum is, uh, on the one hand, uh, to, to get inflation down to, to make sure that the internal cohesion improves. Uh, on the other hand, this, this external assertionness or whatever it is, call it decoupling or de-risking or, or um, the search for strategic autonomy, all these things, that is actually making it harder to achieve those uh, uh, internal cohesion objectives. No? Uh, as has been said, no? the fragmentation is costly. And, uh, and, and that will be borne by whom? No? Most likely by the most vulnerable. Uh, and it makes these this, uh, internal divisions even stronger. So that's a conundrum that I, I, I see I'm a little bit um, out of wits here. I don't, I don't know how we can deal with that, but I, I think the first step will be to, has to be to see that, uh, that those uh, uh, de-risking policies tend to increase inequality. And, and then that fosters polarization with consequences that lead to more uh, external uh, frictions. Um, Thank you. Clear enough, clear enough. Sebastian, what would you say? 
Thank you. Um, first, perhaps a, a, a comment about um, uh, the fact that uh, we are uh, discussing the, the difficulty of coordination, the difficulty to stick to uh, international commitments and rules. I just want to emphasize that I, I, I think it shouldn't come as a surprise that rules, uh, multilateral rules, are not able to contain uh, grid power competition because by themselves, uh, as they cannot, uh, rules are unable to, to, to contain grid power competition as long as there is no political agreement uh, upon the, the direction, the objectives. And so I think that should be uh, reaching some kind of uh, political ag uh, agreement uh, about uh, the, the, the framework of coordination should be the priority. Uh, the second point uh, has to do with uh, um, uh, coordination and uh, inflation. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, the financial risks uh, entailed by the policies, uh, uh, monetary policies in uh, advanced economies recently. I think it's a good illustration of the threats uh, involved by the lack of coordination, uh, uh, the fact that it will increase the asymmetries in the world economies. In the world economy, it will make it, it makes it increasingly uh, difficult to uh, take into account a variety of objectives because uh, um, uh, it, it will uh, um, make coordination on various counts uh, uh, less less easy. Uh, the, um, uh, the, de the, the development, the spread of industrial policies is another example because that's only something that uh, countries with uh, uh, enough financing can sustain. Uh, so it's also a source of asymmetry, of lack of inclusiveness at the, at the world level. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much. <coughs> your remarks, uh, we are valid uh, for uh, Europe as well as for the uh, global economy. I have to say I am struck myself by the uh, convergence on both sides of the Atlantic on the monetary policies, on the first results of monetary policy, core inflation being more or less the same. When we were in very difficult position, the Europeans were uh, uh, hit by the war in Europe much more than the US, obviously, in terms of, uh, I would say, price of oil, price of, uh, of food, the fact that uh, the US is self-sufficient uh, in many respects, uh, both in fossil uh, mm. fuel and also for uh, food. Uh, and that, that, of course, creates a difference, which is very, very substantial, obviously. And uh, nevertheless, I mean, the goal remains the same, the likelihood of reaching the goal is, in my view, as credible as uh, it was before, before war in Europe. And so that, that, that is something which is the silver lining, if I may, in comparison with what you, we, you had on both sides of the Atlantic after the first and the second oil shock, which was totally dramatic. Uh, inflation unleashed, uh, inflation... Uh, steady at 14% uh, and interest rates at times at 20%. So we are, uh, I would say, claiming that 5% uh, in the US, 4% in Europe is too much. But I mean, <laughs> we experience 20 because we made mistakes in the previous mm. time, in the previous oil shock. Anyway, uh, what would you say, John, yourself? Well, uh, first of all, just to uh, continue on with what you've just been saying, the uh, it's very positive that we've made progress on inflation. And like you say, that uh, at least for the moment, uh, the progress is quite similar on both sides when we look at core inflation. What may be left as a residual effect of, among other things, the, the uh, war in Ukraine, is a difference, a change in price structure relative to what it was pre previously. In other words, it's quite likely that relative prices of energy in Europe is going to remain higher than it was previously. In other words, this is undoubtedly going to be associated with structural change in economic growth in, in Europe and in trade patterns as well. Another aspect uh, I wanted to mention was that we've, we saw an incredible boom in the Chinese economy in, re in past years that was associated with huge increase in demand 
for basic commodities, metals, et cetera, uh, of imports to the Chinese economy from, from elsewhere. Huge increase in exports of manufactured good from China. Uh, my sense uh, from my recent visit is uh, China is changing substantially. Uh, that the, the source of their economic growth is going to have to change and it's going to slow down and the growth in domestic demand in China is slowing down and is likely to main, remain relatively calm relative to what it's been previously. And that's one reason why trade is going to remain more subdued and different than it was before, not just because of subsidies, of course that's part of it, and uh, not just because of sanctions, but because of some underlying, underlying changes in, in the global economy. That brings me uh, back and uh, wanted to make an, one a, a quick uh, uh, comment. So we've seen these, these uh, large challenges, and I would say, and Sebastian uh, pointed out, that previously, when the G20 was founded in the context of the global financial crisis, it was able to act decisively because among other things, there was a lack of, of a sense of great power conflict, as you remember. That it wasn't that individual countries forgot their, their interests. It was a, a real sense that if we don't hang together, we will, we will hang separately. But time has shown the weakness of the structure or lack of structure of the G20. That it has, on the one hand, put itself as above the multilateral institutions, but itself has no legal standing and has no voting process other than there's a, a veto power on the part of every, of every uh, participant. As a result, it's an organization that is, finds itself very hard, or I don't even want to know if, call it an organization, but uh, it's an entity that finds it hard to reach decisions and command action in a context of d either difficult or conflictive uh, issues. And I think it's, uh, it's worth contemplating whether if we're going to make real progress on global public goods that inevitably are going to involve difficult decisions that are not necessarily uh, to everybody's liking, if we're going to have to think about whether they need to be reassigned in one way or another to multilateral institutions that do have a structure that leads the decisions and can reach, um, uh, dis legit uh, reach decisions that have legal legitimacy even in issues in which there's not complete consensus. Thank you, John. What you say is certainly true at the level of the United Nations and uh, the Security Council and so forth. I am a little bit more optimistic after the last uh, G20 meeting in Delhi, it seemed to me that uh, the, the concept of international community was still alive, a little bit alive. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> of course, it's not perfect. Marcus, you, you had already the privilege to hear all of us, so what would you say now? <laughs> okay. the second one, one, one last gasp <laughs> of international community. So if you set aside the geopolitical concerns and just focus on climate change, there's clearly a need for the United States, the European Union, and China to get on the same page and find ways of reconciling their diverse approaches to this problem. Uh, my institution recently hosted a conference on uh, the macroeconomics of climate change organized by Jean Pisani Ferry, uh, and there was a paper presented there by two of my colleagues, Chad Bown and Kim Clausing, who argue that relatively minor changes to the WTO rules could go a long way in reducing conflict between the EU, the US, and China on climate-related issues. The problem, of course, is even minor changes to the WTO rules are going to require a real diplomatic commitment, mm. and I don't know if we're up to it or not. Well, very good remark indeed. So good cooperation between Peterson and uh, uh, Pisani, Jean Pisani Ferry. I, I was myself uh, chair of the uh, board of directors of uh, Bruegel Institute. So uh, I see that. Uh, and we, we have also a friend of the Bruegel Institute who's also in Peterson, if I'm not misled, uh, Nicolas. Anyway, so perhaps we have a little time to take a question.
I see uh, three, three hands. Uh, so, Madame, you were the first, please. Uh, Ilona Antonyshen from uh, Poland, but uh, I'm working for Volkswagen and you were commenting on the electric cars policies around the world, which is actually concerning me for the last three years, day and night. Um, I wouldn't be so hard on IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Actually, I think it is a stroke of genius because it increased the speed of investment in electric car technologies, and these are gigafactory size um, in, um, investments each time, which is five billion dollar, every one of them. So it is making a huge change because the big producers now started to invest quickly. You made the rush, which is actually following the rush from China. So the Chinese have a very stable support mechanism for electric car production, and they have made a great industry out of it. So right now, IRA made it possible to make this kind of support, so actually following China. Um, in, and in high speed in America, which made following by Canada, which made following by Europe. And right now, Europe changed so much the rules that I'm right now, I were able to work with the Polish government to establish in high speed, great, really great location um, parameters for gigafactories, and we established one, and we are looking for others. So I think, don't be so hard on the IRA. I think it was a good one. Marcus, do you have a response or comment? Well, as an American speaking before an international audience, I have an obligation to be more Catholic than the Pope. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm very glad that you find IRA to be such a stimulus <laughs> to uh, important policies around the world. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, I know you're an American citizen. You don't have to be more careful than the Pope. <laughs> well, I was, uh, <laughs> I must say, I've been struck by two things recently with regard to electric vehicles. And I guess I should say it's a, it, uh, uh, being clear, I, I own one. But uh, I was struck in China how how common they have become, how rapidly. You can tell because the, the uh, uh, electric and hybrid vehicles have a different color license plate than others. And I was, I was astonished at how common they, ha they have become. Uh, I, given the, uh, uh, it wasn't obvious that the, uh, how developed the underlying infrastructure is, and we know that China uh, is uh, on a very uh, rapid process of building new electric plants that uh, uh, actually are not necessarily low, low uh, emission. In the States, in contrast, as you probably have read, after an initial spurt of, uh, of demand for electric vehicles, they seem to be slowing down. And uh, it's not, although it's the IRA uh, contemplates some subsidies to things like charging, charging mm -hmm. stations. Uh, I suppose it's not immediately obvious that the uh, consumer acceptance is going to be so rapid uh, without also sustained and substantial consumer subsidies. So I think this, this, the future here remains a, a, bit, a, a bit uncertain. That, uh, okay. I'll Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I had uh, other questions over there. Could you get a, a mic? Yeah. Jean Alloloin from BPI France. Thank you to all panelists for your insightful deep dive into economic outlooks this morning. Um, I find you discuss a lot about um, security, risk management. My question to you is, what is the good news? What do you see upside in the current situation for whom and where? 
I'm, I'm not sure that I got exactly the question. Who, who could if respond? The, uh, Gabriel? If, if the question was, where is the good news? Uh, I think there, there is good news. Uh, um, one is that uh, we are not uh, seeing deglobalization as was uh, as was feared by many uh, when the U.S. China trade war broke out uh, and with all this crisis hitting, we see we see globalization as the economist put it. I think that's clear, but the global system, the trade system, has actually been relatively resilient. No, uh, the other piece of good news is. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about financial risks not yet fully materialized, but um, what we can say is that the, this first uh, 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 appearance of, uh, of bank crisis, uh, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank and, and, and these sort of things, uh, have, have, be, uh, have been very, very well managed and contained, uh, and there hasn't been any, any uh, diffusion of those risks uh, yet. I'm not sure whether we've seen the end of it, but that is good news as well. And the third piece of good news uh, is that uh, uh, the subsidy race that the IRA uh, is part of it, you know, that economists feel uncomfortable with, happens in the right area. Because what we do need is you know, more investment in, uh, in renewables, uh, in electric vehicles, etc. And there, a subsidy race is, is beneficial. You know? uh, if it was in, in, in steel or in, um, I don't know, in old-fashioned mm. industries, something different. But, but because we are facing a, a global common good here, or a bad, actually, the climate change that needs to be fought, this investment race is something that's positive. And so okay. that's three elements of, 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 of uh, more positive news, I guess. Well, yeah. <coughs> thank you very much. We are not only uh, with bad news, but also good news. G Gabriel is eloquent on that. Let me say, Gabriel, that I'm not sure that we will be always as satisfied with the behavior of the non-banks. For the banks, uh, the reaction has been very effective. And, uh, and uh, in Europe, for instance, we had applied by the rule of, of the Basel uh, uh, Committee and so forth and the G20. And so, so uh, we, we were reasonably protected until now, as you said, you're, you remain prudent. But on the non-banks area, as you say, we don't have seen all the consequences of the higher rates. May, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, Perhaps just please, Sebastian. Uh, uh, quickly, uh, I think the, the good, from an economic point of view, the good news is also that so far, despite the immense uh, uh, political tensions, uh, uh, political shocks, the world economy has been pretty resilient. Uh, and uh, uh, given the shock uh, it went through, uh, it's true about uh, the economic consequences of the COVID pandemics, about uh, the, the economic con consequences of uh, war in Ukraine uh, as well. Uh, so there has been economic cause, but not that much compared to the, the gravity of the, uh, of the crisis. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's good to um, uh, emphasize uh, uh, to emphasize that uh, COVID, the COVID crisis was a moment where uh, vulnerabilities were uh, became more visible uh, for the, the general the pub, for the public. But I think uh, that was actually a moment when uh, these uh, international value chains proved their resilience more than their, their vulnerabilities. Because within months, weeks in some cases, uh, uh, um, economic activity rebounded. Thank you very much indeed. I I'm turning to our founder. Uh, it is 10 o'clock. Shall I consider that we went through all what we had to examine, or have, you got, have we got a little time more? No? <laughs> so. <laughs> So I understand that uh, I have to thank all the panel <laughs> panelists. They were remarkable.
lighting is very important. Sorry? Microphone is Okay, good morning to everyone. Can I encourage you to please take your seats? Thank you very much. So we move now to the second session of this morning. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the program, the title of it is, and I read to you the title, is a new world economic order still conceivable in the foreseeable future? That's what we're going to discuss. <laughs> and before I get into the substance of it with our esteemed panelists here, I'd like to make two observations to get us started. The first is that, in fact, we've already been discussing this topic in the first session, because it's very hard today to discuss the economic outlook without talking about changes in the structure of international relations and the, what that means for economics. And we already got a few insights from that session, which will play into the conversation we have here. And the second point I want to make uh, before we start is that in a way, the question itself, is a new world economic order conceivable in the foreseeable future, begs another question, which is, is the current international economic order a stable one? In fact, you could argue that every year as we meet, the international economic order is already changing. It is already fraying. So the question is not whether we can conceive of a new world international economic order, but whether how we cope with the pressures and changes that are happening, sometimes in a not very orderly way. And perhaps we might be moving from an international economic order to a period of international economic disorder during which countries will conduct their relationships without the same set of rules that has governed those relationships for six, seven decades. And so those are kind of the questions that we would like to uh, get into today. And you've seen a very, we have six panelists and uh, each of them brings a, wealth of experience and, and insights into this. And rather than follow the order which is on your program, uh, I'd like to reverse it because that's part of the disorder in the world now. You know, we, should, <laughs> we should not imagine that things are happening according to the rules that we agreed a few uh, years ago. And so, if you permit me, I'd like to actually start off by asking Madame Touré, I mean, Madame Touré, who is... Uh, of course, the former Prime Minister of, of Senegal, and was on the same panel, uh, our, our discussion about some of the same issues at last year's World Policy Conference as well. So, Madam Premier Minister, I want to turn to you first, Aminata, and ask you, do you feel that the world economic order is, is stable, is changing? Do you have a vision of where it's going? How is it affecting the countries that, that you're most familiar with? <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me uh, just say how uh, happy I am to be here. And uh, thank you for <clears throat> taking this going as a tradition. Well, you know, when you, when, when, you, when, when you age and you put on some weight, and you look at this very nice suit, because there, is, there are only men here, so I'm going to take the suit example. And you want to just fit into, into the one that you used to wear in your 30s. But that's what the world looked like. Um, you do have, you know, all the powers that you used to dominate. Um, and they still want to keep things going. Because it's enjoyable to 
you know, benefit from privileges. Uh, but in between, you have, um, you know, one part of the world that caught up or want to caught want to want to catch up, uh, and then you move from what looks like a stable environment, but it was not for many people coming from Africa. Obviously, uh, we want a new order for, for sure, um, and. Uh, you do also have within countries um, some groups that also want a new order that is more uh, equal, that is more human rights centered, um, that is more dignified for people. So you do have this tension uh, that is now being expressed uh, through different ways, um, not the most peaceful or the most positive ways, but definitely when you look into the 54 countries in Africa, out of the 194, it's, it's quite a number. Uh, and what they would like to see is something different. They want to industrialize. Um, they want uh, to be more present. They want to see it at the Security Council. They've been <laughs> talking about it for so many years. So we do believe that um, a disorder is not that bad if you want to sort of be more present and you have your right more realized. So I think um, the disorder is called uh, by many peoples, including women. I mean, look at the, look at the, look at the room. Every year, that's the same story. <laughs> Black suits, um, older men, uh, not very diversified. Um, uh, wasp, as we said. I mean, let me just, that's the morning, but that's, that's the reality I'm facing, I'm seeing. So we want a new world, definitely, that is more gender equitable, for sure. Um, how many women are leading countries? Very few, or prime ministers or ministers? Very, very few, regardless of the level of revenues or uh, industrialization stage, doesn't matter. This is an, a very old order. The, the, the boys club, or the old boys club, um, that is being very challenged. Um, right into, I mean, even in Africa, Look at the, 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 the average of the population, the age. The medium age is 19. Well, it's 44 in Europe, by the way. Um, and you, they're nowhere to be seen. The elite is six-year-old plus. These are the ministers, the presidents, of course. And uh, um, well, they benefit from everything. But they're only 3% of the population. So these young people and these women want a disorder and you want a reshuffle of the cards. Um, so it is expressed, as I said, disorderly. Um, not, they don't have you know, the, the chance of sitting where I'm sitting and saying it, but it's, 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 it's really something that we need to look into if we want to move to a, a new stage that is on. Economically, of, obviously, um, you do have you know, Africa, I can take Senegal, we do have a very old relationship with, with France. But how is it now that France is being, you know, phased out, um, you know, in many countries? Um, you, you, if you follow the economy, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, Niger being the case in point. So what didn't go right for that to happen for such a long relationship? Well, what didn't happen is, you know, the, the, the hope for development didn't happen. So why would you entertain a relationship? It's like a battle a wife <laughs> in a couple somehow. Um, if you're unhappy, why would you keep that going? Um, are you going to replace it by something new that will be better? It remains to be seen, obviously. But when you have new partners and new players in the economic field, I'm talking about the Brazil, the Chinas, and the whoever is uh, you know, there, well, you attempt to look in another way. So. In a nutshell, definitely what we would like to see, um, do we have to go through disorder? It looks like it, and we are in the middle of it. Uh, by the way, when you talk about change, most of the time it's because it's, it, it's already happened. Um, so what we need to see is more equality, more justice, um, more representation of women, uh, young people being there, more uh, race diverse, that, that, that's also uh, an issue uh, that we really need to, to, to look into the new world we want to build through uh, what we are doing now, discussing, but discussing very honestly and putting, having the courage to put issue on the table. We yeah. are unhappy 
with the states of international affairs. That's what it is. And how are we going together to work together and make sure that we do have the dresses and the suits um, that fits everybody and everybody's happy with? So that's uh, my, my first take on the issue. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Aminata, I think, for, for raising sort of not just what people are unhappy about, but also some of the attributes of what people would like to see in, in a new uh, international order. I think we'll come back in the second round to ask you whether you see us moving in that direction. What are the forces that will get us there? So if you were to look five years out or 10 years out, are we moving closer to that vision or are we basically uh, staying in, in, in a set of relationships that lead to all these, uh, not just resentments, but I think also increasing anger, I think, in, in many parts. Um, let, let me turn to uh, Chao Yi then, please, next, and ask you, from where you sit, how do you see the pressures on the uh, current international economic order, and, and where do you think this is leading us? Okay, before um, talking about new uh, economic uh, order, I guess we start to look at the uh, current or existing uh, international economic order from different uh, perspectives. Uh, for example, we can look at uh, the power pattern, uh, which is unipolar or multipolar. We can see the institution uh, uh, for current uh, international economic order, we have uh, we call Britain World uh, Institution, the WTO, IMF, World Bank. Also, we can see law and regulation uh, objective, uh, which is global or domestic priority. So, from this perspective, we can see current uh, order still there, but at the same time, we have already seen sign uh, of change or decoping uh, happen. Uh, uh, very interesting, according to uh, WTO, they find uh, in the IMF, IMF uh, annual report, uh, World Economic Outlook, they count the fragmentation, these words, mentioned 172 times in this version, this year, while five years fragmentation only mentioned once. That's very interesting phenomena. Also, uh, we can see, uh, according to WTO, uh, they feel middle products uh, play very important role in supply chain but you can see the share of mid uh, products among the total trade have already, uh, the share have already down from 51% uh, uh, average previous year down to 48.5% in first half of this year. So all this happened, I guess, uh, we can summarize two reasons. One is the internal effect in economic order, which I mean is the economic pattern or weight have already changed. Uh, as mentioned, people mentioned, in terms of PPP, uh, BRIC country share have already exceed uh, that of G7. Also, another factor is the external effect, like G geopolitical tension, a U.S.-China conflict, and a war. Uh, so after that, I can imagine or think uh, there's a full possible scenario for evolution of international economic order. Uh, first scenario, I will summarize as a business as usual. Uh, that means G7 with U.S. Uh, as a as its head, still dominant uh, uh, Britain world institution. Second scenario is 
the economic order, get some improvement, uh, but at the same time, is some kind of backward, is I can call is a mixture. That's second scenario. <coughs> the third, third scenario is we can say is a uh, substantial new order. Uh, developing countries have a more uh, right to say in uh, Britain world uh, institutions. Uh, uh, in international law and uh, regulation are more equal to uh, new developing countries. The last scenario, fourth scenario, is uh, I can say is a totally disorder, is a totally fragmentation. Uh, uh, maybe there's a, a parallel uh, group, uh, uh, group occur. For example, like US and G7, vice China and the BRICS countries. Uh, that way, I guess the scenario, uh, scenario second, scenario three are more likely happen. The scenario one and the scenario four less likely uh, occur. But the last one, I don't totally not excluded, but it will be last if the world totally fragmented. Uh, uh, I just stop here. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, so you framed quite nicely four scenarios, sort of two extreme ends, and then two in the middle, one's a bit better than the other, and, and the probabilities are we'll end up somewhere in the middle rather than at either end, but you don't want to exclude the, the worst case uh, from a fragmentation point of view. And I'd be interested to see whether the other panelists share that perspective in terms of whether the framing, but, but more importantly, where we are likely to end up. So let, let me turn now to Jaime and uh, I mean, you've had long, long experience in, in international economic relations, but also particularly in trade, and, and it'd be good to get your take on this. Merci, Sala Masoud. Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous ce matin. Je voudrais tout d'abord tenir à remercier Thierry de son invitation et féliciter son équipe de mettre en place cette uh, conférence magnifique. In order to talk about the new international economic order, I think uh, we need to identify the challenges we are currently facing. In this sense, I'd like to highlight two most significant challenges focusing on trade. First is the breakdown of international cooperation system at the same time, the collapse of the rule-based trading system. Edward Roos, Financial Times columnist, recently said that the rule of no, world trade is the rule of jungle. I, I think he's quite right, because the existing WTO rules are no longer respected, and new rules cannot be produced. With the declaration of Janet Yellen, U.S. Treasury Secretary, in April last year, that U.S. would pursue secure but free trade, sec free but secure trade with French shoring, the WTO's fundamental principle of MFN is that. And as you know, the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism continued to remain paralyzed with the non-functioning of its appellate body. More seriously, new international rules cannot be agreed upon, even though we need new rules on digital and climate change because the global cooperation system is broken down due to the intensifying US-China conflict and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The G20 summit of last year and this year clearly demonstrated that the G20 has lost its role as the World Crisis Management Committee with the breakdown of global cooperation mechanism. The G20, in addition to stabilizing the world economy after the 2008 financial crisis, was very instrumental. I noticed it, I witnessed it as a G20 chef of Korea. 
in concluding the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2015 at COP21 and its early entry into force in 2016. However, in view of the current international political situation, it would be very unlikely that G20 can do anything meaningful regarding global issues such as climate, digital, health, energy, or food crisis. Um, because of the impossibility of producing a consensus on global issues, we can see the recent trend of fragmentation of the international rules on climate change and digital economy in particular. In fact, it would be, it would be more appropriate to say that European Union is monopolizing the legislation on those issues through GDPR, EU taxonomy, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act. Those EU rules are to be applied beyond the European Union. The good example is X, the former Twitter, can be subject to EU sanctions because of its misinformation and harmful content based on EU Digital Service Act and EU's recent decision to ban misleading carbon neutral claims will be applied to Apple Watches as well. With the launch of Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, United States is also trying to make new international rules, but it is not so certain. Because the, there are too many different economies participation in these discussions and the issues are so difficult to be resolved. Moreover, the recently published draft text of Pillar 2, Supply Chain, I think is the most important, important pillar of the IPF, is very disappointing and far from establishing binding rules. And we can see the proliferation of national security exception invocation by major economies and increasing export control based on these national security exceptions. Since the government cannot produce the rules, we can see more active roles played by the private sectors and NGOs. Renewable 100 is an initiative by NGO, an international sustainable standard board, not the government, is producing a global standard for ESG disclosure of the companies. Second challenge is the strengthened government intervention in the economy. Deglobalization since the financial crisis of 2008 and COVID-19 have significantly strengthened government regulations and climate change and digitalization of global economy requires stronger government intervention as we need new rules on these issues. The direct, direct impact of the strengthened government intervention is to increase subsidies by the major economies to the detriment of the middle power countries. The US, European Union, Japan are currently trying to offer subsidies to their own industries, most notably in semiconductors and electric battery in order to combat China state capitalism. I think the problem of the subsidy is, is distort trade and industry because government decisions, not market forces determine competitive outcomes, thereby substantially reducing efficiency. We can see the invisible hand of the market is giving way to the visible hand of the state. I stop here and come back later about how to properly address these challenges. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jaime. We'll, we'll come back to that because there, you could have a parallel conversation where people would say, look, we have to achieve a set of goals, whether they're security, whether they're climate change or global public goods and, and we have to use a set of instruments that we have, policy instruments. Some of them are subsidies. We talk a bit with 
Pierre comes next. And, you know, if you take the European version, it's a bit less subsidies, a bit more regulation. And, and if this has a consequence in terms of influencing the pattern of trade flows, that's a price once you just have to pay. And I think the question that we'll have to pose is, how does one address that trade-off? Because we're no longer going to be in a world, in my view, where we can only sit on one end or the other of the spectrum, you know, and, and the danger in some ways is that there are two parallel conversations going on, one about the sort of what we frame as, as a liberal economic order and one about a whole set of new uh, issues that are on the table that people want to address at the national and international level, but I'm not sure that those conversations are coming together enough and, and it would be interesting to get your view and of the role of middle powers in, in advancing that. Pierre, you've listened to three of your fellow panelists and, and you have a set of views on this, so it would be interesting to get those. Thank you, um, and thanks to, 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 to Thierry for inviting me in this uh, major conference. Uh, let me uh, reflect a little on uh, the notion of uh, international economic order. Um, and the first question is whether we need one. And as an economist, my answer would be yes, because we believe in markets, and markets don't function in a vacuum. They, they, they need rules. They need previsibility, and an order brings that. And the reason why we were so prosperous after World War II was because there was a set of rules of the game and market players could believe in them and, and use them. So in a way, we do need uh, a, 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 an order. My second remark is that an order is not going to be stable. It's a reflection of a current set of political issues concerns, challenges that needs to be solved collectively. And it's not likely to be um, to resist to changes in uh, the global environment. So in a way, there are cycles. And this is very well shown in a, in a major work by um, Mark Danton in the United States uh, about the, the history of the world government. Uh, in which he shows that there are cycles. And these cycles start with a loss of legitimacy of the existing order. And then there is an interregnum in which new ideas are discussed, there is disagreement, and that leads to a new order. And then again, the new order suffers from losses of legitimacy. And Danton says that uh, we are in the third uh, cycle. The first one was between the 1910s and the 1940s. And, it, and, and the interregnum lasted a long, long time. You may re recall the fact that the major international conference in London in 1933 was a, main, a major failure. And, uh, it, and, and the new order that emerged was the Bretton Woods Agreement. And then there was a loss of legitimacy at the end of the 1960s, the early 70s, with the rupture of the exchange rate agreements within Bretton Woods, with the uh, oil shocks. And the interregnum lasted till the end of the 1970s with the emergence of a neoliberal order with Margaret Thatcher's uh, Reagan uh, and the deregulation of uh, uh, financial markets. So, this neoliberal order again suffered from a loss of legitimacy that maybe we can date basically with the, the uh, 2008 uh, crisis. But this loss of legitimacy is now what creates the interregnum disorder we live in. And it's very complex because it is multiform. One is inequality, the fact that financialization failed to deliver prosperity for all it benefited mainly, mainly the rich. The second is the failure to deal with the major environmental challenge. Not only climate change, but climate change and biodiversity. The third is the vulnerability created by very tight supply chains. And we again lived through that during the COVID uh, pandemics. 
the fourth is the political incompleteness of that order. It is increasingly difficult to explain to major emerging countries that the governance of the world is mainly directed by the older powers. It doesn't work. The fifth is horizontal incompleteness. We have worked a lot on trade, but how about labor rights? How about the environment? How about health? When you look at the structure of the world institutions, WTO was a more powerful institution than ILO. Is that legitimate? Well, increasingly, the legitimacy, the loss of legitimacy, hinges on the fact that we have not been able to work as successfully on other aspects of interdependence. So that's where we are uh, now. Politics come back, and this is the good news. We need to work on these challenges. The big question is how long will it take to reach a, a set of negotiated agreements that reconcile the national interest with international collaboration? And this is what an, an international order is about. It could be a definition of an order. I think for a number of years we are bound to muddle through, which may not be a catastrophe, but it means that markets won't be anchored on a set of rules, so we may have less growth indeed. That may also be an opportunity to redefine what is the purpose of economics. Is it growth? Is it shared prosperity? And by the way, how do we define growth? Is it the change of GDP? We all know that is a very, very poor indicator. So in a way, all this now has to be discussed, and I would interpret the disorder as a wonderful opportunity, but as the 1930s demonstrated, I'm not sure that we can manage this opportunity successfully. Thank you, Pierre. So, you, you know, very, very uh, coherent and integrated, uh, comprehensive set of issues that all need to be addressed. And I guess the question I'm going to come back to you with is, and actually to the other panelists, is, you know, two-thirds of the way through the first round, we've got a very good sense of all the problems and uh, also of all the things that need to be addressed. But we also have a sense that the current set of international political relationships makes it hard to address any of those problems well. And what I want to come back in the second round is to get your views on well, how are we going to actually make any progress on addressing these things? And if we don't make progress, in a way, how will we manage without the right set of rules still to have interactions? What, what's the consequence of all this? So I think it would be useful to see where, where is the impetus for change going to come and it can't just be to preserve the past because of all the problems you've just outlined with the past. So, uh, starting with Madame Touré, you know, so you started and then Pierre, your last set of comments shows this. Here's all these sets of problems with the way we currently manage our relationships. And we're sort of not clear how we can actually move those forward. So I think if we could have a, a if you could think a bit about that set of issues, we'll come back to that. But before we get there, I've still got two more colleagues to get their perspective. So, Vladislav, now I want to turn to you, please. Vladislav Finozemtsev, uh, uh, from where you sit, how do you see this, this whole conversation? Uh, thank you so much. Um, it was a very interesting question, a very interesting topic. Uh, and I reflected on this. I would say, first of all, that uh, to me, uh, the question of new order uh, seems to be more a question of a new framework because uh, the word order is, I think, too strong to, uh, for describing the current economic condition. So the frameworks for economic uh, cooperation, for economic competition, they have changed many times since uh, in the last 100 years. And so what I see these days uh, is that the globalization and, you know, what is called the end of history, the unification of the world, which was also cited by, uh, with, uh, by Mr. de Montbrial uh, in our opening session, is a little bit exhausted. 
uh, because no order can, I think, persist uh, without, uh, no order can be universal. And so the major, I would say, challenge for the globalization is its own globality, because the world is too different, the many parts of it, it uh, they are too different from each other uh, to be ruled and to be governed with the one set of rules. So therefore, I think that what we are seeing now is not so much uh, uh, the emergence of multipolarity and global competition between different centers of power, uh, but rather a new kind of regionalization inside a mostly globalized world. Uh, this uh, regionalization would uh, be managed by the major economic powers, for example, United States and Europe on the one hand, and China on the other hand, on the other hand, but it would not be so much political differences, but econ difference in economic models. So uh, it's not about, you know, Asian century or Pacific century against Atlantic century. It's more about, you know, information and post-industrial economy against uh, uh, more traditional uh, commodity economy or industrial one. And uh, therefore, I would say that uh, United States and Europe will uh, major, uh, may, I would say, rely on the uh, innovative economy, on production of uh, sophisticated uh, and high-profile goods which actually underline uh, maybe not superiority, but so kind of self-expression of the people. So when you look on the United States these days, the most successful, com uh, successful company is uh, Tesla and SpaceX, which actually embodies innovation. If you look on Europe, the biggest uh, European company by capitalization is LVMH, uh, which actually uh, specializes on producing unique and specialized goods, uh, embodied, embodying creativity of the European people. So, uh, my point <coughs> here is that uh, Europe and the United States will produce an economic model which is based on, I would say, first of all, the sense of belonging, to some, uh, you know, maybe golden billion or whatsoever, and on self-expression, uh, while China and most of Asia will pursue the economic model built on mass production of cheap and qu high quality goods, which would have a huge demand for them in, all, in, in many parts of the world, which are not so much, uh, not, not, so, uh, not so wealthy as uh, Europe or the United States. And therefore, uh, I think this model can coexist for a while, and they co can compete, uh, they can expand their sphere, the region of influences uh, without uh, engaging in kind of political confrontation, which was very uh, obvious and very uh, often seen in, in the 20th century. I would also point out that um, this uh, competition between, uh, I would say, information and post-industrial uh, countries and uh, resource-oriented economies and industrial economies uh, will uh, definitely result in much, uh, I would say, in many rounds of this competition because uh, what we are talking about is a kind of catching up development and I would say that since 1930s uh, there was no any change in uh, the first economy in the world. The United States led the world uh, for around 100 years. Before, it was very natural, you know, when France overtook Holland, when Britain overtook France, when Germany arrived as a huge industrial power, and then the United States came. But for the last 100 years, there were a lot of attempts to challenge this uh, hegemony, like by the Soviet Union in the 70s, by Japan in the 80s, and now by China. And so, therefore, I wouldn't say that we are now approaching some new economic order, because uh, for this to happen, it should be a proof that some country can overtake the leader, which is, uh, you know, I would say the United States or uh, the Atlantic civilization. It's hard to believe that it can, can happen because everyone, uh, if one remembers the end of the 80s, everybody says about the end of the Cold War, about the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but the economic shock in Japan was actually have, have, had happened at the same time. So in the, eight of, uh, in the late 80s, uh, the whole industrial system went into crisis, both in its Soviet version and its Japanese version. And this was the first step of new economic reality. So 
I would say I, I would finalize that uh, I cannot see the new economic order emerging. I can see another, you know, circle of economic change uh, approaching. But this will not be a new order. This will be different frameworks, different models competing with each other. And uh, it's very nice to say that uh, these days economic issues and economic power right. is actually more significant than political and military one, uh, which is uh, quite contrary to what we have seen in the early 20th century. So hopefully this transition, whatever it might be, would be more peaceful and more complex than it was uh, before and during the First or the Second World War. Thank you very much. So you, you've got this vision mm -hmm. of multiple coexisting frameworks that sort of govern relationships amongst groups of countries. And I think that will raise the question of whether countries will be forced to be part of one framework or the other, or whether they can be part of multiple frameworks at the same time, and mm -hmm. whether countries are willing and ready to be forced to take sides and join one framework or the other. And I think maybe when we come to Madame Touré, I mean, in a way, in Africa today, a big issue for many countries is that they're being asked to take sides and, and they don't want to. So how does one manage that as well? Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, Jan Paternum, I, I want to come to you last, please, for, for your thoughts. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Monsieur. I think we can all uh, dream of a new economic order, but if we really want to build a um, new, vibrant, uh, multilateral organization, uh, we need to meet, in my view, two conditions, like frankly in any diplomatic negotiation. One is to define clear mutual benefits, right? And the second is to have strong, equal players. So let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, how do we achieve mutual benefits? I think we are part of the problem we are all facing is that in a way we are flying, <coughs> flying blind here. We, we, we frankly don't have much information to assess, for instance, how much damage countries, companies are inflicting on each other um, and on society as a whole. So in other words, we must do a better job at understanding and mitigating externalities, right? And what I mean by externality, because we've all used the word, but it's anything that disturbs the level playing field between individuals, companies, and countries, right? So let me give you two concrete examples of what I think are achievable goals uh, with hopefully enough consensus. One is to curb excessive concentration of corporate power pretty much everywhere in the world. We talked a lot about inequalities, but I think that's at the center of the problem. There are reasons to be optimistic. The OECD, OECD countries, as you know, have already achieved a minimum corporate tax. And I think the issue now is to tackle the issue of tax optimization and in particular transfer pricing mechanisms. Right. As you know, the uh, U.S. government is looking very seriously at the issue. Uh, Microsoft was uh, given a very significant fine just uh, a week ago or so. And, and I think, you know, to put things in perspective first, uh, you may know that, but, you know, it is estimated that $1 trillion of corporate profits each year are booked uh, in tax havens, right? Uh, it's a considerable amount of money, and I think we need to do more on that front, and, and that, you know, again, governments should have mutual interest because that's more money for their coffers, right? And the second goal uh, I'd like to illustrate in the area of climate change is that, you know, First of all, you know, deglobalization it makes it harder to achieve our uh, decarbonization goals, not easier, right? So I think that, that's a very uh, strong point to make. And to illustrate this point, 
uh, someone talked about the uh, WTO report that was issued just last week. One interesting statistic is that they looked at solar panels, for instance, over the last 30 years or so. And, and as you know, there's been a huge decrease in cost. And the WTO economists were able to assess that 40% of that decline uh, was due to economies of scale uh, that were obtained through international free trade. So, you know, um, at the up in contrast, if we don't have this kind of economic efficiency, we are even less likely to meet our uh, decarbonization uh, targets, right? Um, so that's the fair point around you know, m defining strong mutual interests and hopefully not too many of them uh, so that we don't get distracted. Again, it's like any uh, diplomatic exercise. Uh, the second point about having strong players, I think we talked about GDP this morning and <clears throat> uh, how the, the picture looks scary for Europe. In reality, in terms of PPP uh, basis, so in, in plain English, uh, adjusted for cost of living, uh, GDP in Europe is only 4% lower than in the US, right? Uh, and, and actually, if you look per capita, Europe is actually in a better situation now than it was 20 years ago. So we have to put things in perspective. However, this is today and, and, and the past, going forward, uh, the situation is very weak for Europe, uh, which is missing essentially the technology uh, revolution. And just one statistic that is very revealing, uh, in Europe, private companies invest about $50 billion a year uh, in technology R&D. Uh, in the U.S., it's five times this amount, about $250 billion. And China, which started from zero 15 years ago, is now well above Europe. So, you know, with less uh, economic power, uh, the issue for Europe will be how relevant it can be on the international scene and still influence uh, the world. Uh, and, and then the second weak player for completely different reasons uh, will be emerging markets. And I think that that probably where we need to um, make collective decisions for the sort of long-term common uh, good, if you will. Thank you very much, Jan. So we have 37 minutes left. I want to make sure that we have some time for people sitting in the room to be able to raise questions. So what I'd like to do now, if it's possible, is really to ask each of you a question which I'd like, if it's possible, to answer it very quickly in two minutes, if you could. And I, the first question I have is for you, uh, Madame Touré, which is, you heard this vision of you know, multiple frameworks and, and coexisting. In some ways, you have some of that already. From your point of view, would that be a good outcome or would that be a bad outcome? Well, definitely, uh, I've spent now some years in the multilateral organization. I was a former UN personnel for many years, went back to, I mean, went to government. And I came out of this process uh, thinking that you need frameworks for sure. You need many frameworks. Um, and I always speak from the the point of view of Africa now, I mean, after having been global, now focusing on Africa, um, the richest continent, by the way, by any means, and the poorest. Um, so whatever framework that will deal with that issue, we're going to be part of it first. Um, second, um, I'm more interested, and I think that's the feeling in the continent, that we have to take uh, business into our own hands. Um, how to strengthen African Union, how to make sure that we are self-interest driven because that's how the world works and we are going to be more uh, forward coming in terms of, um, you know, defending our interest, um, being very strong on, you know, whatever issues and making our own points. Um, I appreciate it when you uh, talk about, you know, sort of forcing some countries to, to take part. That was the case for the 
Russia, Ukraine war, and you know, most of African countries look at it as a white man's war <laughs> somehow and uh, just didn't take it, you know, position, and that's, that's how right, um, like everybody does. Um, but I think the questions that need to be um, uh, reflect upon is how are we going to make sure that we uh, move forward peacefully uh, peacefully to a more equal order, an order that respects the environment, that put women also on an equal footage. Nobody brought the issue of, 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 of inequalities and, and, and making sure that young people are part of it um, and that we'll need um, for the corporations. I think that's, that's, that's very right. important to bring uh, that upon. To look beyond profit, because we are a profit-driven um, world as we speak, so I it's not enough anymore. So do we want to go through changes by revolution or do we want to be smarter and put in place, you know, equal, um, you know, frameworks where uh, true discussion comes out of, uh, of what, we, what we want to, uh, to build for the future. Every time I come in this country, in the Emirate, I remember that Dubai, a hundred years ago, was a small Bedouin village. So how did change occur? It means that it's possible. Uh, it means that you can accelerate change. It, and then you can uh, have a more sane discussion. Because we are having an insane discussion. Right. Uh, because you do have a poll of very wealthy uh, group of countries in front of, of very poor countries. But within those countries, you do also have that huge gap. I was visiting south of Senegal in the mining areas just before I came. I mean, it, it was terrible. You do have like very big mining companies, um, you know, taking gold out of the country, and they were not even capable of building a decent, um, you know, road <laughs> because they don't care about it. They just have an airport. They can fly a private jet. Go. There. It looks like the world we are in. Um, so, how are we going to 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 to, to take a pause and then come back to? what the United Nations was supposed to be as a promise, um, and share the common interest as human being. Other than that, I mean, people are, what I'm seeing now, uh, very much even into the, you know, within the intellectual elite, is let's focus on our own interests as the rest of the world is doing. Um, human rights, okay, we can talk about it very globally, but it's not a reality. Right. So that's how we, we, we look at it. So what are the solutions that we want to come up with um, that, is, that are human rights centered, that are equal, and preserve the environment beyond mm -hmm. just the idea of pursuing profit. Thank you very much. So, very clear message that you want to be clear about your own interests and engage in multiple conversations, multiple frameworks, but be clear about what is the, to the benefit of the, the continent and organize yourselves in a way to better represent those interests. And in that context, I assume that you, know, you and many uh, leaders in Africa would welcome the decision about making the African Union part a permanent member of the G20, because I think that in some ways is one forum where that could happen. Um, you know, I want to turn to you and ask you a question. You know, you sort of said, you've heard this vision about the, your four different scenarios. To what extent is where you end up across those scenarios a function of the relationship between the US and China? How much is that going to drive where you end up? And what's your quick, quick response to that? Yeah, I guess the relation between US and China uh, probably is the, the one of the most important uh, relationships. Um, which will drive um, uh, many things, including uh, uh, geopolitical tension. Uh, uh, although Euro, uh, European countries say to China, uh, don't lock us through US. When they visit US, US say, or they say to US government, don't lock us through China. But actually, the U.S.-China relationship uh, now is kind of uh, play uh, very important role. 
The good news is, in, in past several months, we can see the tension between U.S. and China literally reduce. May not big improvement, the tension being reduced. I think that's good for U.S., for China, for the rest of the world. Uh, but at the same time, we should be sure, we should understand the, the policy uh, U.S. government adopt to China call small yard hall fans wouldn't be changed. So competition wouldn't be changed, but the, 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 the tension has been reduced. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for being so clear about it. And of course, you have to see the, what is the mechanism by which the small yard stays small. <laughs> because the, the internal pressures in all countries will be to make the, the yard bigger <laughs> without worrying about the height of the fence. Uh, now, I, I want to turn to you I and mean, ask you a, a question, which is, let's assume there's some continuing improvement but in the U.S.-China relationship, but still tension, and, and particularly when it comes to setting up global rules, to what extent can middle powers create a set of rules that govern relationships among them, even if the largest economies in the world are not so actively participating? And I'm thinking of dispute resolution in the WTO, where the formal process is frozen, but there is a parallel process that has been created by middle powers, which works to to basically govern disputes as if it was within the WTO, more or less. To what extent do you think that's a model that can be used in lots of different ways to, to govern, provide frameworks for, for the world? Um, thank you for your questions. In fact, uh, you, what you mentioned is ideal, but in reality, it cannot be applied. In fact, the U.S., European Union, and China, the only powers who make the regulations. Without them, it's not possible. You see, the, I participated in the Uruguay Laon negotiation in the 80s, 90s. It was de facto bilateral negotiations between European community at the time and United States, despite more than 100 countries participated. But now, the landscape are totally changed totally change, especially with the joining of China to the WTO in 2001. So I think it's uh, uh, very important to persuade the middle powers, the, the role, including Korea, Japan, if you say the European Union is a middle power, okay, the UK, Canada, and other countries to persuade both China and United States to participate in strengthening rule-based international order because the strengthening rule-based order is the only solution to their dispute. Without clear rules, they cannot make any settlement. So I think the middle powers must enhance their efforts to persuade China and U.S. respectively to honor the already established commitment and agreed to the strengthening the rule-based order. Thank you very much. That, that's also very clear. So the middle power's role is not to create a framework that works for them, because from what you're saying, it doesn't work without getting the big China and U.S. into it. But they can play a major role in helping to persuade. And, I, and I, I think that's quite relevant for a conversation we'll have later about climate change. You know, we're going to be having COP here in, in a few weeks. And, and the, is that the approach one has to follow also in COP? Uh, and, and here, I want to come to you with a question, which is you had a very long list of things that need to be fixed in the world order. And, we all have. <laughs> and, and everybody will add to it. You know, if we, if we go around the room, we'll add another 20 other things. And yet, John's point about mutual interest. So, which of these lists, among your lists, 
what is would you say on which we cannot make progress without international cooperation and it is in our mutual interest to create a framework for operating them and then there are other things where it would be nice to have cooperation but the world will struggle along without cooperation so what's your sort of priority list of things well, there are many ways to, to address that question. First, I, I, I'd be tempted to say that uh, whatever I think doesn't matter because what we need to do is reach a consensus. So for that to happen, we need to discuss with others. And I think the priority today is not to pick an issue and a solution. It is to meet and discuss and see where national interests are and how they can be combined to define a common good. But of course, as an analyst, I would attempt to answer differently and say there are major issues today that cannot be addressed without collective action. And certainly climate change is one. So it's, a, it, it's, it's going to be a mix of these two approaches. I think that we come to the negotiating tables with ideas, with convictions, but these convictions can reach nothing unless they are shared by others. So it's part of the negotiating process and to negotiate you need to understand and try to know more about the other parties and that's why I think that more research, more knowledge is needed to understand our potential partners and allies better than we do because we, we, we are working with stereotypes and that is not going to, 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 to make uh, to, 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 to make the negotiation easier, easier. Now, there is a third way to address your question, which is to say that we cannot progress without a common vision. And, and I, I believe that's true. And I believe that part of the negotiation is to reach a common vision. The difficulty is that when you look at history, common mobilizing visions, shared visions, tend to come out during wars. So a big question today is whether, I mean, it, it's what William J. James would have called in the early uh, uh, 20th century is the moral equivalent of war. Where is today the moral equivalent of war? Sustainable development goals? No. Climate change? Not even. The uh, net zero economics? Not mobilizing enough. So where is this project that can be mobilizing enough to create a shared vision? And I don't know, and that what I think makes me afraid, because if we need a major crisis of major proportions, much bigger than when we have experience, or a big war to reach that common vision, then I think that it is certainly not the preferred scenario. So I'll stop there uh, because that, 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 that. it's not very optimistic, but <laughs> I, I believe that the pessimism of analysis can lead to the optimism of action. And I think that we need more multilateral discussions. And even when summits don't reach a conclusion, it doesn't mean that they are not useful or successful. Thank you very much, Pierre. So this is getting a little somber towards the end. But uh, let's have, so do, do, do you agree that we need common vision and understanding each other before we can actually reach the agreements on, on things that matter to us? And it may be quite hard to get to a common vision without more of a crisis. Um, do you think that it's possible to isolate one or two areas where we really need in our mutual interest, without a common vision about the world and where it's going, still make progress. So how, how do you see this, this big vision, big bargain versus let's pick a few things? Mm. It's, a, it, it's a good question. But um, I would say that uh, listening to the discussion, uh, mm. I reflected on the current situation in general, and I would say that, uh, to my mind, um, we now are in a situation when a lot of old and uh, fundamental processes are still evolving and we don't see the end of these trends uh, close enough uh, to uh, realize whether we can uh, orchestrate a new order or not. So first of all, uh, we have seen since the beginning of the 21st century uh, the intensification of uh, military conflicts uh, in many parts of the world. 
And in any case, uh, I would say no political goals were really met with uh, uh, armed interventions. Uh, the economic uh, effect was very devastating for many countries. Uh, and uh, this new you know, circle of war, like uh, the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, we also contribute to the understanding that the military interventions and the military confrontation is ruinous for the contemporary world and it just, uh, you know, um, destroys the economic wealth and doesn't, has, doesn't have any positive consequences because in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, uh, wars, uh, they deliver economic benefits for the, victory, uh, for the victors. Now it is not the case. Uh, so, and before this would be uh, really understood, I think uh, there is no little chance for new order to exist. The second point is that uh, every time uh, the, um, it was spoken about economic order and the new economic reality, uh, it was uh, when uh, the new economic trend emerged. For example, uh, in 1960s, 1970s, uh, the raw uh, resource production producing countries, they became, you know, very high flyer in economic uh, sense. Uh, and uh, the very concept of new international economic order was put forward in 1971. But 15 years later, all these countries were ruined by you know, the huge debts, uh, and they were bailed out by the United States and many other de uh, developed countries. Uh, the same situation was, uh, as I already mentioned, with the Soviet Union and Japan in the 70s and 80s. They were also high flyers, and then a uh, huge uh, systemic crisis emerged. So now we have this competition between China and the rest of the world, and I think we should wait for another, I would say, 10 years to understand what the perspective for China is. If China uh, comes to the same uh, result as uh, Japan in 1989, by the end of this decade, it would be an absolutely different perspective for new economic right. order to emerge. And the last point, which uh, the colleague said very interesting, was the problem of taxation and the problem of uh, you know, uh, offshore safe havens. So uh, in this case, I would say that uh, this uh, tax system which exists uh, in, in the whole world these days uh, actually takes its, uh, it has its roots, uh, it takes its roots from the early 20th century. And uh, all the tax system was uh, designed for either mercantilistic economy, economy of trade, or for industrial economy where, uh, you know, everything was reproducible and whatsoever. And uh, the stock market, uh, the capital gains were not so much Anticipated. Now, uh, the creative economy of post-industrial world of informational technologies creates a lot of wealth, and this wealth creation is actually a major engine for economic growth and prosperity. If uh, we tax uh, personal incomes or capital gains as we do for uh, last decades, uh, it would stop economic growth in the most promising countries. So, my point would be, so for you know, challenging this uh, offshore economy, some countries, wealthy countries, should switch from the taxing the incomes to taxing the consumption. And this may change immediately and generally the whole economic construction, uh, the whole economic uh, framework for, for the world, because the first country that changes the system, uh, it will get enormous competitive advantages uh, upon all others. So I would say there are too many trends which are coming from, uh, from quite distant past, which are still dominating the global economic order, and many of them can evaporate and can be changed in, in coming decade or two. And so afterwards, I think the perspective for re recreating this economic order would be much more uh, realistic than they are now. Right. Now we are in a kind of a tunnel vision and we cannot <coughs> jump out of it. Thank you. So. We should wait for a decade or so until things become <laughs> clear. And I guess my question to you, Jan, is can we afford to wait? No, I don't think we can afford to wait, but I want to clarify something about, you know, the idea of setting priorities. That's all good, but unfortunately, we cannot lose track of the bigger picture. And uh, we, we need a holistic view so that, you know, uh, 
the impact of our decision is clearly uh, assessed so that uh, there are no unattended consequences. And if you take the example of the carbon tax, that's going to have an impact on a single mom right. struggling to raise a child and <clears throat> who needs her car to visit patients because she's a nurse. The sad truth is that today, governments don't have the ability to target specific, very specific uh, categories of population. You can do it in broad terms, but if you look at how much money we wasted during COVID or during the inflation uh, period at, at the start of the Ukraine war, uh, it, it tells you a, a story that, that is a bit sad. So we really need to raise our game in terms of pricing uh, externalities. I think right. that that's essential. And, you know, one area uh, in particular, if you look at the work, the, the latest report for, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you know, there's a lot of debate on whether uh, new projects uh, in all fossil energy should be allowed. And, you know, you see a lot of arguments from here and there, uh, no consensus. And I think that's, again, a lack of fine-tuning or, or findings. And I think it's very important that NGOs in particular become more involved, uh, companies as well, to build right. uh, stronger data to uh, help governments uh, make better decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, of course, every politician that tries to price externalities uh, find that they run into immediate uh, political difficulties. And I guess the question for us is also going to be, to what extent are the political systems in our countries, in, in particularly in the rich countries, capable now of taking the decisions, both nationally and internationally, that everyone here is saying are essential? And, and I think, to what extent is the roots of the international economic disorder actually in national economic uh, dysfunctionality and national political dysfunctionality in so many countries. Okay, I think we have time for, we have 13 minutes. I want to take two questions and in the strictures from Madame Touré, I want to go to the, the people who are underrepresented on this panel, <laughs> which is young people. Uh, and women. One over there. And, 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 and also... Um, <laughs> Two-thirds of men. <laughs> and please be precise and, and concise if you can. I will try. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Basil Kotz. I work at the European Commission. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Um, you've mentioned that the global uh, economic uh, order is forever changing and is impacted by many factors. Uh, my argument is that, and you mentioned it as well, uh, it is impacted by the evolution of technology and innovations. My questions to you um, would be, in your opinion, do you think that the strategic use of innovations, new technology, in our era of, of global inter interconnect interconnectedness will lead to a more stable uh, economic order, or on the other hand, can lead to a disorder of the global economic system? Thank you. Very, very good question. So is the technological progress going to lead to more stability uh, or more instability? And, and you, would argue, you might also ask within countries, not just international. Anybody else have a question? No, I see no other questions. Okay, in that case, who would like to answer that question? Do you think that technology the pace of technological change, and, and particularly artificial intelligence now, is this going to make international economic relationships work better or, or more unstable? Anyone have a view on that? I've tried to ask a chat GPT, but I, I couldn't. <laughs> we could ask chat GPT for the answer, but... Uh, 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 I think it's a tough question and it can go e e either way, really. Um, you know, as I said, you know, in principle, having more data, you know, more fine-tuning of, of models can help uh, educate all of us and, and hopefully come up with mutual decisions and, and that go in the right direction and, and that creates sort of win-win situations at the end. But, but 
you know, technology can also create some new gaps uh, between countries. On balance, on balance, yeah. That, that was a very chat GPT answer though, right? Because you're saying it can be this, can be that. What Mark said, are you feeling positive about this or you think I'm more worried than I am feeling good about I'm, it? I am an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> but I'm sure. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I, d I think we do have the example of the Arab Spring, how much internet and um, technology play come into play. So the end of the process is another story. Uh, but if you come back to Africa, definitely um, it has uh, raised the level of consciousness, um, more participation of young people and, and women, and, and that's a good thing because I'm a, I mean, I'm a pro, I'm a pro disorder type of <laughs> activist. I mean, a, a disorder that would lead to a better order. <laughs> so uh, for that sense, um, in that sense, I think it's a good thing that people get more aware of the, of, of the issues, of the scandal, um, that's one thing. Um, so it, it, it forces government even to be more accountable on the issue they deal with, and, and I think it, it's, it's very good, because to get to a new order, you need some disorder, and maybe you know, technology is going to play a role. Of course, there is a downsize of it, we do know that, a message of hatred, um, and, and things like that, that we know, but globally, I think it, it, it's a good thing. It, it, it's a tool that gets citizens to participate more, especially in an environment where they don't have much access politically or economically. So it gave uh, more echo uh, to the voices of those who, you know, are leftovers, you know, on the side of the road. Thank, thank you very much. Good. Bit of disorder. Uh, come in, please. Yes, I would like to address the question raised from the floor with regard to technology development. I think it's good or not. Uh, it can be good or bad, but I think they change the priorities. My experience in negotiating Korea US FTA 2007-2006 at the time with regard to telecommunication, most important issue was how to liberalize facility-based telecommunication services. But after that, with the uh, OTT service in place, facility-based telecommunication service is not so important. Value-added services are more important. No one talk about, no one talk about facility-based telecommunication services anymore, OTT. At the time, we did not know what is the OTT, and at the time, the OTT doesn't enter into force. So we resisted the U.S. request to liberalize tel the facility-based telecommunication services, but we fully liberalized value-added telecommunication services. And OTT, like Netflix, is come over to the world through facility-based telecommunication services. So the development of technology can change the priorities in international trade agenda but it can be both good or bad. Right. Thank you. Pierre? Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with what uh, has been said. I, I, I personally, as an engineer, see the potentialities in technology. I think there are a lot of promises in technological progress, but it is the responsibility of human beings to give a moral dimension to technology use. And so technology is not a substitute to political will and to thinking about the moral dimension, the ethical dimension of technological change. What makes me uh, more optimistic than I, I was earlier is that there are international discussions about that dimension, especially uh, as far insofar as uh, uh, artificial intelligence, for example, is concerned. So I, I, I think that uh, technology can bring people together to discuss substantial matters and that, that's a good news, even in the current context. Thank you very much. Yeah, I guess the progress of science generally is good, that, but its implication, its uncertainty. The movie recently released, uh, Oppenheim, uh, disclosed uh, these fundamental contradiction. I guess that's very simple. Uh, Question, simple answer. Thank you very much.
But any thoughts on this? No, I, I just think that, of, uh, first of all, uh, technology brings chaos because uh, it uh, undermines the, some old technologies, uh, some uh, established relations, uh, and some established visions. So therefore, it, every kind of technological breakthrough is connected with increasing chaos. But the, you know, I would say the mission of innovators is to do what they are doing, to increase the chaos. And the mission of politicians and the mission of intellectual elite is just you know, to combat this and to put in some framework, in some, uh, uh, in, uh, to put some limits to this. So this is a kind of you know, societal change it is, as it is organized. So I definitely oppose the idea that we should regulate and uh, limit uh, the creative knowledge and you know, the creative expression in any way. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. And I don't think that's a conversation that it is feasible to summarize. So what I will say, though, is that I think what's very clear from this is I don't think that this hankering for preserving the order in which we used to live is actually a meaningful approach because every time we start talking about it, we discuss mostly the so many problems that the order that we have has created. And I don't think we yet have agreement on what is the kind of order where we're going to where we would like to end up, let alone where we are going to end up. And I'd say there's some quite open questions about how long and how disorderly the transition process will be and whether during that transition process we can make progress on some of the common challenges where we can't afford to wait for the lack of clarity to be resolved because it will just end up creating disorder of a whole different magnitude. So I want to thank all our panelists for their insights. I want to thank you all for, for your presence and I'd like you to join me in, in giving them a round of thanks, please.
So, ladies and gentlemen, please. We are going to start uh, our discussion with Mr. Leung Chung Ying. I, I hope you understand my pronunciation of your name. Uh, Mr. Leung Chung Ying is a very distinguished uh, inhabitant, if I may say so, from Hong Kong. And as you will see, I mean, you, maybe many of you know, know him already because I think this is the third, is it the third or the second, third, third time mm -hmm. you're uh, attending the World Policy Conference. But as you will see, he speaks English with an Ox Oxfordian whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, accent, <laughs> uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, impressive. You are not yet uh, Sir Chung Ying, no? Not yet. You are sir? not Sir. You were not knighted. No, we are not part of the UK now. <laughs> no, but you could have been before uh, knighted. <laughs> but anyway, so we have a half an hour for a conversation. Uh, we will speak a little bit of, uh, of Hong Kong, of course, but uh, I, I, I think Mr. Uh, Leung would be uh, also uh, pleased to say a few words about uh, China itself. But uh, let me <coughs> start with, uh, with Hong Kong, because after all, you were the chief executive of uh, Hong Kong relatively uh, recently. I mean, the, uh, since you, there were two more, uh, and uh, carrying the coming one, Mr. John Lee Ka Chu, is the successor of your successor. So le let me uh, uh, start by asking you uh, what uh, well, there were strange declarations in the past few uh, months about about Hong Kong. For instance, uh, your uh, the, the current uh, uh, chief executive uh, said uh, recently that uh, the uh, exiled, I quote, exiled uh, dissidents should live in fear. He said, "I told you so." Uh, you have, you, you have never heard, no. but you heard from me because I told you that on the <laughs> phone. Uh, so, but uh, even if you don't know uh, this, uh, uh, the, 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 this word of your successor, the success of your successor, it, it seems that uh, the, since uh, especially the last four or five years, Hong Kong has changed a lot and probably much uh, faster than uh, anyone uh, abroad uh, expected. So could you uh, comment uh, on uh, those uh, changes um, uh, as if uh, uh, the, uh, the, the slogan, you know, one country, two systems was uh, already uh, uh, finished, was already left uh, aside. So is there a future in Hong Kong for the concept of one party, two systems. One country, two systems. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, the first recommendation that I always make to our friends in the international community who cares about Hong Kong, China, one country, two systems, is that please come and see us. See, see it for yourself. Um, you walk the streets in Hong Kong and talk to uh, shopkeepers and taxi drivers and, and whatnot and sort of find out your own view on things in uh, Hong Kong. Um, one country, two systems is no longer a broad concept. Ever since 1990, when the basic law was promulgated, we had five years of drafting. Um, since China and the UK signed the joint declaration on the question of the future of Hong Kong, in that, in that five years, I was uh, Secretary General of the Basic Law uh, Consultative Committee, and we had 180 members from all walks of life, including British civil servants. Um, so anyone who's interested in the actual implementation of one country, two systems, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, with a high degree of autonomy and a promise of 50 years of no change, should actually get a copy of the Basic Law. I mean, one could very easily with your handphone now. I mean, you could so Google it. Um, is there the Chinese version, English version, and read the basic law um, from Article One 
to Article 160. So whenever um, foreign governments, including British government, claim that China is going back on the promise of one country, two systems, etc., um, I would say, I mean, openly say, um, tell me which article, which article you think the Chinese government and the Hong Kong government, Hong Kong SR government, are not sort of implementing. Um, I should also mention that the basic law, which is the constitution of Hong Kong, is subject to and has been subjected to judicial review in the courts of Hong Kong. And the courts of Hong Kong have handed down decisions against, in some cases, the Hong Kong government. So I don't think it's a, it's a question of um, anyone's interpretation of these broad words, um, one country, two systems. It's a question of whether the law has been followed. And the law was promulgated 23 years ago, 33 years ago. Thank you very much. But uh, on this question, you know, one country, two systems, of course, uh, it used to be mentioned for Hong Kong and for Taiwan. <coughs> the big uh, issue uh, now on the uh, international scene is, is Taiwan. And uh, many uh, commentators uh, from uh, outside China uh, consider that the evolution in Hong Kong, the repression <coughs> of um, the uh, political uh, movements of the last few years uh, would be uh, a very bad example from their viewpoint uh, about the uh, possible evolution of, of Taiwan. So could you comment uh, a little bit uh, on your own interpretation, on your own view of uh, Taiwan as compared to Hong Kong. So, of course, you will start by saying, I suppose, that it is a totally different situation. So, uh, could you uh, elaborate further on that? Yes, I will. Uh, thank you very much for bringing up um, uh, Taiwan, uh, which is an important subject. So far, this morning, uh, we had very useful discussions on the changing world order, um, world economic order, and um, Sino US relations. Um, but so far until now, uh, Taiwan has not been mentioned. Taiwan is important because China has been saying this all along, that uh, Taiwan is a core of core Chinese national interest. And that's what the Chinese side said in the Bali Accord, which the Chinese Foreign Minister, Mr. Wang Yi, made reference to when he met, I believe it was last week, 27th of October, President Biden. So no one should ignore uh, Taiwan, anyone who's interested in, um, in, in the current or the, the new world order uh, should ignore uh, Taiwan. It is a crucial issue for China and therefore in any bilateral or multilateral relations uh, where you find uh, China. The history of Taiwan, of course, is different from the history of uh, uh, Hong Kong. Um, Taiwan was ceded under the Treaty of Somotoseki. Uh, Hong Kong was ceded to the British under the Treaty of Nanking and Taiwan to the uh, Japanese in 1894. Um, and China was made to pay 7.5 million tails, sorry, 7.5 million kilograms, 200 million tails of uh, silver as war reparation to Japan. And Taiwan was ceded to Japan. And no one has ever disputed that China, that Taiwan was part of uh, China. Alongside Taiwan, Liaoning Peninsula was also ceded to Japan. And Liaoning Peninsula is now part of China. So why isn't Taiwan? Liaoning Peninsula is now Liaoning province of China. Um, China took Hong Kong back from British, um, under the Sino-British Joint Declaration in 1984. Um, Japan lost the Second World War. The Kuomintang Party lost the Civil War with the Communists and retreated to Taiwan. So there's no question of anyone in China. It's not just the ruling party of China. 
ever allowing Taiwan to go independent. Much in the same way as Deng Xiaoping said to Margaret Thatcher in 1982, that the people of China would not allow China to agree um, the ongoing um, rule of Hong Kong by the British. Equally, today as ever, the 1.4 billion people in China who never allowed the ruling party, the Chinese government, to let go of Taiwan. So it is an important issue for the international community to, uh, to understand. And China should not be, uh, Taiwan should not be encouraged in any way to ever think about independence. Now, that's a very important part of any equation in the world order involving China. And well, I, I haven't answered the question about uh, one country, two system. I say the same thing to our friends in Taiwan. Now, take out a copy of the Hong Kong Basic Law. And again, go from Article 1 to Article 160. And let's go through these articles one by one and, uh, and listen to the Taiwanese people, which article is not acceptable and which article is acceptable. For, for example, Hong Kong is allowed to remain as a member of WHO, which Taiwan wants to be. Hong Kong is allowed by Beijing to be, to be a, a member of WTO, which Taiwan wants to be. Would they object to these clauses? Probably, probably no. Hong Kong, under the basic law, has our own passports. We have our own currency, which is freely convertible with the Hong Kong dollar. Would the Taiwanese disagree with this? I don't think so. So let's find out what articles there are in the Hong Kong basic law that the Taiwanese find not acceptable. And let's talk about them. Let us remain a, 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 a few more minutes on, on Taiwan. You see, don't you think that uh, everything would be much simpler if the uh, population of Taiwan was massively uh, in favor of a quick reunification with uh, mainland China, but this is not the case. So how do you uh, explain that? And how do you in China, if I take your mainland China hat, uh, how do you uh, see the legal uh, principle of uh, self-determination? Because after all, you know, from a classical democratic standpoint, uh, if a population in a certain uh, territory uh, wants to become independent, uh, after all, it is up to the population to make up its mind, to decide. So uh, obviously this is not the point of view of, 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 of China. So how, wh how, what is your argument to, about that? Um, to your last point, my experience is that that point has not been allowed to the people in Northern Ireland, nor in the Scottish devolution process. So it isn't just uh, um, the people in one part of the country saying, hey, we have uh, voted, there's a referendum or opinion poll, uh, we want to be independent and bye-bye. I don't think it ever works like that. Um, uh, I've been reading uh, two Taiwanese daily newspapers uh, every day for 30 something years. It is important for the two sides to communicate and for the Taiwanese people, the two point, uh, 26 million people who live on the island to understand the mainland's position, the Chinese government's position and real life on the mainland. Um, and I think we could use a lot more people-to-people -people dialogue between the two sides, <clears throat> which is something that I've been facilitating myself. Um, and again, people need to see for themselves what lives about uh, political, social, economic lives about um, on, the, on the mainland. Um, and that's something that I think we're not doing enough. But if we, if, if we stay one minute at the example of Scotland, you know, in, in the case of, of, of Scotland, there was a referendum a few years ago that was authorized by London. 
And of course, the uh, independent party lost the referendum, yeah. but uh, there never was any action from London to suppress uh, opposition uh, to independence in uh, Scotland. Whereas, uh, uh, in the case of, uh, if we go back to Hong Kong, our understanding, we may be wrong, but if we are wrong, please correct, is that uh, it's extremely difficult today in Hong Kong to uh, uh, demonstrate or to develop an opposition party. Uh, as you said, the referendum on Scotland was authorized by London. Yes. Beijing is not authorizing a referendum on Taiwan. Secondly, Scotland has a very different history compared to Taiwan. The United Kingdom is called the United Kingdom for good reason, for, for historical uh, reason. Um, so I don't think it was to make sure a direct comparison between the two, but anyway, um, I think the world agrees that Taiwan is part of China. Um, inter interestingly, or um, revealingly, uh, the official airline of Taiwan is called, surprise, surprise, China Airlines. So there's no, no question of independence, there's no question of self-determination. And I think um, uh, the Taiwanese people should know um, and the international community should know the determination of China uh, to keep Taiwan as part of China. So my last question on this issue, but you understand, you know very well that it is a extremely important issue for China, of course, but it's also an extremely important issue for the future of international uh, relations. Uh, in uh, our understanding, when I say our understanding, I think uh, from uh, outside, uh, is uh, that uh, President Xi Jinping, in various declarations over time, has given the impression that uh, he uh, would like the issue to be resolved sooner rather than later, and perhaps uh, as uh, early or at the latest, maybe in uh, 2049, that is on the 30th, the 100th uh, anniversary uh, of, the, of Mao's uh, victory. Uh, 2049 is uh, tomorrow, politically speaking. It is uh, 25 years from now. So how should we should we understand that there is a time limit uh, for the ultimate uh, solution of the problem, or uh, could we interpret the uh, situation as possibly lasting for another 50 years or so? Um, the ruling party in Taiwan um, may not have that patience um, their inclination to declare independence has become more and more obvious. Now, saying that Taiwan is part of China and at the same time uh, dragging one's feet, um, trying to maintain the status quo for another de decade, for another two decades, and more or less forever, is basically committing a contradiction in terms. Um, so the two sides have to come to together. And to your earlier uh, question, the central government of China has always paid a great deal of attention to public opinion on, the, on, on Taiwan, uh, much in the same way as they paid importance to or pay attention to public opinion in Hong Kong when we drafted the Hong Kong Basic Law, it took five years. It was a big committee of 180 of a secretary of 30-something people worked on it for, um, for five years. So I think the, these are the processes that will probably take place. Um, and obviously China uh, has never uh, given up the option of using force to reunify the country if necessary.
Well, you know, uh, the WPC, which now you know a little bit, is a place where we can discuss friendly uh, issues which are complicated and where uh, it's not always easy to, to, to agree. Uh, uh, so in that uh, spirit, um, I would like to ask you the following question. Clearly, the regime in uh, China has become more and more authoritarian uh, since uh, President Xi Jinping uh, came in power, and he seems now to concentrate uh, all powers in an unprecedented uh, way since uh, uh, Mao Zedong, and perhaps even uh, more successfully than Mao, because uh, Mao was in serious domestic difficulties for, uh, during part of his term. So uh, I have a, 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 a simple uh, question because you deal a lot also with economic issue yourself, you know, in the Hong Kong uh, area and uh, beyond. My question is the, is the following, you know, I, uh, it seems to somebody like me that uh, part of the economic success of uh, China has been related to the relatively liberal approach of uh, President Xi's uh, predecessors. <coughs> now, uh, the regime is more and more authoritarian. Also this uh, authoritarianism, authoritarianism is also expressed vis-a-vis -vis business people. Now, uh, it's very difficult if you're a businessman, especially if you run big, big companies, to be uh, constantly uh, under political uh, pressure with the uh, possibility someday just to disappear and reappear after six months or never reappear at all. So uh, our, our perception is that uh, it, it, may be, uh, uh, it may create some serious difficulties for the future of uh, Chinese uh, capitalism. Uh, so the question is, uh, don't you believe or some people believe, even the good, loyal communist uh, members of the Communist Party, that uh, excessive political uh, pressure on the business community could be detrimental to the future of uh, economic growth. And if, if such is the case, uh, that uh, in the competition between uh, China and the United States, and more generally with the, with the West, uh, this uh, tendency uh, could uh, slow down uh, the, the pace of uh, uh, economic uh, development in China with some very serious uh, consequences. I've, I've been reading uh, reports and commentaries that are very similar to what I just mentioned um, in Western media and also in Japanese media too. But that's not my experience. Um, in the past six years since I left the position of uh, Chief Secretary of Hong Kong SR government, I spent more time on the mainland of China, not just the Sun provinces, but also outlying regions, provinces such as Xinjiang, Heilongjiang, uh, Ningxia, and so on. I spent more time on the mainland than in Hong Kong. And that's not my experience. That's what I s not what I see, and that's not what I, what I hear. Um, I'm one of the vice chairman of the National Committee of the CPPCC, it's quite a mouthful. Um, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is one of the four uh, organs in the Chinese political structure. You have the Communist Party, you have the government, you have the National People's Congress, which is the legislature, and then you have the, you have the CPPCC. The composition of the Chinese political structure uh, in this way is very different from anyone else you can find in the world, in other governments. Um, in my position as one of vice chairman of CPPCC National Committee, I do not feel the last 10 years have been, has been more authoritarian. Um, I just came down from uh, Beijing, arriving early in the morning uh, today uh, in Abu Dhabi. And in um, Beijing, we had two and a half days of a very full and very intensive discussion on green development. The government people were there, 
they were asked questions. We had 300 people at the plenary sessions, and then we had nine subgroup discussions. I don't think it's a manifestation of authoritarianism uh, at all. Um, and in terms of business investments, we're still seeing a thriving uh, private sector. The private sector now accounts for more than half of the country's GDP. Okay, you have big state-owned state enterprises that have been partially privatized by listing on the Shanghai Exchange, the Shenzhen Exchange, and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, you also see a lot of Hong Kong money going into the mainland China, particularly the Greater Bay Area, which covers nine cities in the Guangdong province, Hong Kong, Macau. Thank you very much. Last question. Uh, <coughs> what uh, lessons do China uh, take from the Ukraine war? Of course, my question is related to the thinking, strategic thinking about Taiwan. But uh, China is not Russia. Um, Taiwan is not Ukraine. China's position uh, on this conflict has been so clearly uh, spelled out. Um, I, don't, I don't even think the ruling party, which is pro-independence in Taiwan, would themselves compare the cross-strait relations and the possibility of an armed conflict, if it happens, uh, to the situation in, um, in Europe between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. I don't think they would ever uh, think it in those terms themselves. So, we have uh, 58 uh, seconds left. If someone would like to ask one concise question, <coughs> I was absolutely sure that uh, there would be, well, uh, I, I take the question from an expert uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the region, Mr. Cabestan. Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Liang. Plus près, plus près du micro. Okay, I'm, I'm maybe the, the, only, the only one in the room uh, who share with you the fact that I'm a permanent resident of Hong Kong. I've been in Hong Kong for 25 years. And I have a very simple question. After the protest movement of so, 2019, the protest movement of 2019, don't you think that the Hong Kong government has not made in, enough effort to foster reconcili reconciliation within the society. I feel that the Hong Kong community is very divided today. So do you think the Hong Kong government could have done more to foster reconciliation among the various segments of the Hong Kong society? There were protests, but there were very serious riots as well, uh, inflicting bodily harm um, on fellow civilian citizens and, of course, policemen. And these people were apprehended, they were brought to justice, and they were sentenced uh, by the law courts. There was no question of the administration saying that we could turn a blind eye to people who broke the law under those circumstances. And they were very, as we could all see on uh, TV footages, very serious uh, offenses, um, maiming and killing and destruction of properties. Oh no, one sentence, one sentence. Micro, Larry. So my, my question, sir, in one sentence is that uh, why China, which is uh, so willing to preserve the international order and the international institutions like UN, WCO, and so on, or the international institutions, why China does not recognize the authority of the permanent arbitrary tribunal of The Hague, which is, as you know, older than the United Nations it's, uh, from the 19th century, which said that the, the separation, the separation uh, of uh, uh, the, um, 
the islands in the South China uh, Sea between uh, China and uh, Filipinos. So how is it that a government uh, which wants to protect international order and international institutions <coughs> does not recognize the ruling of the permanent um, arbitrary uh, tribunal of La Hague. China did not take part in the arbitration. Okay, so that was a long question and a short answer. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Lung. I think the conclusion of this uh, uh, relatively short discussion is that uh, next uh, year or so we should take uh, six uh, hours uh, discussion to, to cover uh, all the facets of that uh, most important issue for the future of the world. Thank you uh, very much and uh, we, uh, it's now time I think for lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you enjoyed your lunch today. We are set to return to the plenary hall for the afternoon session. So please, if you could kindly find your seat to the pl in the plenary hall, and we will begin the afternoon sessions momentarily. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin our afternoon sessions. Please find a seat in the plenary ballroom so we may begin momentarily. Thank you very much.
Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we will begin the afternoon sessions of the 16th World Policy Conference, day one. We would like if you could find your seats in the plenary ballroom, and we will begin momentarily. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. I hope you had a nice lunch and uh, we are now looking forward to sharing with you our perspectives on geopolitics and global trade. What can be done today? And we wanted to share with you uh, what we believe is uh, an interesting corporate perspective on where global trade will go. Uh, I'm being joined by a illustrious panel, which I will introduce in a few minutes. And I'd like to kick us off with just uh, three, four slides on how we see the world evolving. <laughs> Introducing myself, my name is Nikolaus Lang. I'm a senior partner at uh, BCG, the Boston Consulting Group. I'm leading BCG's global advantage practice, uh, which is dedicated to geopolitics and trade and international collaboration. So, when you advise corporate leaders, what is one of the most striking changes I have observed in the last five years is that the way how corporate leaders think about their business is moving away from a monodimensional perspective of the future to a multidimensional perspective to the of the future. And that means that corporate leaders ask us about what are the scenarios of the future? How does the world in 2030 look like? And so, based on this, we have uh, developed a few scenarios which we believe could describe the future. The first scenario is a scenario which is called Back to the Future. The scenario Back to the Future is a scenario which is kind of reimagining the world we knew from 1990s, 2000, a world geared towards free trade, a world where the Bretton Woods system and institutions were working, still working, and companies that were actually seeing the world as relatively flat. Remember, it's the time when Francis Fukuyama was speaking about the end of history. The second scenario is what we would call the limited stalemate, which is a continuation of the conflict in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine. And we have Minister Kuleba speaking to us later in the afternoon. And of course, there's a view of saying, given the static front line, given major elections in Russia, Ukraine and US next year, this war is not likely to end very soon. Then there's a third scenario which is called multipolar competition. A scenario where we see an increasing emergence of three groups, and I'm not saying blocks, deliberately I'm not saying blocks. First, a Western group with US, EU, and some of allies in the Indo-Pacific. Second, an Eastern bloc and group between China and Russia, and some allied countries ranging from North Korea to Belarus, and then a third group of countries which is not recreating the movement of the non-alliance, but which shows that they want to be at equidistance between these two groups, and this is of course first and foremost India, Indonesia, but also countries in this region and in Africa. And then there's a fourth scenario which a lot of corporate leaders always ask us about, which is actually the global escalation. And I think we discussed about this potential of a global escalation just before lunch. And of course, that would be the addition of a war in the Indo-Pacific to the current conflicts we see around the world. So these are four scenarios. Now, the beauty with scenarios is that they are precisely wrong, but generally right. Now, when we look at the scenarios going forward, the key question is, where do we see the future and what is the most likely scenario? Going through these four scenarios, we definitely see a loss of steam when it comes to the back to the future scenarios. Look at the CHIPS Act, look at IRA, look at the challenges we heard also this morning around WTO. So having a world in 2030 that is similar to what we had around the 1990s and 2000s, is at least from our perspective relatively unlikely. Second, the limited stalemate. 
We have seen movements in the last 12 months as with increased Western aids in Ukraine, although stalled now. President Zelensky several times in the US and a clear focus on continuing this war. However, we are in a war of attrition. Did you know that last year we had tens of thousands of kilometers won from both sides? Well, if you accumulate the movement of the armies in the last nine months, no side has won more than 1,000 square kilometers. So de facto, we have a static front line. Probably this war will at least continue for the next 12 to 18 months if you look at the elections that stand before us. Ukraine, Russia, US. So this is something that will definitely impact us for the next years to come, although hopefully we will reach some kind of ceasefire negotiations in the next years to come. So the dominant scenario is the scenario of the multipolar world. And when you look at what has happened in the last 12 months, a lot of signals go in this direction. It's a multipolar world where we have President Xi traveling to Moscow in March, President Putin traveling to um, Beijing last month. We have the emergence of the BRICS and the expansion of the BRICS. We have a strong development around the world of an independent thinking beyond the two blocks we are looking at. And last but not least, in this multipolar world, we have also seen the emergence of old conflicts in the last few weeks. Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kosovo, Serbia, and of course, Israel, Gaza. So all these developments show that the multipolar world is probably the highly scenario for 2030. On global escalation, we are a little bit more cautious because we believe that global escalation at this stage, given economic development, military unreadiness, is less likely to happen. So what does this mean for business? Well, I come with a half positive news. When you look at the left-hand side of this chart, you see the development of global trade in the next 10 years. The good news is that global trade will grow by 2.3% per year. You tell me, well, that's actually not bad. Well, under the scenario back to the future, between 1990 and 2010, trade was growing 7% per year. So we are at less than one-third of the growth. So yes, we are growing, but we are not growing as fast as we would grow in a free trade world. Plus, geopolitics <laughs> impact how trade routes evolve. Now I'm coming to a complex slide, and it's my second, the last slide, but I want to share with you a few of these trade routes. There are trade routes that will go massively down Obviously, the trade route between Russia and EU goes down by more than 200 billion euros, which is due to all the energy sanctions we see here. But we see also a trade route between China and US going down. And obviously, we see also that the Brexit has proven not very useful for the UK. Then, you have trade routes that grow, the yellowish ones. Grow, but grow slowly, underproportionately. And the most interesting thing is that all the really strong trade routes are in the global south. This is the picture of the future, where you see that one trillion dollar additional trade is emanating from Southeast Asia. You see that India is playing an important role, but you also see that the North Atlantic trade is booming considerably. And you could flatly say that the Europeans are replacing Russian pipeline gas by North American LNG. I think this is oversimplified. But you see a shift of trade going on. And looking at the winners next to Southeast Asia, look at where Mexico stands. Mexico is the big winner of nearshoring and friendshoring in this world. So let me conclude before I move to the panel. What do we see for corporate leaders? we see five no-regret moves. First, make sure that you diversify your supply chains. The word I hear most in boardrooms currently is China plus one or China plus two. 
which means what is the alternative to China, both as a market and as a supply chain. Second, enhance your navigation ability in a world of price volatility and inflation. Third, prepare your organization to work in different worlds. Do you need an organization for China and one organization for India and one for Europe? The time where one headquarter was running the world is definitely over. Fourth, look at turbocharging, turbocharging risk and cybersecurity. And last but not least, build the geopolitical muscle in the corporate boardroom. So in order to further develop this geopolitical muscle, I'm very pleased to join this great panel uh, who, with whom I'll have the pleasure to discuss over the next hour um, the impact of geopolitics and global trade on the corporate boardrooms. So I'll start with a brief introduction and then we'll go with the statements. So I'm joined by Penny next to me, who is with the Atlantic Council. Penny, you were before that 10 years at UPS, taking care of international affairs, before that at Citicorp, and before in the US administration. We talked a lot about your perspective on how will trade change. I think you have a very also interesting perspective on the two last US administration, and we look forward to hearing you view which one was more beneficial <laughs> for trade. Um, Tehu, you have been uh, Korea's Minister of Trade in the early 2010s. Uh, you have been active and be actively promoting trade. You have also been professor and dean at the Korean National University. And you are uh, now advising companies in this all trade environment. Nicola, you are with Total Energy. You started also in the French administration and then joined Total Energy 22 years ago. You are now uh, president of the whole production and exploration activities. You have been in many different countries, uh, working in places like Nigeria, Myanmar, Qatar. And we discussed also in our preparation that you see a big power of your business and your industry to really look at the development and building bridges going forward. And Jay, you have been at the Navy, you have been diplomat in places like Pakistan and many other places. Uh, and you have then moved to consulting and you are now heading Veracity Worldwide, which is a global geopolitical consultancy and risk consultancy. And we have also the pleasure to work together on some instances. So this is the group. And let me go maybe in the order of the panel we have here with uh, the perspectives that this group has on geopolitics and trade. And so I'd like to invite Nicola uh, for the first statement on how you see it from an extractive industry perspective, which I think is the one of the industries that, if there's an industry that already has a good geopolitical muscle, it's definitely the extractive industry. But I think there are many other industries that can learn from you. Over to you. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. First, uh, let me say it's a pleasure to join this panel and to share a few comments on how a company like Total Energies is managing uh, geopolitical risks, international risk. Uh, and I'm going to start with that, and after I want to make a, a few comments on how we see some opportunities in uh, international trade and investment, and, and finish with a few comments on energy transition in, in, in all this. So Total Energy you know, is a French company, so we are born 100 years ago in, in a country where there is virtually no oil and gas resource. So from the very beginning, we had to go abroad, you know, work in, uh, in different countries and learn how to manage geopolitical risk. Uh, and you know, when thinking about how we do that, uh, I came up with uh, five or six key principles. The first one is about uh, compliance with our values. Uh, and our first core value is the security and the safety of our people. And it's impossible for a company to send a lot of people abroad in challenging environment if you know you don't ensure their safety and their security. So we have golden rules, we have a safety framework, uh, we learn from experience, and, and this we apply everywhere. Similarly, 
One key principle for us to navigate into those, those risks is to always stick to our compliance principles and ethics principles, no matter what is the country, what is the, what is the context. Uh, and obviously, to comply with international sanctions when they apply to our activities. So that's principle number one, compliance with our values. Number two, it's pretty obvious, is diversification. Uh, so the company is working in uh, 130 countries. We, you know, we like to diversify the way we allocate our capital. Uh, we've set a principle for ourselves that uh, we don't allocate more than 10% of our total capital employee in one single country. For upstream investments, our upstream investments, uh, they are scattered between uh, the Americas, the Middle East, uh, Africa, Europe, uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, I think the biggest area for us is the uh, Middle East and North Africa, which is a bit less than 30% of our total production. So we diversify. Similarly, when doing our transition and investing in integrated power and renewables, uh, we make sure that we also diversify the allocation of the capital and we also diversify investments between deregulated markets and regulated markets. The third principle is we like the exposure to liquid markets. Uh, of course, oil, the oil market is a liquid market. When you produce oil, you know the oil goes on a tanker and can be supplied to any country in the world. For gas, it's a bit more complicated because gas relies on heavy uh, transportation infrastructure. For gas, we focus a lot of our investment in liquefied natural gas, which offers this flexibility uh, on, on, on this exposure to a liquid market. You know, for liquefied natural gas, you can redirect the production from one country to another. The first one is about supply chain resilience. Uh, in this moving world that is getting more and more fragmented, uh, we are careful to continue working with a wide array of contractors from different locations. And of course, the geographical footprint of the company helps us to do that. Uh, we tend also you know, to develop long-term frame agreements with our contractors to provide visibility and uh, to provide security of supply in a way to, to both sides. The next one is about uh, cost discipline. Uh, on financial strength. Uh, we are in our industry exposed to uh, high volatility, volatility of prices. You know, the oil price can go up and down from $20 to $100. So this we don't control, we accept we don't control that. But what we control is our cost. Uh, and our motto is to produce low cost energy, which is a key factor for us of resilience and strength. And the strength of the balance sheet, of course, is also key for a company like Total Energy to weather crisis, which can have a pretty significant or severe impact uh, at times. And the last uh, principle is, uh, it's not a principle, in fact, it's a, or it's a principle of action, is crisis anticipation and preparation. So we spend quite a bit of time uh, on uh, identifying and mapping our risks. Uh, making sure we have the right uh, mitigations in place, uh, carrying out crisis management exercise based on a number of scenarios. And this is what allowed us, in fact, to weather a number of the recent crises. If I take, for example, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we never stopped production in any of our operational sites during the entire crisis. But this is due basically to practice on a uh, on, on, on anticipation and on, on, on preparation. The second comment I want to make is um, that private investment uh, through long-term partnerships contributes to build bridges uh, between companies, between countries, and those bridges, they can, not always, but they can survive a geopolitical crisis. So what we're doing here, for instance, in the UAE, where we have a partnership that we built with ADNOC for 80 years now, uh, where people uh, know each other, where we shared a lot of experience, where we, of course, invested in Abu Dhabi, but also teamed 
uh, with ad hoc to invest together abroad. Uh, this type of bridge or this type of link is very solid, and that's what we try to develop to make sure that our activities are resilient. We have similar partnerships in uh, many countries across uh, Africa, across Americas, across uh, the Middle East and uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, we also contribute to or participate or like to participate in cross-border investments. Uh, a good example of that is a, a project called Dolphin, uh, a gas pipeline between Qatar and the UAE, which started 15 years ago. Gas has continued to flow uh, uninterrupted during uh, 50 years, uh, uh, despite uh, ups and downs. I would say our resilience also, or the, the one way that we try, to, we use to, to increase our resilience, uh, is uh, integration. Uh, in oil and gas, we not only produce oil and gas, but we also supply oil and gas to the people. Uh, you take uh, the example of Africa, for instance, in almost all African countries, we have a substantial distribution network, which for us uh, is a factor of uh, robustness because it means we not only produce and export energy, but we also supply energy to the people. And when you bring something to the people, basically, they generally support your activities in a better manner. So, my last comment, uh, I'm watching the time, is uh, that in this uh, changing uh, global trade pattern, one key factor is uh, the energy transition and the, the need to um, address uh, climate change. In Total Energy, we believe that our role, our mission, is to provide more energy with less emissions. Way more energy, because there is a growing population uh, needed uh, more, more energy, but uh, this more energy, we want to supply it in a manner that is safer, that makes energy available, uh, affordable to the people. Uh, and when I was talking about controlling the cost and, you know, of our activity, it's also a way to make energy supply affordable to the people. Less emissions, I don't need to explain, because, of course, uh, we need to produce... Uh, energy uh, uh, with, uh, while reducing the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions, particularly for ourselves, the greenhouse gas emissions related to our activities, so what we call our scope one and two emissions. So by doing this, uh, we are working not on our own, but we are working in partnerships uh, with uh, national oil companies in the countries in which we operate. It's the case here uh, with ADNOC, for instance, where we cooperate on uh, identification and uh, uh, elimination of uh, methane emissions from, uh, from our operations. We like also to develop multi-energy projects. Uh, we have a large project, uh, multi-energy project in Iraq that we started recently, where we develop an oil production, but we also gather and process natural gas for local power generation. And we built a, a large-scale one gigawatt uh, solar power generation plant to supply the local communities in, in Basra area. So typically for us, this kind of multi-energy project is a way to contribute to the transition in a manner that is positive for the countries in which we operate. And it's also a way for us to manage risk and to diversify what, what we're doing. Well, I'm going to, st to stop there and uh, just to say that, uh, of course, uh, Geopolitical risk and uh, the risk associated with our investment is a, a key parameter in all the investment decision making in the company and in the way we uh, endorse uh, or decide to launch projects. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nicola. And I think the point which is also interesting is to see his role, as you said, building bridges and also investing in local communities huh, is, is, I think, a very important part of avoiding risk, not also from a corporate point of view, but from a societal point of view. Thank you. So, uh, Penny, you, uh, we discussed about the U.S. I think the U.S. has been one of the key uh, drivers and shapers of global trade. In 1945, has been at the beginning of the uh, 44, beginning of the Bretton Woods uh, conference and bringing the world together, trying to define some rules of the game. 
Now, lately, we have seen that these rules of the game have changed or are changing. Um, you have been looking at that for many years from different vantage points, from corporate, from government. So what's your view on geopolitics and trade and what can be done today, also in the light of what will happen next year? Great. Well, thank you. So I believe trade is a force for good. And I'm so pleased to be here today because I can actually say the word trade, which you can't really say in Washington, D.C. <laughs> at the moment. Everything supply chains, economic security, other issues, but we don't really talk about trade. Earlier today, we saw some fantastic slides and some presentations about how trade has contributed to global wealth creation. And we've also seen how trade has been impactful at helping poverty decline globally because the lowest 25% of our populations are the ones that are most impacted by the regressive trade policies like tariffs and non-tariff barriers that go into effect. When COVID-19 hit, people suddenly had to grapple with the fact that everything wasn't available instantaneously. I know I had to deal with my kids who didn't understand why they couldn't get exactly what they wanted exactly at that moment because of the overwhelming but slightly odd demands we all had during that period. Trade and supply chains were actually quite resilient during COVID-19. And while we may not have been able to get the hair clippers we needed, or the Peloton machines, or some of the other things that all of us wanted when we were at home making bread and trying to do jobs and educate children at the same time, supply chains generally adjusted because international trade and the rules generally worked. And I think that that is not understood or appreciated enough by folks. What people have focused on are some of the export controls and export restrictions that went into place, some of the port issues that arose, the hard infrastructure issues that arose because it is people that are behind the movement of goods and when people can't get to their jobs because of COVID, it does bollocks up things a little bit. And then there was also in some cases really extreme demand for things that we had to retool uh, factories and other things to do. So when I think about the geopolitics and when I look forward, I think what impacts uh, is really coming into the fore is the lack of trust that developed coming out of this. So while trade moved relatively well, there was some distrust that came up, building on what had been developing over time uh, already, but it really, I think, came to the fore coming out of COVID-19. And you can particularly see that around the vaccine issue, particularly in the global south. So um, that's resulted in a whole lot of supply chain resilience groups being developed and a whole lot of other things that are going on. But that current geopolitical situation and the tensions that are there between some of the big countries is really leading to these debates, as you've pointed out, about deglobalization, reglobalization, or, or maybe everything is just a lot of hot air that we're, there, we're talking about and nothing's really changing. I think trade is like water. It finds its way around the rocks and the river, but there are ways to control, guide, sometimes dam water, but as long as there is demand or gravity, the water will continue to flow. And what we're seeing now is governments trying to control the flows of trade in ways that I think um, were pointed out earlier, using export controls, using sanctions, using indirect means, using investment, outbound investment regimes and other regimes. All of that is coming to the fore to try to control where we are today. So, as a result, I think trade is becoming more regional, both physically and cultural. And so let me turn now a bit to where we are in the U.S. So there was a great piece last week. Uh, it was a comedy skit uh, on a show in the United States called Saturday Night Live. And it was a skit about George Washington trying to rally the troops to, to fight for life, liberty, and the pursuit of the Americans' ability to use their own series of weights and measures. And it went through a whole discussion about how the uh, Americans wanted to use kind of irrational, slightly random weights and measures, whether it be Fahrenheit, whether it be pounds, whether it be tons, whether it be any of the measures we use in the United States. 
And it pointed out how we wanted to be able to do exactly what we wanted to do. And even though it wasn't 100% rational, that was what our goal was. And I think sometimes when I look at our trade policy, it reminds me of how Americans have adopted our series of weights and measures in the United States. It's not always in our best interest, but by gosh, we're going to do it. So Jake Sullivan recently published a piece in Foreign Affairs talking about our current US foreign policy and where we're going to reestablish US leadership. But he didn't mention trade once in the piece. Um, if you look at other US government publications, they've pretty much stopped mentioning exports as well. So for the Biden administration, global leadership is back, and they really are trying to rebuild friendships with people around the world. But they're also trying to grow the US economy, as they say, from the middle out and the bottom up. And that seems to be taking precedent in terms of how they're approaching our international economic relations. So they're trying to develop a whole series of new economic tools that will help them to deepen these relationships with countries but not sacrifice the middle class. So we th see things like IPEF, this week they're doing the America's Leaders Summit, all of which are tools that are generally not binding, do not fall under any kind of enforcement mechanism, and frankly are, may not be durable if the administration changes in a year's time. So very innovative, trying to be very creative, but at the end of the day, unclear how durable these new things they're developing are gonna be. The WTO has been largely ignored and neglected by the administration, and we can see that where it is. That may be the best case scenario for the WTO at the moment, is that um, as we, we look forward, and as we also look forward, there's a heavy focus on manufacturing, and you had the chart on, good, uh, on goods, but services is a huge part of the US economy, and services does continue to grow, but the administration made some kind of surprising announcements last week about digital trade that I think were quite um, confusing, given, I think, um, where the US is on digital trade. So people are asking, will a Biden 2.0 be more open to trade? Um, I'm, I'm not convinced. If you look at Biden's record as a senator and his voting record, uh, you will see that he's got a very mixed record with regards to trade. And I know a lot of people are pinning hopes that maybe Biden, if he stays on or wins re-election, will do something ambitious. I just don't, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's where we're going. And I think that where we are today is probably the best case scenario for the US with regards to trade. Let me conclude with um, companies. Um, so I think what became also really clear out of this is that companies um, didn't know where all their risk were. And risk, um, generally companies, you can scenario plan, risk are generally not what the last crisis was. Uh, it's something new, usually something that surprises you, and while it might occasionally be a black swan, what hits you is usually something that's within your control. So supply chains were an issue, not necessarily because of other things, but because um, uh, it didn't really rise to the C-suite in the past. So, so being able and sitting down and doing creative scenario planning, um, looking at some of the issues in a much more uh, thoughtful way, I think are really important for companies, and I know others on this panel will be discussing some of the specifics around how to do that moving forward. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you, Nicholas, for the time. And thank you all in the audience. I know we're post-lunch. It's always the hardest slot to have at a conference. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Penny. And uh, we'll try to be as in uh, interesting and entertaining as possible <laughs> to overcome post-lunch uh, inertia. Um, uh, I think just on this last point, which you mentioned, it's interesting. I met one with the CEO, and maybe he has a very focused view of the world. But he said to me, you know, it's interesting because I have three new topics on my agenda in the last 10 years. So 10 years ago, digital appeared on my agenda. Five years ago, sustainability appeared on my agenda. And geopolitics appeared on my agenda on February 24th of last year. Uh, which I found interesting that this is kind of a five-year increment and, he, and, and that's also something which we see that this kind of geopolitical muscle needs to be developed.
So let me now turn uh, to Theo. Thank you very much for coming over from Seoul and give us the perspective of trade. You have been very much engaged in global trade negotiations, uh, both on an incentive perspective, also on a protecting perspective. Um, you have been, as I said, uh, the Minister uh, for Trade in Korea, and you have a very interesting perspective on the future trade regimes. So please, over to you. Well, thank you, Nikolaus. Uh, actually, I'm the only one who doesn't know much about business, <laughs> uh, even though I'm advising our clients about the geopolitics, you know, and some legislation introduced by the United States and EU, but I'm not really in the you know, area of business. So bear that in mind. Uh, this, this afternoon, I want to share some of my thoughts uh, on the um, evolving landscape uh, of the world uh, trade environment. And uh, as we all know very well, we all talk about this in, uh, in the first session and second session, the global trade environment has been undergoing unprecedented uh, transformation. And as a trade economist, uh, I believe the most fundamental change is the increasing prevalence of negative views toward uh, globalization and free trade among the general public. There is a widespread perception uh, in many countries that domestic industries and laborers have suffered from uh, domestic companies' overseas investment and excessive imports from uh, abroad, uh, since they think that, that these have uh, caused a uh, huge unemployment rate and also growing income uh, inequality. Unfortunately, uh, politicians uh, have strategically promoted this negative sentiment on globalization and free trade to capitalize on the psychological state of low income voters, uh, predominantly uh, composed of workers, for their advantages in the election. Indeed, uh, this has led to protectionist policies in many countries that prioritize domestic production over corporate overseas investment and imposts from a uh, uh, foreign country. Another critical impact, uh, uh, another critical aspect impacting the world trade environment, we all talk about this, is the strategic competition between the US and China. Following the imposition of extra tariffs on imports uh, from China by former President Trump, US-China uh, disputes have uh, broadened the scope of national security to include economic and technology areas. The US considers steel and aluminum even crucial element in its national security and is actively engaging in securing its dominant uh, position in strategically advanced technology sectors such as semiconductor, electric vehicles, EV batteries and AI and so on. In addition, the global companies, uh, we all talk about this uh, now, have experienced real challenges uh, stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic and the war between Russia and Ukraine, and they recognize the imperative need to restructure their uh, supply chain. At the same time, uh, major countries are actively promoting initiatives related to various social and environmental objectives, including uh, enhancing labor, and human rights, and uh, reducing carbon emission, and uh, protecting the environment. Let me now provide some uh, examples of major countries' policy measures. The US has introduced uh, Chips and Science Act, uh, along allocating $52 billion in subsidies to the semiconductor sector. The EU has also introduced the EU Chips Act, which uh, provides substantial amount of subsidies to increase the global market share of its semiconductor. It is crucial to notice that countries previously critical of China for providing heavy government subsidies to specific sectors now give themselves industrial subsidies to promote their domestic uh, industries. Of course, China continues to provide government subsidies to key advanced technology sectors. This means that uh, industrial policies may be uh, revived triggering unfair trade activities among major countries. The U.S. restricts exports of semiconductor and semiconductor equipment to China, which is you know, hugely affecting the Korean companies, which are operating in China. Samsung and SK Hynix are, are producing semiconductor in China. 
U.S. also introduced, uh, we, we in Korea we call IRA, but now it's like IRA, uh, IRA uh, which is Infl Inflation Reduction Act, which include provisions of uh, uh, provisions discriminating uh, against uh, electric vehicles assembled outside North America. And uh, EVs equipped with batteries manufactured with parts or minerals from the so-called foreign countries of concern, which may include uh, China. At the same time, uh, leading nations worldwide have advocated uh, for policies to establish stable supply chain, particularly for critical raw materials. For example, the United States is uh, endeavoring to establish a critical minerals club with the EU through the uh, Trade and Technology Council, another club uh, with the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, member states. Also, EU uh, has introduced Critical Raw Material Act to limit its dependence on a single country for critical raw material to a maximum of 65%. As we can see, major countries are utilizing subsidies, trade, and investment measures to achieve uh, their national objectives in various areas, including national security, the economy, technology, society, and more. However, some of these measures may violate the multilateral trade norms of the WTO, such as the subsidies agreement and the principles of most favored nation and national treatment. Certain measures included in the US IRA are, are good examples of these violations. Nonetheless, the world trade governance, particularly the multilateral trading system of the WTO, is not effectively addressing these issues. As we all know, WTO dispute settlement system remains incomplete because there's no judges at the appellate body since the end of 2019, and appointing the appellate body judges has been unsuccessful. So even if a WTO member wins a dispute, through the panel investigation, the final legal result will be pending until the appellate body, which currently has no judges, uh, can make a ruling. Therefore, it would be meaningless to accuse any members for their violation of the WTO norms and principles for the time being. So we now find ourselves in a world where major nations are adopting various unilateral actions focusing on their domestic political agenda to achieve economic as well as non-economic uh, objectives. The negative consequences of these unilateral actions on the world trade will progressively escalate. If this trend uh, continues, world trade order will remain uh, fragmented, increasing uncertainty in the global trade environment. Under these circumstances, it will be practically impossible for the whole WTO members to discuss sensitive issues. However, doing nothing would not be a, a desirable option either. So we should note that the WTO, member, uh, WTO allows member states to take unilateral actions if fair and non-discriminatory implement, implementation of these actions is guaranteed. Considering all this, it would be crucial for countries with similar interests and positions to engage in uh, transparent and unbiased discussions on uh, various issues, including new commercial uh, rules, uh, and come up with uh, uh, agreements. Of course, these agreements should be open to non-participating countries that may wish to see it later. Many trade experts uh, consider uh, these so-called open plurilateral agreements as the second best option for addressing important issues at the WTO. So in conclusion, I would like to note that serious efforts from major uh, uh, trading nations are urgently needed to respond to this uh, crisis situation uh, in the world trade environment and mitigate uncertainties in the global trade environment. Thank you very much. This is all. Thank you, Tayo. And I think it's, it's real that we, as you said, you speak about the crisis environment. I think the fact that WTO is not active anymore, creates a vacuum, which we also see obviously in a kind of a multipolar world where mm -hmm. I think the clear institutions that used to steer that global economy are have been massively weakened. Yeah. Yes. So let me move to Jay. Uh, you're working with many, many corporates around the world, providing them 
geopolitical advice in every country of this world, almost. <laughs> About uh, 150. Uh, 150. Um, so what's your view on the current state of geopolitics and trade? Well, it's a, a privilege to be here, and I want to first say thank you very much to the organizers, both of our panel, but of course of the broader conference. Um, I'll attempt in, in my time to synthesize some of the conversations we're having with corporate leaders and investors that are very much engaged in, in trade, very much engaged in decisions around capital financial flows, and what uh, some of the things they're thinking about when it comes to the topics that we've been discussing here. These are traders, these are investors. So first and foremost, I would say, uh, taking your framework, Nicholas, of turbocharging risk management, they are seeking to uh, build a taxonomy to map the various risks that they face. And financial firms have done this uh, over the course of the last 25 years increasingly well, in part due to regulatory requirements that have been placed on them. Non-financial institutions are relatively new at this. And when they think about risk mapping, typically they think about operational risk, they think about tax-related risk, uh, they think about jurisdiction-related risk, they don't think about geopolitical risk. And so, as you say, uh, Nicholas, this is very new on the agenda. And so what we've been uh, encouraging our clients to do is to very much identify where they have uh, exposure in this respect. But that's not the only step you can take when it comes to, to risk. You have to prioritize your risks. You have to dimensionalize what you think might come to pass and what you need to focus on. And there are all kinds of ways you could dimensionalize risk. Obviously, whether it's going to um, come into your life, whether there's a likelihood or a probability of that risk occurring, and also what its impact will be. And in the upper right, you can start to then focus on what the things are that you should begin to work on. Um, you should definitely uh, build crisis management capabilities around those risks in the event that you have to deal with them. And this is to your point, Penny. Many companies may have something on the table, something on the shelf, but they don't actually do the work of testing themselves. And you mentioned this point also, Nicola, of really exercising their capabilities through simulations around specific scenarios. And finally, they have to be real with themselves to know where their gaps are to be able to build the capabilities that are required in the event these risks actually were to come to pass. So what risks are we talking about? From a geopolitical perspective, we really uh, break this down into three different categories. The three categories are country level or even sub-country level risk. The second is regional risk or regional flashpoints. And the third are some macro global trends that are very difficult to get your head around, but which are extremely important to plan for, especially if you're in the business of doing strategy. So businesses are probably best when it comes to geopolitical risk around country-level topics or sub-country-level topics. Why is that? Well, if you're a total, you're going into a, a country, you know you need to engage with the political leadership. You know you need to know about the political opposition. You know you need to know about the regulatory environment. You know you need to know about what policy changes might be coming down the line. You know you need to understand the stakeholder groups that could affect your position and your social license to operate. So I would say, historically, of all of the risks that might be identified, country-level risks are something that companies can do quite well through government relations capabilities, through communications capabilities, and uh, just as a matter of, of, of requirement for going into a new environment or maintaining relationships with local partners. Um, all of those factors I identified at the beginning, knowing your risks, prioritizing them, building crisis management capabilities, testing them. They all very much are important to do in the country level, but I would say many of our non-financial clients actually do this quite well, increasingly well, especially in fields like energy, fields like mining, fields like telecommunications, advanced industries such as semiconductors, renewables. These are all sectors where companies face real risk at the country level, but they identify it and they're working on it. 
the two additional types of geopolitical risk that are much more difficult to, to work on are the regional flashpoints and the kind of global longer term trends. There's been discussion over the course of our panel and previous panels, and I, I know over the course of the next couple of days around the major flashpoints uh, around the world today. But the three that our clients are most concerned about relate to the war in Ukraine, relate to instability and now open conflict in the Middle East, and relate to potential for uh, the worsening of relationships between not just the United States and China, but broadly speaking, the West and the emerging uh, relationships that China is building with uh, its closest partners. Each one of these has elements of instability, yet each one of these is very difficult to predict. And so you have to, as you're thinking about geopolitical risk around regional flashpoints or these types of um, uh, potential conflict scenarios, you have to bound your thinking around specific assumptions and around what will impact your business. And this is very difficult to do, and it requires, frankly, really uh, difficult conversations about what the business impact will be, not just for your company, but for your suppliers and your sub-suppliers and your partners and others that might be affected through second and third order impact of these situations uh, unraveling, unraveling further. And in the case of Ukraine, in the case of the Middle East, in the case of the relationships between the United States and G7, let's say, China and other countries working together with China, there is some degree of ambiguity, and that ambiguity needs to be identified and worked through. The third category, and I'll be brief, but I could spend lots of time on this category because it's incredibly interesting. It's around where is our world going? So if these flashpoints were to come to pass, or if they were to have specific types of impact on companies, what does this mean for the future of our world? And we really see five different um, macro trends happening as a result of the way our world is structured today. Some of which are very much aligned with what you talked about, uh, Nicholas, in your presentation, and some are maybe additive to what you were, were saying. But our first relates to domestic instability that's resulting from some of this geopolitical tension. And really questions around liberalism versus populism or liberalism versus a more autocratic type of, of government. How do you best... Uh, how do you best understand the demands of your population, changing nature of populations, especially youth populations, underrepresented populations, and how do you ensure that you have the means by which to address those issues and provide a, a, a valve for those to be, to be uh, vocalized? Many countries are facing difficulties around this, uh, not the least of which is our country, and Penny alluded to some of the, the, uh, the factors related to that. But there is a degree of nihilism among the, the youth population of the United States where they just want to burn the house down. There is a degree of uh, just lack of engagement where uh, in a participatory democracy, that's in fact very dangerous. And we see this as a growing trend throughout, especially the West and parts of East Asia. Second major uh, uh, macro trend is around the energy transition. And of course, you focus on this every day, Nicola. But there's so much discussion. If we're, as we're moving towards a green economy, how are we going to manage where we are, getting from where we are now to where we need to be? And what does that mean for our mix in terms of oil and gas? What does that mean for our mix in terms of renewables? How are we going to get access to critical minerals to fuel battery production, electric vehicle production, semiconductor production, and all the trade-related implications related to that, the protectionist instincts that are increasingly paramount. That's a macro trend. The third relates to the post-World War II uh, security order, which is increasingly being questioned, if not actively undermined. And this also relates to the economic security of the post-World War II order. Nicholas, you mentioned the, the Bretton Woods system, which of course now is also being called into question, not just by those who would be against it, but, that, but, but by those who would uh, ignore it, frankly. Not seek, to, not seek to engage in that respect. And the, the fifth, and we can talk about this maybe on the sidelines, but it's maybe on the minds of many people here, and that's the formation of, of blocks. This concept of, of, of blocks is, is still very much 
um, being developed. It's, it's, it's not well formed. But there are blocks ideologically, there are blocks in terms of interests, and there are blocks in terms of security and economic relationships. And um, a major macro uh, trend as far as we're concerned, that these blocks are being increasingly well-defined, they're increasingly being reified, and they're increasingly being used to define one group against another group. How you make sense of all this in terms of your risk management and your ability to scenario plan and your ability to understand how this could impact your business is incredibly important and something we spend a lot of time on with our clients. I'll stop there out of interest of time, but um, I, I hope that that's offered some food for thought. If you're out there uh, representing a business or if you're in government thinking about how you can better work with your, your business colleagues. Well, thank you, Jay. And I think the blocks refer back to this multipolar competition we have uh, discussed earlier. And I think I clearly see this development as well going and shaping also how corporations work. So we'll do a quick uh, Q&A here in the group before we open to the room. And maybe, Nicola, one question. We heard a lot about uh, scenario planning, about thinking about the future, about being prepared. And of course, you work in highly geopolitically shifting environment. So, I don't know, would you have a quick uh, view of two, three key learnings you have gathered by reacting to geopolitical shifts in the past? Well, I would say the first learning is that the risk generally materializes when you, or where you don't expect it. Um, you know, I think three years ago, I'm not sure, we had, for instance, large pandemics in our... And we're doing exactly what Jay described, you know, this uh, risk mapping uh, with likelihood, severity, etc. I don't think we had a major pandemic in our risk uh, mapping. Uh, I don't think we expected what happened in Russia. I'm not sure we expected what happened in uh, Israel and Gaza. So the risk materialized where we don't expect it. I think the second thing we learned for sure is that, you know, our... Our principle to limit the capital allocation in one country is a good principle. Uh, and we've learned it the hard way. Um, in Russia. And uh, I think the third uh, thing we've learned, uh, and certainly that we still need to improve, but you know, we are learning is, is the importance of communication and explaining what we are doing and why we are doing it. Very good, thank you. So, Benny, you alluded already to uh, Biden 2.0. Now I have to ask the question, uh, what's your view on trade if someone else's wins this election? <laughs> so, I think in general, what I would say is, is that um, where we are at the moment on trade, and I think it's a little like the climate change issue. I mean, the climate has changed, and the best we can do at this point on climate is to keep what we have today. If we stop, it's, it's almost impossible to go back to the climate all of us had as children. And I think the same is true on trade. I look at the trade environment, both with Biden and with um, potential Trump, as uh, what we have today may be uh, the best we can hope for, uh, particularly for those that are adherents to more traditional trade uh, and trade instruments. Um, I think both may look at a second term as uh, opportunities to continue on the trajectories they've been on. Uh, Trump has already talked about a 10%, potentially 35% flat tariff, depending on whether you're with a free trade uh, partner or not. Um, Biden has talked about several other things, I think, and having talked to the two individuals being rumored by both to be the USTR and a second administration for both. I, I think that it's uh, where we are today and where we may be um, is something we need to watch. If I could, one thing I wanted to just follow up on super quickly is um, I think one thing that's really important coming out of the conversation that we've had is how important transparency has become yeah. in companies. And maybe digitalization will help with this, but going to the risk point, I think that many people are aware of, but your carbon footprint, the human rights of your supply chain, um, 
and, and a lot of other issues, um, transparency around your, your operations has become incredibly important and is incredibly hard to do. So that's something that digitalization may provide some opportunities for in the future, but I see that as something companies will continually need to plan for moving forward. Great, thank you very much, Penny. So we have another five minutes and like to open uh, to the audience for Q and A's. Uh, we have here a very diverse panel. We have one question here. Maybe we can get a mic to the lady. Thank you for your very exciting panel. My name is Marie Roger Biloa. And uh, I have a question especially for Professor Lang, but any of you can answer. You mentioned the, um, uh, the multipolar world, and uh, as we know, the BRICS had their geopolitical moment uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and they account for that what we say we hear, 40% of the world GDP. So, um, do you consider the BRICS and the new doors they have been opening like a common currency and, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, a new uh, world financial architecture, all these things, do you consider that a threat or this is a very positive development for trade? Uh, and the second question is, what could become a danger coming from the BRICS? Thank you. So, yeah, um, I'll take another two questions and then we uh, try to answer. There's a second question here, third one here, and then we'll try yes, to answer. A question to uh, the managing director of Total. Uh, how do you anticipate the decline of oil consumption because of electric engines and because of a green economy? And how will it affect the oil prices? Okay, thank you. That's the second question. Nicolas, there was a third question, and then we'll start answering. Just trying to manage time. Can we have the mic in the middle for the gentleman? Yes. Thank you very much for this exciting pa panel. I'm speaking from the viewpoint of a uh, former and current member of uh, um, several boards of uh, large multinational companies. And I wanted to uh, um, ask you whether we, you shared this observation that I'm going to make and react uh, on it. Probably one of the most striking things when it comes to uh, strategic risks in the very past years has been the realization by very large multinational companies that uh, they were not um, uh, global companies opening, uh, working globally and freely, but they were belonging to a nationality. They, uh, all Western companies suddenly had to uh, give up their activities in Russia, for instance, and they realized that they have to uh, abide to a certain camp. Of course, they are making the same assessment with China mm -hmm. and other areas of threat, and they are taking, uh, they are taking consequences out of the situation in reshaping supply chains, the way they work, and making themselves more immune to those political risks, okay. as you have advised. Now, are they not, by doing that, sort of creating a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy and paving the way for possible increase of the likelihood of conflicts by reducing, in the very concrete way, through the way they operate, the increasing the possibilities of a conflict? Okay, thank you very much. So we'll try to answer every question in one minute to keep time. So Nicola, do you want to take the question on uh, energy transition and yeah. oil production? Yes, yeah, well, the, de the decline in, uh, in oil consumption, we, we don't have a crystal ball on uh, total energy, but we, we expect, you know, the oil uh, demand to reach its peak during this current decade. And then to decline, uh, and to decline to a level, you know, to, to, be, to be net zero uh, by 2050, uh, uh, the oil uh, demand, uh, you know, could be, let's say, 20, 25% of what it is today. There will still be an oil demand because, you know, there are some products that you cannot substitute, actually, yeah? particularly for petrochemicals. But then, hence, you know, the need for 
compensation of this residual demand. The big uncertainty is on the pace of the decline, uh, on how fast it's going to be. And regarding the question on oil price impact of all this, uh, what's important to, to have in mind is that uh, an oil field is not producing flat over time. So there is a natural decline of the production, which is 4 to 5% per year. So it means that if you stop investing in new oil projects in 10 years from now, the production will have decreased by 40%. Uh, so basically, the price, the oil price, but in order to keep it under control or at an acceptable level, and it's a question of affordability of energy, companies need to continue investing in new development to offset the decline, or at least to offset the decline partly, you know, uh, when, when, when the demand is, uh, is, is decreasing. Uh, voilà, I hope it addresses the question. Very good. Thank you. But there was a question about by reshaping supply chains, are we, inc and by segregating supply chain, are we increasing the risk of a conflict? Penny, 30 seconds, Tyro, 30 seconds. What's your view? Uh, so I think the question was also about nationalism and yeah. uh, U.S. companies reacting, you know, quickly on the Russia situation by pulling out. I think, in short, I would say yes. When I read Jake Sullivan's foreign affairs piece, uh, there's things in there. They don't mention the word trade, but there's other things in there that, to me, look like uh, companies are becoming part of the industrial national security strategy of the United States in a way that. I think limits freedoms in some ways, and I do think it's something companies need to look at uh, very, very carefully. Thank you, Theo. Joe's well, comment. Uh, the companies are very quick in responding to this kind of restrictions, and uh, many Korean companies are investing uh, to have a, a stable supply chain into a resource-rich countries like mm -hmm. Canada, Australia. There are lots of investment is being made by Korean companies mm -hmm. to. Know, to establish supply, uh, stable supply chain of critical minerals or raw materials. And, and di diversifying. Jay, before I answer on, answer on BRICS, what's, what's your view yeah, on BRICS? Yeah, I would just say there are a couple of additional factors uh, to watch out for. One is the uh, incredible upwelling of interest among stakeholders that were very vocal in the case of uh, the, the Russia pullout. Um, putting a lot of pressure on boards, a lot of pressure on executive teams through various means, direct engagement, social media, and through politicians. And, uh, and this, was, this was facilitated in part by uh, active tracking by uh, many organizations that were looking at how uh, compliant individual companies were with the spirit of the need to, uh, to, to move out of, out of Russia. And in the case of China, um, one can easily imagine something similar happening depending on what the scenario is that we're talking about. The other piece is the sanctions regime that was put in place not just by the, by the United States, but also by the European Union, by the United Kingdom and, and others, um, was sufficiently uh, broadly defined so as to encourage a conservative approach on the part of individual companies so that they could ensure they didn't run afoul of, uh, of sanctions compliance. And um, we can see that although that makes it much more difficult to, uh, to, to control if you're the, the sanctioning uh, government, from a company perspective, it makes you um, want to listen to your lawyers who are telling, who are telling you, uh, don't, don't incur any risk when it comes to sanctions. Do the thing that's easiest. And in many cases, it was just to leave the market. Yep. Uh, obviously, in the case of China, it will be a much more difficult conversation. Uh, given how embedded supply chains are, market considerations are, but it's definitely on the minds of corporate leaders. Good, thank you very much. And I think on BRICS, the over, um, our view is that there is a very positive potential in bringing that together. I think if you look uh, both from a trade perspective, from a financial perspective, from an energy perspective, I think BRICS has hugely kind of almost doubled its energy base by the expansion that was decided uh, this year. Uh, and so from our perspective, I think it has much more to win than to be in any case a danger. So yeah, we had had a fast paced discussion here on global trade. Penny, you said it's a force for good. I think we still believe in that. I would like to thank my panelists for this very broad perspective, for you, for your engagement, and I look further to very interesting discussions over the next few days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it is a great ple pleasure and privilege to be back at the World uh, Policy Conference. And I can tell you, usually a moderator comes on stage and says, welcome to a very timely session. But I can tell you, this time, it is really heartfelt uh, because the session, of course, is titled Climate Change, Is There Still a Collective will and i couldn't have asked for two better individuals uh, to guide us through this uh, very timely indeed conversation a few weeks before cop 28 right here in this very country to my immediate left of course somebody who needs very little introduction in this part of the world and increasingly beyond nonetheless i will give one anyway she is of course the uae minister of climate change and environment. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mariam al Heri. And I'm equally delighted because when we talk about COP, obviously COP28 is the one we're all very excited about, but there was one COP, COP21 in particular, in Paris that set the standard very high for all the following ones, the Paris Climate Agreement, obviously being the main result of this. We have the president of the COP21 with us. He's currently the president of the French Constitutional Council and needless to say, a former French prime minister. Please welcome Laurent Fabius. Madam Minister, let's dive right into it. First of all, thank you for making time. I, I know your schedule must be super busy. We're only a few weeks uh, until COP28 gets underway in Dubai. And uh, you will be hosting the world, you just told me backstage, more than 100 heads of state, including the Pope, have co confirmed their attendance. So the, the eyes of the world will be on you. And uh, you're also, aside from being the Minister of Climate Change and Environment, you'll also be leading the UAE delegation for COP. Give us a glimpse here, and we have the privilege of having you, so obviously I cannot pass up the opportunity of asking, how are the preparations coming along? Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you for having me, and let me first say what a pleasure it is to share the stage with uh, Laurent, and thank you so much for your time here today. I know you've had some great sessions. It is 27 days until COP28 starts, and you can imagine us as a country, we're extremely excited to welcome the world, uh, and uh, the time is so critical to have all countries convene in a place that is serious and committed on the climate journey. Um, the UAE has a great track record when you look at where we are on the uh, energy transition. Uh, as you know, we house uh, three of the largest solar parks. We're just embarking on wind energy. We've got also the nuclear power plant. We've really diversified, and today more than 70% of our GDP is non-oil based. So we have a track record, uh, the geography of the UAE, and also um, our bridge building abilities with so many countries makes us really the ideal place to convene the world to talk about climate action. And as you know, we're off track. We all know that. Uh, the first global stock take will happen at COP28. This is a huge endeavor to let us know what are the gaps, how do we have to course correct. I think it's really important that everyone realizes this is the time we need to unite. This is the time when we need to look at solutions and upscaling the solutions really quickly. And uh, for us, the solutions-based unification of the world to combat climate change uh, is so critical. And that's why we're actually extremely excited. Um, preparations are underway, Ali. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can always uh, look at what else needs to, to be done, but from our experiences in the other COPs, uh, from looking at what we want to achieve in this COP, I think we're well underway. And of and course, the, the we will. Country. Yes, for certain. And of course, we will talk more about your aspirations and expectations and the many sticking issues that will have to be addressed once COP gets under underway. But but you could not have been more blunt in the past and in present, saying the house is on fire. And uh, 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 Mr. President, that is of course something that uh, the, uh, unites us all. The collective will, at least on paper, the house is on fire. We do want to get it ex extinguished. Now, you, of course, have been the president of COP21, uh, and you have been part of every single COP since then. 
give us a glimpse. Uh, how has the tra trajectory changed throughout the years? What have been the biggest, most significant, and most notable differences uh, from COP to COP? Uh, thank you, and good morning to everybody. Um, what are the differences between uh, Paris in 2015 and Emirates today? Um, there are some differences. Uh, in Paris, um, the objective was to have a conjunction between three different planets. And today it's true, but the planets have evolved in a different way. What do I mean? The first planet is a scientific planet. It was very important in Paris that science, IPCC and all that stuff uh, be uh, more understood by the general public. Uh, it was done, and since Paris, I think science and technology have improved very much. And I, therefore, I have no doubt about this scientific planet. Okay. The second planet is much more difficult. It's civil society. Uh, as far as general public is concerned, there is a greater awareness of the climate problem, okay? As far as the cities are concerned, the NGOs, uh, many companies, there have been improvements. Though, and we shall probably discuss that, there are some groups uh, which are still resisting. But the main uh, difference is about governments. Uh, in Paris in 2015, uh, we were lucky to have an international setting which was positive. In particular, a sort of alliance between US and China and diplomacy was such that we were able to get everybody together. Today, obviously, it's a different story and it will be one of the main difficulties. Uh, and meanwhile, another difference which is very important is that uh, the situation of climate uh, is worse than it was before. Because we know that compared to Paris, in Paris there are different commitments, but the main one was about the 1.5 degrees. And honestly, we are off track. And therefore, uh, there are similarities with Paris and there are differences. But my guess is that anyway, uh, the Emirates Cup uh, COP28 is a decisive one because we are in danger and we hope that uh, this COP will be, uh, will be uh, helpful and a success. Yeah, the situation has, in many ways, has worsened, as you have yeah. pointed out. The, the uh, imminency and uh, the dangers of climate change are becoming much more noticeable, Madam Minister. That's why you have repeatedly said we have to walk the talk, we have to raise the ambition, we have to step up the efforts. And, and you're leading by good example. You've put forth a plan in the UAE that cuts emissions by 40 percent by 2030 and become net zero by 2050. Now, you're, of course, one of the biggest oil and gas producing countries attempting to lead the energy transition here. That's quite ambitious indeed. So I just want to give you all a story. I know you've heard a lot of speeches, but I just want to share something with you. I was in Iceland two weeks ago. And what I saw there, and of course, being close to the glaciers, um, what is climate change about? It's because the ice is melting. And because the ice is melting, you're having this whole ripple effect that's happening. So when you want to explain to a child what is climate change, it's about we've disrespected nature too long. We're seeing the glaciers melting. And by the way, they told me a fact which really scared me, actually. If a quarter of the Greenland ice masses melt, this leads to a two-meter sea level rise across the globe. This is huge. And you actually hear the ice melting the whole time. It's consistently melting. You see the ice breaking and falling into the water. So actually seeing these things with my own eyes was a was a huge eye-opener. Now, 
when it comes to us here in the UAE, we've been very serious about the whole climate change journey. I mean, we ratified the Paris Agreement in 2016. We were one of the first in the region to do so because we understood the implications. We understood this is a serious uh, um, subject that we have to follow. So we directly set up, also Mazdar was set up in 2006 because already our leadership said we need to diversify from where we get our energy. We need to build the knowledge because, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just about putting money into making a facility. You need the intellectual transition as well. You need the capacity building. That's why we're always talking about a just energy transition. And by the way, COP28 is going to try to solve four things. First of all, it's about the just energy transition. And because ourselves as a country are going through we are going through this transition. We understand we need political will, we need money, we need to build up the national capacity, we need to diversify. We know from experience what it means when we talk about a just energy transition. And everyone needs to do it in their own ways because every country is different, is at a different level, has accessibility to certain uh, financial uh, funds or no funds, so it's really complicated. The second thing we'll be looking after is fixing climate finance. That's a huge deal. That's kind of the enabler in everything we're trying to do. And of course, His Excellency Sultan, the COP28 president designate, is really pushing for the $100 billion commitment. The uh, uh, loss and damage fund is another area that needs to be fixed. The whole financial institutions needs to be re-looked at so that money can be accessible, available, and affordable, and needs to go to the places it needs to go to. The other aspect we're looking at is making sure that nature, people, livelihoods is in the center of COP28. It's so important to think of the food systems, to think of health, uh, to think of nature, make nature our ally. How can we use the, the force of nature to our benefit? And we need to do that. And then, of course, the inclusivity. We are trying to make the COP28 the most inclusive COP ever done. And what I mean by this is the indigenous people, the women, the youth, uh, faith-based organizations all coming together because what they, f they have in common is about we need to do more to respect nature and bringing them all together and making sure that all voices from across the world are here is our commitment. What's so important, Ali, I'm so sorry because I'm very passionate about this, is that we need to bring hope back to this whole process. We need to enlighten the young people because this is about their future. We need to showcase solutions and technologies and innovations, which I've seen, to be able to scale that up in the places that's needed and make sure the funding goes there. So the UAE, walking the talk, yes, we have updated for the third time our second NDC to 40%. Last year we were at 31%. And look, we were just, and we were improved it by 9% in one year. And this is to show, because we can see technologies are maturing. And again, we are very lucky that we have the political will. So for us, we are on the transition in our own country, but we're making sure to also help others. That's why in Africa Climate Week, we have um, uh, put forward a $4.5 billion fund to help the African countries in their transition because we understand how important funding is for this transition. Hope is, of course, the word you have, that you have mentioned that everybody wants to rally around. We have many young people also here uh, in the audience who I'm sure would very much uh, like the sound of, of your message. I will come back to you a little bit more about the ambitions that your country has, but I want to bring in Laurent, uh, Mr. President, here once more, because hope is one thing, but if we're looking at the naked numbers, energy still accounts for two-thirds of total greenhouse Gas. So the energy sector is still the central player in the efforts to reduce emissions and combat climate change. Now, it is very admirable to hear uh, Madam Minister talk about trying to wean itself off uh, fossil fuel in the long run, more diversification, more renewable energies. Uh, but are we really at a point right now where we can completely phase out fossil fuels. Uh, many people say, and Madam Minister, I, you're one of them who say that oil, gas and coal still have a role to play. So 
the, the balance that we're trying to do here, the, the movement towards renewables while at the same time still being de dependent on fossil fuels, how do we uh, narrow that gap? It's, it's obviously one of the main difficulties of uh, this COP and of all the COPs. Uh, now, all of us, we read a lot of reports uh, and um, the main thing is uh, what is serious, what is not serious. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I take my positions uh, stemming on three elements. A, uh, the work of IPCC, because they are serious, they agree, there is a consensus, and when they write something, it's serious, IPCC. B, uh, International Energy Agency. They are very serious, and what they say, it's not nonsense. And see more generally what uh, the Secretary General of UN, uh, Mr. Guterres, says, because he's well informed, he's a reasonable man. And if, with my own judgment, I uh, am uh, stemming on these elements, I think if we want uh, Emirates Cup to be a success, we have three main objectives. I don't mean that they are easy, but it will be the success. The first one is about what we call global stock take. It's a bit technical, but it means that in Paris we have decided that periodically uh, every single country has to deliver what we call a national determined contribution, saying, I will do that, and then it is checked. And this time, uh, in Emirates, we have to see where we are, and we know that we'll be, we shall be off track, and where the different nations want to be in the future. The, fir the first element which will be decisive is how about this global stake take. The second one is uh, obviously uh, about uh, energy. Uh, the idea is developed that there must be a real commitment at least to triple the renewable. And there are a lot of discussion about phasing down or phasing out of uh, fossil fuels. I will add, which is very important, the question of methane, CH4, which is less popular than CO2, but which is a decisive element and where we can get enormous results probably something like a diminishing of 75% till uh, 2030. And then, obviously, the question of finance, which will be decided. What you said, Mariam, is uh, absolutely true. We have to make operational the loss and damage fund. It was about the only result of uh, the 27 COP, and we have to make it real. We have to make real the objective of $100 billion a year from the rich country to developing countries. It has been promised in 2009, and it ought to be delivered in 2020, and we are in 2023. And, obviously, uh, the question of investing more in renewable and disinvesting in fossil fuel. Because uh, otherwise, uh, the objective of a better balance uh, has no sense. And then there is, but it will take time, uh, the general reform of the international financial system, and especially the direction of developing countries, and especially in the direction of Africa, because they are not responsible for the emissions, and uh, they have not enough money in order to get uh, the new, uh, the renewable, and so on and so forth. Therefore, if we are able, if we are able to reach these elements, uh, COP28 uh, will remain as important as uh, Paris COP. Stressing the need to balance the green transition with affordability and energy security inclusivity, you've already mentioned, uh, Madam uh, Minister, will be very high on the agenda of COP28. Uh, and uh, of course, the question is always switching off fossil fuels and solely depending on clean and renewable energy. Net zero by 2050 is what your country 
has uh, set out to do. We're in 2023. That's not too long from now. No, it's not too long. So we announced our strategic initiative, which is net zero by 2050. Uh, that was in 2021. Last year at Sharm el-Sheikh, we actually announced our pathway, so where we want to be every five years when it comes to emissions. That's already been set for the country. And now we're actually looking into the how, how we're going to reach it, what policies, which sectors need to be involved, what projects, where should the money go? All that is being discussed now heavily in the UAE. Yeah, I can imagine. It's a very intense discussion yes, and yes. one that uh, the world is uh, following. Already been said that energy accounts for two-thirds of total greenhouse gas, but many people might not know this. Global food supply actually accounts for nearly a third of global emissions and will be, from what I understand, a major focus of yeah. COP28 as well. I, I know you're very passionate about trying to create a sustainable agriculture that will be resilient to changes in climate. Uh, that's something that you will put at the forefront uh, in a few absolutely. weeks. Absolutely. So, as you rightly said, uh, food systems accounts for the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases emissions after the energy sector. Many people don't realize that. And that's why we need to fix our food systems, fix our agriculture, fix our behavior when it comes to food, fix the food loss and food waste problems. So much goes into it. And I was, before getting the position as Minister of Climate Change and Environment, where food security is also embedded in our ministry, I was the Minister of State for Food Security. And already in 2017-18, we embarked as a country. We have um, the national strategy for the country. We've invested heavily in technologies. In those days when I started, uh, we didn't have any ag tech companies. Now we have nearly 200 ag tech companies. So these are companies that basically recirculate the water in a closed environment and we're able to grow many high value foods in the desert. So I don't know if any of you have tried any of the blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, they are most probably grown here in the desert. And this is something we couldn't have uh, done without the power of innovation and technology. So companies now are seeing it's commercially viable to do that. Um, and this is the excitement of changing our food systems. And why I also mentioned behavior, it really comes down to us as people as well. How much food or edible food is going into the bin at the end of the day? Now, I've been a big advocate of food systems, and I promised everyone I would make sure that food systems has center stage at COP28. 20, and thankfully, supporting also the COP28 uh, presidency, I am the food lead, and uh, food will have center stage on the first day uh, of the uh, Leaders Summit. Um, and we're so excited because I've worked with many of you as partner countries, as experts on the food systems agenda. And there were two things that I was hearing from everyone. We need an agenda and we need political will. So the agenda I announced in July in Rome at the UN Food Systems Summit. What's the agenda? It's basically four pillars getting political will, getting non-state actors on board, scaling up finance into food systems, and focusing on innovations. Those are the main four pillars. And on pillar number one, political will, we have managed, as many partner countries, to put together a declaration. This declaration is called the Emirates Declaration for Resilient Food Systems, Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Action. I know it's long, but this is what the partners wanted. And it's been sent out to all the countries already a week ago to get endorsement. And I hope and I plan that at COP28, I will be able to announce many countries who have endorsed this, meaning that their countries have said yes. The political will is there. I'm going to make sure food systems is part of my NDC, which is what Laurent spoke about, the national determined contributions. My food systems, I'm going to make sure it's in our national biodiversity strategies. And I'm going to make sure my food systems is also part of our national adaptation programs. So this is what the declaration of, is about. It's a two-pager, and it's just building that political will that we need to transform food systems. I also just want to add something about the energy. You were talking about a switch. I often ask people, do you know how much energy you need to build a solar panel? Do you know how much energy you need to build a turbine for a wind turbine? It's so much energy. 
You cannot do that with the renewable energy you have today. So it's so important you use the energy systems of today to build the energy systems of tomorrow. And that's why trebling renewable energy, the UAE is on a pathway to treble its renewable energy by 2030, but other countries need help. They need technical help, they need financial help. So it's really important that at COP28, we all support each other to treble uh, renewable energy globally, but everyone has their own challenges, and that's why we need to step up, and that's why you've seen Mazdar is now in so many countries really stepping up uh, their knowledge, their financial means that they can put into this. Uh, but that part is so important, and that's why I always say this needs a just transition, because you need so much energy and power to build the future energy systems of tomorrow. And the importance, of course, of multilateralism in this regard and building synergies to align these responses to climate change, as you just pointed out, are very, very critical indeed. Uh, Mr. President, You've been the president of COP21. We have a head of a delegation of an upcoming COP, so a lot of expertise here uh, uh, amassed on this uh, stage. Clearly, COP serves a very important function. But there are a lot of people who also say, look, these are important gatherings, but at the end of the day, a lot of pledges are being made, pledges for actions, and then people leave, and there's no accountability, and there's no transparency afterwards. How can we track the steps and developments better in the aftermath of what is undoubtedly an important event. But where's the longevity here? Well, it's a big question. Uh, there are critics about carbs, and uh, we can share these critics because they are heavy and so on and so forth. But what else? What else? Do you know another opportunity to get together all the governments, uh, the companies, the NGOs, and to compel uh, the different states to take uh, commitments and to check if the commitments are fulfilled or not. We don't have right now a better system. And therefore, uh, the question uh, is still there, uh, how to be sure that the commitments will be fulfilled. It's a more general question. It doesn't apply only to climate. And the problem is that today, it's rather a philosophical uh, observation, uh, the main problems of humanity are international, interdisciplinary, and intergenerational. And we don't have a system of governments which is able to tackle these new elements, okay. But uh, I think what is necessary, first, during the COP, and it is the importance of the presidency, to gain the trust of the 200 states which will be there. Uh, you know, there is always a sort of fear by the different member states saying, well, probably uh, the president of the COP has the solution in its pocket and, okay, no, you have to build trust. And if you build trust, you can do very important things. I remember, for instance, that the famous figure of 1.5 degrees in Paris, at the beginning of the conference, nearly all the powerful states were against it. The science was for, but they were against because obviously it was a problem for them. But by the dynamics of the conference, by some particular speeches, by the discussions, and at the end, by the arbitration of the presidency, it was decided. And today we know that it is the objective. There is another point, which is the continuity of COPS. Uh, and from this viewpoint, I'm a bit concerned by the fact that it's not clear what will be COP29. Okay. Because, you know, it's a strange thing. The president of the COP becomes president of the COP in the second week of the COP. Well, it's a figment of our imagination. In fact, he is president of the COP since once year. But 
from the, the, the legal point of view, is president, he will be president of the COP during this COP. But what's next? If we don't have in, uh, in the COP29 a, a solid COP, and today we don't know who will be the country. We know that COP30 will be Brazil. And for different reasons, I think that Brazil will be very active. But if we have an excellent COP in Emirates, but a sort of hall in um, next year, we shall, I would say, lose or waste probably one year. Therefore, the continuity, the fact that uh, we must always uh, be in advance, move forward, but to ensure a continuity, it's absolute necessity. One other point. Uh, let's be careful about long term. It's surprising to say that. Uh, I remember a chat with uh, Mr. Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg, and he said to me two things, and I think he was right, and I very often think about that. He said, you know, uh, Mr. Fabius, there are two mistakes that you must avoid. A, to be too long-term, because in, in the long run we are all dead. If you say to people, okay, uh, that is the aim in 2060. Oh. Therefore, the question of climate is a race against time. We have to act urgently. And it's necessary to have a long-term view, but not too long-term. And the second one is, let's be careful about over-pessimism. We have enough pessimism right now. Uh, if you say to people, today it's difficult, tomorrow it will be more difficult, and I don't speak to you about, uh, okay, they will do nothing. Therefore, to keep, uh, while being honest, a, a, a feeling of hope and to, to act uh, urgently, it's absolute necessity. Yeah, the race against time, I think. Yes, uh, I will just add something to what Laurent said. Partnerships is so important here. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, the COPs are, of course, there's a huge negotiations team behind it. And they are sitting for hours until <laughs> past midnight, talking and talking and talking and looking you, at You have to word. get people tired. If they, if they are tired, it's okay. You see, you need to get people tired the same, until same they give in. Same system at the World <laughs> Policy Conference, by the way. But, yes. Yeah. Tired and good food. Yes, so I, I wanted to come to that. So, so what we've found that's been really good is to find something that partners are excited about and work together with the, part, uh, with the partners to make kind of platforms. So Aim for Climate, for example, the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate that we're spearheading with the US, for example. It's been up and running for two years. We have over 500 partners, $13 billion of committed investments, and they're all about looking at innovations in smart, climate-resilient agriculture. And this has been really, it's become a platform made for partners, by partners, and they, they choose their innovation sprints, they're calling it innovation sprints, the areas they want to work together in, they get money from, from outside, and they're, they're sprinting innovations. And this, I find, has been a powerful tool of how to accelerate things. And then, of course, hopefully, even after the COP, it just keeps moving. Another thing was the Mangrove Alliance for Climate. This is a platform for getting countries who understand the power of mangroves and restoring mangrove uh, forests. By the way, we don't have any forests in the UAE, but we do have mangrove forests. Um, these are basically our, our trees, and they are amazing swamps or sinks for uh, carbon. And seeing the power of that, plus the power by biodiversity, and they're beautiful to look at as well, we've managed uh, to create MAC. We've got 20 countries on board now. The latest uh, uh, newcomer was Germany. And this is about bringing countries together that want to champion certain things to accelerate quickly, because that's what we need right now. Coming to food. Again, food. At the COPs that I've been to, the last two, the food wasn't too good. And when you are doing meeting after meeting and the negotiators are negotiating and they don't have good food and they don't have good coffee, the result isn't good. 
So what I've done is I got, I said, this cop, I want to make it a little bit different when it comes to food. So what I did, Laurent doesn't know this, I invited all the suppliers, the restaurant, uh, let's say, kitchen staff, and we did a workshop called the Climate Conscious Catering Workshop for Cops. And we started this, there were more than 200 chefs, uh, restaurant owners, and we said, we want you to make sure that at COP28, we are serving 1.5 degree aligned food. And with that, we, we taught them, or let's say the experts taught them how to make a burger. The burger still can taste good, but now you're taking it with a climate conscious mind. You're looking more at where you can source locally, what kind of flavors you can bring into it, and believe me, the chefs had fun doing this. And then, of course, taking into account how can we reduce the waste, make it a no-waste cop. So all this, we started in a way a legacy, hopefully, that will continue to all cops, um, starting from COP28. So we may not have it perfect, but I tell you, I hope you can all look forward to the food because it will be very much low-carbon food, low-carbon snacks, and 1.5 degree aligned menus as well. So one thing is for certain that throughout these long and contentious discussions, no one will be, be hungry. That, no. that, that's for certain. So the lack of food will not be one of the reasons why things might fall apart, uh, uh, rest assured. Now, uh, being mindful of the time, of course, the session is uh, coming uh, to an end. And uh, if, if we're looking, at, we talked about credibility, we talked about hope, something that is extremely important, of course. The aspirations and expectations of COP28 that lie ahead of us. Now, interesting, it already is garnering momentum as we speak. There's real impetus at a pre-COP28 meeting where countries have come together to agree on a fund to help deal with efforts of climate change. So already uh, some positive steps leading up to this big event. Same question to both of you. What, in your opinion, what would constitute, what would you consider to be a successful outcome of COP28? Mr. President, yeah. we'll start with you. Uh, very practical things. A operationalized loss and damage fund. B, uh, to really achieve the $100 billion uh, a year. C, a commitment to renewable. D, a commitment to phasing out or phasing down fossil fuel. I would add a final comment. Let us not forget, from my own experience, that the climate problem is always a social problem. Uh, we know what are the answers. But if you propose answers to populations who are not in situation to make them efficient, doesn't make sense. If you say, okay, I raise taxes because I want uh, less um, classical vehicles, energy, and so on. Okay, but if people need them, and if you don't have the money to solve the problem, forget it. Therefore, it is always a social problem, which means it is always a financial problem. And all that we have talked about, which is very interesting, without a financial reform, it doesn't make sense. That, so, that, that is clear words. Now, the Paris Climate Agreement 2015 has raised the bar. Of course, it would be wonderful if post-COP28 we talk about Emirati Climate Agreement that people start referring to. But in all seriousness, uh, I know the ambitions are high. What are you aiming to get out of this? What is the goal? What would be success, in your opinion? So, on top of everything that Laurent said, because those are extremely important, uh, I will look a little bit more from the human side of things. Uh, first of all, to bring trust and hope back into the process. Um, we, for the first time, have brought in a youth climate champion into the process, and we hope this will continue onwards, and you will see a huge number of young people, not only just being part of a delegation, but these young people will be in the negotiations room because it's about their lives. Um, I hope to get commitments from more than 100 countries on the Emirates Declaration on Food Systems. Uh, I hope also this will be a great platform to show the world who we are 
as Emiratis, what our values are, what our journey has been, and how committed we are to this cause and that we are a credible partner in this. And of course, hopefully people will leave COP28 with a smile, feeling that they've had a great experience, that they've come out with an outcome to say, you know what, I'm proud to go home to my kids and tell them I've done something for your future. But I think we all need to step up because we don't have time to discuss and discuss and discuss. I think everyone needs to know that everyone has to give in a little bit so that we can get to where we need to be. We all know what we want at the end of the day. So we need to provide the best ecosystem for everyone to come and be able to convene and discuss. Um, but we also hope that with all the, um, the list of things that Laurent just mentioned, those are the main outcomes. And for me, it's about hope and positivity. Let's course correct where we are. We owe it to our kids. Hope and positivity, walk the talk, raise the ambition and step up the efforts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, to say that there's a global anticipation uh, for this upcoming event is certainly no overstatement. We're very much looking forward to COP28 and hopefully the results that it will produce. Climate change, ladies and gentlemen, is there still a collective will? I guess we will find out soon enough here in this very country, not too far from here in Dubai. I think uh, I speak for all when I say this has been an extremely insightful discussion and is uh, whetting the appetite, if you will, for things to come. UAE Minister of Climate Change and Environment, Mariam al Mary, and of course, the President of the French Constitutional Council, Laurent Fabius. Thank you so much. This is your applause. Much appreciated. Well, Uh, Mr. Kuleba, can you hear me? Yes, yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. First, sorry about this delay. I hope it was not too inconvenient for you. 
Thank you very much to be with us again this year. This is, we are close to the uh, second year of this war. And um, I would like to ask you the first question, how do you assess uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive? Uh, it is usually, as you know, not considered to be a great success. It is not a defeat either, but it is not a great success. I think it's important to have your assessment of the situation. Well, Ukraine's great successes on the battlefield uh, throughout the summer and autumn of 2022 raised the raised expectations that uh, every battle we will be fighting will be producing as impressive results as the counteroffensive in the east of Ukraine last year when we liberated um, Kharkiv region in, uh, uh, in an undoub undoubtedly impressive and striking uh, counteroffensive. Now, uh, this counteroffensive is, uh, is not as impressive as the previous one, and of course, expectations, uh, people feel uh, disappointed about it. But everything that has been achieved by our soldiers in this counteroffensive is an act of heroism. Because I cannot imagine another army in the world that would be able to break through the first lines of uh, the Russia of the defenses Russia built in the south uh, of Ukraine. This is very much very similar to the Second World War um, count, <clears throat> count operation uh, of uh, Allied operation in uh, on the Western Front. Um, the, there was the famous Siegfried Line built by Germany. Uh, Germ uh, Russia uh, built a very similar defensive lines. So it's not easy, um, but we still made uh, uh, good progress in the south. We, uh, pro we are approaching the city of Bakhmut in the east. And uh, we have to understand one thing. This is a war. And the war, it's not just one battle in a history book. It's a sequence of battles. And uh, we should not allow anyone to manipulate, to, to, to speculate that if one counteroffensive is less impressive than the other, then things uh, are going in the wrong direction. No, they are not. We are still uh, fighting and we are still uh, liberating our territory from Russian occupying forces. You uh, mentioned the Second World War. Doesn't it look more like the First World War? Or the end of the this is the perception. No, that's yeah, I, know the, that's I, know this, yeah. I know this debate and uh, it's interesting because uh, those who want to emphasize the point of the stalemate and certain impasse on the battlefield, they refer to the First World War and they compare current situation with the First World War. Those who want to emphasize temporary difficulties in uh, liberating territories, uh, and I belong to that camp very openly, um, they emphasize uh, the experience of the Second World War. So uh, I think it's rather more an intellectual debate and the point sides are trying to make. Because if, uh, you know, if I recall some of the op Allied operations in north of France, in the Netherlands, like the famous Market Garden operation, which was considered to be the, the, the counteroffensive uh, to end the Second World War and defeat Nazi Germany, it did not deliver. It was a failure, but uh, uh, still it was an important part of the overall um, fight against Nazi Germany. And in the end, um, Allied forces prevailed over Nazis. So, um, I really think it's part of the, I mean, this first, second world war comparison depends on the point, on a broader point you are trying to make about this war. That's uh, extremely interesting. But would you say the same uh, about the discussion, the question of whether it will be a very long war or not, you know? Uh, would you say that those who forecast 
that uh, it will be a long, uh, perhaps a very long war. Do you say that they are just uh, following uh, behind the Russian propaganda? Well, I think that there is no room for deadlines when it comes to the fight for territorial integrity and sovereignty of any country. And um, no one is, uh, you know, if you are attacked on the street, um, you are not setting yours and you, you clearly see that the attacker is trying, has the intention of killing you. You are not telling to yourself, I'm going to fight for five minutes. But if I see that I'm failing, that I cannot beat him off, I will simply give up. Right. This is this is simply not how we neither people, persons, nor states think. So uh, I want peace. Ukraine wants peace more than anyone else in the world, but um, not at the cost of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And just over the last night, uh, Ukraine was attacked with, I think, 36 Russian uh, drones and missiles. Um, they are undertaking uh, offensive operations in the east, in this, in the in the east of Ukraine, and this is not how you behave when you want peace. This is not how you behave when you want aggression, when you want to stop the war. So, um, to be honest with you, we are not making the timeline cal calculation. We are focused on. Uh, sorting out problems, uh, mobilizing support, ramping up production of uh, weapons, um, further increasing resilience of our economy. We will fight as long as it takes for Ukraine to win, because if Ukraine doesn't win, there will be no lasting peace. I'm, I'm in Berlin now, and I was reminded famous words by uh, Helmut Kohl who once said, the end of war does not necessarily mean peace. And this is, this is something that uh, people should always remember while considering different options about the end of the war in Ukraine. We need the end of the war that will bring peace and not another war, uh, another aggression by Russia. And this is why the basis of this peace should be the peace formula proposed by Ukraine based on international law and UN Charter. But uh, would you say that the willingness of the uh, armed forces in Ukraine and the willing death of the people, and those who are behind the front, would you say that their determination to continue to fight is as strong as it was a few months ago? Well, uh, army is part of the society. And so am I. This war will continue as long as the people of Ukraine are ready to endure all kinds of hardships related to the war. And when I look at the most recent polls uh, taken, uh, conducted, I think in October and September and October this year, I recall that 73% of Ukrainians said that they categorically reject any kind of territorial concessions Ukraine should make in this war. And uh, more than 50%, 50 percent, 50 something, I think 56 or 58 percent of Ukrainians said that they are ready to endure hardships um, as long as it takes for Ukraine. So these are the numbers. This is what people say. And uh, we are a democracy. You can find different opinions, and it's true that you know we. Uh, it's extreme. It's it's difficult to fight this war, but the vast majority of Ukrainians believe in victory, and they believe that we are on the right course, and therefore we keep fighting. Of course, you understand that all the questions I am asking are the questions that everybody is uh, asking uh, in uh, France, in Europe, in the US, and, and everywhere. This is why I put this question. So one of them is that uh, normally uh, presidential uh, elections are scheduled uh, next year in uh, Ukraine. And uh, do uh, you have, uh, what can you say uh, uh, about these elections? Will they take place or not? Is it still a question to be 
debated. I was thinking of, uh, you know, when the, the Turks uh, had this terrible earthquake uh, a few months ago, the question was, will uh, the elections uh, take place uh, in, in Turkey or not? So here, it's not an earthquake, it's worse than an earthquake, it's, it's a war. So what can we say uh, about that? We are a democracy. We went through many tests. Uh, sometimes uh, it seems that uh, uh, some friends are trying to turn Ukraine into the global laboratory of democratic tests. And I think there's no other country in the world that would be even considering holding elections against the background of such large scale um, invasion. Uh, but um, we are not closing this page. We, uh, the president of Ukraine is uh, considering and weigh, weighing different, uh, different uh, pros and cons. But it's not because he uh, he's unwilling to, to hold elections. Uh, it's because holding these elections under current circumstances will require an unprecedented effort and will require to address unprecedented challenges. And I can name a few of them. As foreign minister, I will be in charge of Ukrainians voting abroad. Now, if we estimate uh, that between five and eight million Ukrainians uh, are currently residing in foreign countries, with uh, some countries, uh, some countries host like one from one to two million Ukrainians, it simply means that uh, the whole country where they reside will have to be covered with um, polling stations. And many countries simply do not allow holding uh, foreign elections outside of the diplomatic missions of a country that is holding elections. How do I address this challenge? Um, if I go back to Ukraine, uh, how to conduct, how to ensure that polling stations will not become perfect targets for Russian missiles and drones? because people will go to vote. Everyone will know where polling station is. How will soldiers in the trenches vote? I do not mean the, cha the, the choice they're going to make. I mean, technically. Uh, and the more, very important point, how will people in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine vote? So, um, these are the challenges that need to be addressed. But I'm not saying no to the, to the idea of election, saying that this is something that needs to be addressed. And second, that uh, we are a democracy and we want to uh, develop, further develop as a strong democratic country. But we also ask uh, to understand the difficulties, uh, enormous difficulties that the country is, changing, is, is facing at this point. So uh, it's not only in Ukraine that uh, uh, major elections are supposed to take place uh, next year. Uh, the most important uh, country uh, for the world but is certainly the US. So are you worried uh, about uh, the uh, prospects of the uh, presidential elections in the US? Uh, the Republican, Republicans in particular seem to be more and more divided on the issue of supporting uh, Ukraine. Uh, even in the Democratic Party, it's not totally uh, uh, clear. So could you uh, tell us uh, a little bit uh, how you, what is your assessment of the, uh, if I may say so, the American risk? Well, to be honest, I, the only thing I really worry about is <clears throat> the, the health of my children, of my parents, and uh, everything else is just part of the job. Uh, after everything that has happened to Ukraine, I really don't worry about anything. If we, every time we face a greater challenge than the one that we faced yesterday, uh, we just have to double or triple our efforts to, to overcome it. Uh, we are a year uh, ahead of the U.S. elections, and frankly speaking, um, 
I understand the dynamics of the electoral campaign and uh, the closer we get to the elections, the more uh, tense the debate will be. That's clear. And we understand that Ukraine will be one of the issues at the center of the, uh, of the debate. But um, frankly, I think we will, you know, we will cross the bridge when we come to it. So at this point, we are focused on another, on another issue, which is uh, the decision by the Congress that need to be taken on allocating sufficient resources to support Ukraine throughout 2024. So this is something that we are working on. I think uh, starting early next year, we will be getting more focused on handling uh, uh, the uh, right positioning of Ukraine in light of the internal debate in the United States. States. The world is full of risks, but if you want to win, if you want to succeed, you have to accept it as a fact. And you don't. what, what you should not allow yourself to do is to be afraid of any kind of risks. That's uh, obviously a very good answer. Uh, what about the Europeans? Uh, in uh, December, the EU leaders are supposed to uh, decide whether to open uh, negotiations, uh, access negotiations to the uh, EU with Kiev. Uh, but uh, we have observed in the last few months uh, events that many of us would not have anticipated in Europe. The Poland uh, incident uh, about uh, corn, but they say that it, is, it was related to uh, the uh, election process. Now uh, the results of the elections in Poland, of course, are recomforting, uh, but uh, there are some uh, difficulties in Hungary. Uh, the result, the elections in Slovakia were also probably disappointing. So, uh, do you think uh, that uh, the uh, EU, the Europeans, uh, are a reliable partner for Ukraine? Uh, yes, because uh, we are all Europeans and uh, EU uh, realizes that its security and prosperity depends on what is happening in Ukraine and on the outcome of uh, the war in Ukraine and on the future membership of Ukraine in the EU. Uh, of course, we all feel uh, tempted to uh, judge books by, by their covers, right? Uh, and politic in politics, the statements, the headlines that we see in the, in the, in the papers coming from different political forces, uh, they next year a lot of uh, emotional discussions and emotional reactions. But uh, we have to judge these countries by the decisions they make. And as long as we see the decisions related to Ukraine's accession to the EU, decisions um, related to the continuation of macrofinancial support of Ukraine, decisions uh, related to the provision of military support and imposing of sanctions against Russia are taken, we, everything else is politics. And we can, we can find uh, the, the way to steer through these debates and political agendas that countries are having. Um, therefore, and we will, have, we will have a couple of these decisions by the end of the year to be adopted by the European Union. And we will see how countries, uh, how some members will uh, handle these situations. Uh, as of now, I th we, are, we are working very diligently, carefully, and with full respect to domestic political situations in, a number, in some European countries to make these decisions happen. And um, I, I think, more broadly speaking, uh, the role of the European Union in supporting Ukraine in this war is underestimated and we should speak more about the unprecedented decisions that the European Union has made since last since last February uh, to uh, defend Europe uh, because by by helping Ukraine EU helps to defend whole Europe and we should we should be more out we, we, we all should be more outspoken about that. Of course, this uh, issue is related to the NATO 
uh, issue. Uh, is it, uh, from your viewpoint, is it conceivable that uh, Ukraine becomes a member of NATO while the war is still going on? Well, NATO membership cannot stop this war, but NATO membership for Ukraine will prevent further wars. So in this sense, there is no alternative to Ukraine's membership in NATO. Uh, the message that was sent uh, to the world and to Ukraine at the NATO Vilnius summit was very clear. Uh, Ukraine, Ukraine will become a member of NATO when security um, conditions allow. So um, a country uh, will, in an active phase of the conflict, of, the, of an armed conflict, of course, cannot be integrated into NATO. Uh, but um, as long as NATO is keeping the door open, as long as we see that NATO is not just keeping the door open, but also makes specific effort to increase interoperability and bring Ukraine closer, um, that will be a pro, pro, uh, process moving in the right direction. Now, uh, so far, we have spoken uh, as if our meeting had taken place before the 7th of October. But on the 7th of October, something happened which maybe changed the whole game. Uh, since the Hamas uh, aggression in Israel on the 7th of October, uh, in the West in particular, one hardly speaks of what is going on in Ukraine, uh, as if uh, the, uh, the, the war had disappeared from the uh, front pages of the, of the newspapers. So, uh, are you, uh, wh how, what is your assessment of the impact of the Middle East uh, war, uh, which has started and which also probably will be quite long? Uh, what is your assessment of its uh, consequences on the uh, Ukraine war? Well, we did disappear from the front pages, but we did not disappear from the radars of uh, world politics. And uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty clear to me, uh, because we are in constant communication with our partners in the United States and in Europe and other parts of the world. So uh, these are two different, two different kind of uh, areas and they have to be, uh, they have to be, this, this has to be taken uh, into account. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but uh, the longer the war in the Middle East lasts, the less front pages it will uh, occupy as well, because this is the law of the world. People get used to it. People get used to wars, to disasters, uh, we even pandemics uh, as, as humanity. So <clears throat> uh, what brings you back to the, to the front page is either is something big, uh, something uh, that uh, runs out of, um, that goes beyond people's, you know, people's routine perception of the conflict. For example, you know, every day, all every day, Ukraine is being attacked massively with, Ukra with Russian drones and missiles. Uh, the fact that this massive destruction and killing is not making to the front pages of the world is not our problem. It's the problem of readers and viewers who are not interested in the topic anymore. But the war continues. And we are fighting it. But you, if you want to get back to the to the front page, you have to sec you have to secure a big victory, or you have to suffer a big loss. Then you make it back. Of course, we are working hard today to return to the front pages with a big uh, big victory. Uh, speaking about trends, um, of course, if the conflict in um, we currently do not see any decrease in the support that we are receiving from partners because of the war in the Middle East. 
But the challenge, of course, there will be a different challenge if the conflict in the Middle East spillovers and uh, uh, takes it to the next level of violence and involvement of other players. And this is the risk that uh, needs to be permanently kept uh, in mind while assessing the dynamics of the process. But the challenge uh, goes beyond that. It's also related to the so-called Global South. And uh, with the new war in the Middle East, uh, the uh, hostility, uh, to, use, uh, to use that word, of the Global South uh, against the West uh, involves both uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Israel. Uh, so uh, that might have, nobody knows exactly, but it might have a serious uh, impact on, uh, over the, the, the years. Uh, in, in a world, how do you see this uh, issue? Well, <laughs> I, um, I see that countries who spent many months seeking arguments to explain why they are not supporting openly Ukraine in its fight against the Russian aggression, are the loudest today in uh, accusing the West of double standards in the treatment of uh, Middle East, of the war in the Middle East and Ukraine. Because finally they, they, they tried to make the point, they finally they got, um, they, they, they believe they found an excuse to explain why they behaved one way and not another towards Ukraine. Um, I don't think, I don't have the impression that uh, the, the Global South is lost. We recently held a meeting of the peace formula, proposed uh, a coordination meeting of the countries who were taking part in the peace formula proposed by President Zelensky. It was held in Malta. And um, the, last, the previous time we held the meeting in Saudi Arabia two months ago, we had 44 participants. This time in Malta, against the raging war in the Middle East, we had 66. And we see that many of the newcomers are coming from beyond the West. Uh, we had Arab countries, we had African countries, we had South American countries. Um, and third, of course, there will always be speculations about, uh, I think the, the, the double standard, con stand the conversation about double standards is the most uh, famous discussion in world affairs and in diplomacy. So there will always be those who will try to um, uh, reinforce this thing and accuse Ukraine or the West of some of, of, mis, um, of uh, mistreating uh, the Middle East conflict. And Russia will be re is, re is and will be reinforcing these messages because it perfectly fits their narrative. But I think the picture is far more nuanced than just uh, black and white. You know, you lost, you gained. Um, it's far more nuanced and it's not as dramatic, as critical, uh, and the situation is not as critical as it may seem. Well, I hope that in a year from now we will have a third uh, meeting of this kind with you, and perhaps even before, if you have a chance to, to go to Paris, I would be extremely honored to welcome you at IFRI. But my last question will be, uh, is there, from your viewpoint, any chance to have some kind of negotiations with Russia starting before uh, we meet next time? You know, um, <clears throat> people who are asking this question and I know that you were just, as you, as you mentioned before, you were asking me this question because this, this is floating in, in the air in, in uh, some places in the world. But I encourage everyone who is talking about uh, negotiations to learn history. And you don't have to go too deep into history books. It's a very recent history. In between 2014, when Russia illegally annexed 
Crimea. And February 2022, when Russia launched its large-scale invasion against Ukraine, there were about 200 rounds of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia, mediated by Germany and France as part as participants of the Normandy format, um, supported by the United States in one way or another, almost 200 rounds. 20 ceasefires were officially announced in the same period of time, and all of them were violated by Russia. So the question to everyone entertaining the idea of how nice it would be to have negotiations should ask should first ask himself or herself what makes me believe that russia changed for the good since then that this russia can be trusted more than the one that uh treacherously launched of the war instead of seeking diplomatic solution that the country that violated all ceasefires it signed up for and once you answer this question in an honest way, there will be no questions about when will negotiations begin. And second, um, no one wants peace more than us, but we don't need a peace that will lead to another war. We need a peace that will be lasting. And when I see a daily morning report about the situation on the front line, I don't see the slightest indication that Russia is interested in peace, that Russia is seeking solutions. They're sending more weapons to more soldiers, more missiles, more drones. They want to fight. And sometimes we have to accept this is the reality. Sometimes there are moments in history when you have to defeat the evil on the battlefield before sitting down at the table and signing papers. This is the reality. And this is what Ukraine is doing. And instead of uh, uh, crying uh, for out for negotiations, I want everyone to focus on, on a different question. How can I help Ukraine to win on the battlefield and to put Ukraine in the best position to negotiate and to put an end to this war? When you change these optics, when you start asking yourself realistic questions, then this war will end rather sooner than later. Otherwise, it's just an empty, empty. There is this uh, word in, in Germany, uh, uh, lumpen, 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 lumpen peace or something like you know, misconception of peace or hypocritical understanding of what real peace is. So let's work towards real peace and not hypocritical uh, peace that will lead to another war. Well, Mr. Minister, thank you very much. That time is up. I would like to thank you again uh, for uh, everything you told us. I, uh, you know that uh, all of us... Uh, in uh, Europe and beyond uh, admire the extraordinary resistance of uh, your people and the way uh, Ukraine fight to become a long-lasting nation. So um, again, we admire you and uh, I wish you personally and uh, your country uh, all the best. And uh, thank you to have uh, uh, taken uh, a moment of your precious time for this uh, discussion with us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you.
Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. We will start uh, our seventh plenary session on reconfiguration of international system, short and long term perspectives in Eurasian region. I have something to confess. We have worked hard on this session to have five countries represented on this session, included all three South Caucasus states. But for various reasons, it would, would, was not uh, unfortunately possible. But we have two best speakers with us. Our now very good friend, Roman Vesilenko, he was with us uh, last year. And our new guest, Vahan Kostanyan, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Armenia. And you know, Mr. Kostarian, last year after our session, the first uh, question coming from our audience was about Nagorno-Karabakh. But unfortunately, we, 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 do, we did uh, we answer it <laughs> as we could. But uh, this year, uh, we have a real opportunity to know more about the situation today and the perspective from the first hands. But I would like to start uh, with the question about what we have just heard uh, by uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Kuleba. I would have your reaction to what Minister Kuleba said. How do you see the current situation in Ukraine on the ground, the current and coming risks? What if the West no longer has the will to support Ukraine because of Ukraine fatigue and the multiplication of tensions inside conflict and wars? outside included Middle East. What can be the end of the war uh, of, in Ukraine and what if Ukraine lose the war? The question is not the taboo now. What consequences, what impact on your country, on your region and on global balance? We will start with uh, Mr. Vasilenko, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan. Thank you very much. Uh, is it working? No. Not sure. No? It is working now. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here again. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Well, um, I had a friend uh, for many years, um, a journalist, and he uh, told me to never answer a question that begins with an what if. Because, um, I mean, speculating is, 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 is uh, an uh, ungratifying kind of job. But what I would like to say is that, of course, it is an extremely uh, sorrow and painful uh, thing to watch and to feel in your heart. It's a tragedy that is taking place, that continues to take place for more than a year and a half now. Uh, we, as Kazakhstan, a peace-loving country, a country that doesn't have problematic relations with any country, uh, we naturally want uh, the solution as soon as possible. We, we are prepared to help uh, to serve as a negotiating platform if uh, Russia and Ukraine would uh, want our services. We maintain relations uh, with both Russia and Ukraine, so we keep the bridges open, keep the doors open. Uh, we think the solution can be only found on the basis of the United Nations Charter and the respect for the fundamental principles of this Charter, including the respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states, including, uh, in this case, Ukraine. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe uh, to... Uh, first, we should understand uh, what happened and when it started. Uh, the very principle of use of force was violated. Uh, and it was not violated first time back uh, in 21 Feb 2021 February. The international community, we, the South Caucasus, witnessed the violation of this very principle yet uh, a year ago uh, before the war in Ukraine started in 2020 in our region in Nagorno-Karabakh. And unfortunately, back to that time, many of the international partners were silent and they were uh, both-sided, let's say, when it came to 
to the situation and not uh, putting clear and direct calls that the use of force is not acceptable. And this became a precedent. And if something is can be tolerated uh, in case of one country, probably the others can think or interpret the situation as a green light for them to act uh, in violation of UN Charter as well. Uh, nobody knows better the horror of a war than us. We witnessed it in back in 90s. We witnessed it in 2020. Mm. We are still witnessing the consequences of it, of the recent military aggression of September 19 to end, at the result of which Nagorno-Karabakh and 100,000 people were forced to the place and basically Nagorno-Karabakh is ethnically cleansed. But we do believe that at some point the world order uh, should be established in a way that the principles can be equally projected to everyone and everyone, everyone should ad adhere to these principles. And violation of principle without any geopolitical uh, calculations should be equally raised and should be equally rejected by international community. Okay, if I can continue with you, Mr. Kostanyan, the situation in South Caucasus changed dramatically in September. Nagorny Karabakh came under the control of Azerbaijan as a result of a military operation, and the unrecognized Nagorny Karabakh Republic declared its self dissolution by the end of the year. You said that uh, 100,000 of uh, Armenians were pushed to leave their homeland in dramatic conditions and move to Armenia, and some person from the leadership of Nagorny Karabakh were arrested and Russian peacekeepers as were deployed uh, in Karabakh and on the Armenian Azerbaijan border was uh, remained uh, helpless uh, as uh, international community. What's the situation today in Nagorny Karabakh? What's the future scenario? What are prospects uh, for a settlement? Is a peace agreement possible? Because Nikol Pashinyan said many times that uh, he hoped to have the peace settlement before the end of the year, and unfortunately it was not possible in Granada because uh, uh, the other uh, counterpart uh, didn't come to this, uh, to this meeting. Or there is another scenario of a further escalation, further aggression this time of uh, the sovereign territory of uh, Armenia, uh, especially around so-called Zangizur corridor uh, that uh, pass by uh, Sunik province. What for you uh, the, the future scenario, the most probable scenario? Thank you, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Armenia was and remains interested uh, in establishing good neighborly relations with our neighbors, not only with Azerbaijan, but also with Turkey with whom we have, with both of them, we don't have diplomatic relations, we have closed borders. And for a landlocked country as in Armenia, it is very difficult economically as well to have a situation that we are currently now. But, uh, and also taking into account the fact that the security, global security ar architecture and in particular European security architecture is deteriorated. We understand the very necessity to normalize the relations with our neighbors. We are not going to move anywhere from, our, from this region and we are going to have the same neighbors. So the political will of the government of Armenia and Prime Minister of uh, Armenia remains to normalize relations uh, with Azerbaijan. And we do believe that the principles which were indicated in the Granada statement 
uh, which are the following. It is uh, the full respect to sovereignty and territori uh, territorial integrity of both states, meaning Armenia and Azerbaijan, the clear understanding of a borderline that we have, uh, taking into account the Almaty Declaration, which was signed back in 1991, and according to which the administrative borders of former uh, Soviet republics become interstate borders. And uh, third, uh, this is to organize the opening of all communications in our region based on the respect of sovereignty and jurisdiction of the states which we are passing through and on the principles of equality and reciprocity. And in this regard, to somehow shape this idea on opening of the communications, Prime Minister just a few days ago uh, presented the vision that we have which is called uh, the Crossroads for Peace. Uh, the so-called Zangezur Corridor, which uh, that you are mentioning, uh, first, uh, I would kindly ask not to use the term because in its sense it contains in extraterritorial claims. I ask no, uh, no, that you, you don't use this term. Yeah. Uh, towards Republic of Armenia. And if... Uh, our neighbors are really sincere when they say that they don't have any extraterritorial claims when it comes to both uh, opening of communications. When we see that the peace, uh, crossroad of peace is a doable and realistic project which, is, uh, which can bring benefits to all uh, the states in our region on the one hand. On the other hand, the economic ties, the logistics ties can secure the lasting peace in our region. And coming to the issue of uh, people of Nagorno-Karabakh, as I already mentioned, we uh, had the forced displacement uh, of these people from their very homeland, where they were indigenous people living. And unfortunately, regardless of the calls uh, that Armenia was uh, raising and alarming the international community since December when the Lachin Corridor uh, closed, that this is a planned action of ethnic cleansing uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, international community and especially UN Security Council where, where four sessions were organized uh, didn't adequately react to the situation. And we have the fact of ethnic cleansing and probably everyone, each of us, had its share of guilt when it comes to the fortune of his people. Uh, but I do believe that uh, there is still a chance uh, that uh, all the rights of these people, including the right to return, can be addressed. Uh, but this means and this requires a bit more effort from international community because without a joint effort, uh, in general, the protection of rights and the protection of UN Charter is, is not possible. Thank you very much. Of course, it was the question for Armenia, but maybe uh, you can explain the official position of Kazakhstan on this yes. uh, war, on this conflict. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we uh, naturally uh, hope that uh, um, Armenia and Azerbaijan can advance in the uh, peace negotiations and that they can conclude the peace agreement uh, in good faith. Um, and I would pick up on something my colleague just said uh, about the unlocking of communications in the region. Uh, this will not only benefit Armenia, this will benefit uh, a much, much wider region, uh, meaning Central Asia and Europe, because, of course, we are eagerly 
all of us are now working on the development of the so-called middle corridor and of course the stability of South Caucasus, the unlocking of uh, communication lines in South Caucasus will benefit so many players um, and it's, it has so many, so much repercussions way beyond South Caucasus. So that's why we are praying, hoping for uh, the two parties to achieve uh, uh, a peace treaty settlement, of course, respecting territorial integrity of both states. Thank you very much. If, if, I, if I may. Okay. Um, if, I guess this is, uh, that was very important to touch on the issues of opening of the communications. And um, here, uh, Armenia wants to be understood by our colleagues that we are not an obstacle uh, for connecting Europe, and Central Asia, and Far Asia, and connecting north, uh, north to south, connecting uh, to GCC countries, for example. We are the ones who are interested in it. But to have uh, lasting, pragmatic, and realistic solutions, we need. Uh, we should adhere to these four principles which uh, I just um, mentioned. This is sovereignty, jurisdiction, equality, and reciprocity. And understand the saying all of this, we clearly understand that in order to be competitive uh, on logistic chains, we need to do simplifications. And we are ready to simplify uh, the processes in order to attract uh, more cargo, more vehicles, more people flow through uh, the sovereign territory of Armenia. And I do believe uh, that uh, all our partners, also Central Asian partners, should have their role uh, on uh, convincing or bringing to the idea that these are the principles uh, which can make the project really uh, attractive uh, and lasting. I, I wasn't in any way implying that Armenia stands in the way. I was saying that the peace agreement, peace treaty and the uh, generally, the establishment of the atmosphere of peace and cooperation will benefit not just yourselves, but us and Europe. And we believe that the opening of communication should be an important part of a uh, possible peace treaty with Azerbaijan. On the one hand. On the other hand, we are interested to open uh, the land border with Turkey mm -hmm. and to reestablish uh, also railway communication that we had during the Soviet period. Yeah, but in all respect of your sovereignty, of your territorial sure. integrity, of course. Uh, I will come back to Mr. Vasilenka. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, your uh, relations with your main partners, foreign partners, your neighbors. And Kazakhstan is a real master of the multi-vector policy. You managed to maintain an extraordinary balance between Russia, China, and the West. Vladimir Putin said the last time he celebrated his uh, last uh, birthday with President Takayev and President, Uzbek President Mirzoev. And at the same time, recently in Berlin, the Chancellor Scholz uh, and uh, President Macron, when he was in Astana, uh, these two uh, Western leaders praised Kazakhstan's effort to distance itself from Moscow by preventing sanctions from being circumvented. You managed to navigate uh, in troubled waters by avoiding obstacles, and uh, your captain is very experienced. How has the war in Ukraine at Nagorno-Karabakh over the past almost two years affected the relations of your country with your great neighbors, Russia, Turkey, China, the West? Are the foreign policy priorities of your country changing? How do we see, how do we would like to see the role of each partner involved in the medium and long term and the balance between these partners? Thank you. Well, uh, we realized ever so clearly um, in the past year and a half that the 
now famous Malta Vector Foreign Policy that you mentioned is actually the only foreign policy that we as a country can pursue, a country of 20 million people, a neighboring one country of 1.5 billion people, another country of 140 million people, and uh, a landlocked country, the largest landlocked country in the world. So you can only build positive, uh, mutually respectful relations with your neighbors and with, with others, and that's the only way forward. Um, in the past uh, year and a half, what we have seen is that um, uh, the West has uh, sort of uh, rediscovered with greater clarity the importance of Central Asia. Um, of course, the relations were developing in the 30 years of our independence, but it's sort of the, the blinds were taken off their eyes in, of policymakers in Brussels, uh, Paris, Berlin, London, Washington. And uh, this intensification of contacts, of political contacts, and the strengthening of these uh, diplomatic efforts on, the, uh, on behalf of the West is very much welcome um, by Kazakhstan, as again, this is uh, again part of the, of the general equation for our foreign policy, because uh, naturally we continue to strengthen, develop our cooperation with Russia, with whom we share the longest continuous land border in the world, 7,500 kilometers, and with China, our two largest neighbors. Generally, I think it's important to highlight that um, in our region, uh, perhaps three um, uh, themes, uh, three, dynamic, three dynamics are taking place. One is that uh, the challenges are really aggravating as far as security is concerned, and I mean primarily water security, water scarcity. Uh, that's a big, big challenge for Central Asia. Climate change is another one, and uh, we heard just now uh, from uh, the Emirati minister that uh, if um, uh, Greenland uh, melts, even one quarter of it, then uh, the water in the oceans will raise two, uh, by two meters. Well, in Central Asia already, this uh, climate change is twice as fast and as worse as globally. And it's already creating droughts, it's creating problems, etc. Then the, there are things such as a lack of um, uh, agreement between countries such as Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan over their borders. So, and then there is a challenges, uh, set of challenges emanating from an unstable situation in Afghanistan, uh, which, which we should always also not forget about. Um, so that's one trend. The second trend that we are seeing is the uh, growing desire by five Central Asian countries to work together. And you may have seen that we have now held five uh, meetings of the five leaders. Um, also, these Central Asia Plus formats have proliferated like mushrooms under, after the rain. Now there are 11 such platforms ranging from uh, uh, the one with the EU, to one with Germany, one with the United States, to one with Russia, China, etc. Um, but uh, um, the third, the third uh, challenge, the third dynamics that we see is this growing engagement by the outside partners. So it's not just the West, it's also Russia, it's also China, it's also Turkey uh, that really, really intensified their efforts to be present in Central Asia, to develop cooperation, to invest, to if you will, to pull uh, ourselves towards themselves. Frankly speaking, uh, we in Central Asia do not like this kind of uh, a, um, great game speak, a great game terminology again. Suffice it to mention that uh, a few days ago, Bloomberg published a story uh, headlined, Macron lands in Putin's backyard. It created such a backlash in our society uh, and people really are in arms against Bloomberg now, saying, look, um, uh, at least in all the reasons why Kazakhstan cannot be and should not be called uh, Putin's backyard or Xi Jinping's backyard for that matter, because this uh, denies the agency for the country, denies sovereignty, but it also blinds um, uh, the thinking uh, among the policymakers. So uh, we are in favor of great 
gain for all in Central Asia. Uh, we think that there is enough room for uh, the constructive engagement by all parties. And you should see how uh, dynamic these relations are developing with the West, with Russia, with China, with Turkey. By the way, the Turkish president, the Azeri president are in Astana today for the 10th anniversary summit of the Organization of Turkic States. So these all kind of formats are proliferating and uh, Central Asia, Kazakhstan including, are very much engaged uh, as uh, players in this game, if you will. Thank you very much. Armenia moves in uh, my sense more and more in the same way of diversification and multi-vector policy. For example, Armenia's military and uh, security relations have always been very close to Russia. The uh, um, 102nd Russian military base is located in Gumri. Uh, there are Russian arms sales. Uh, by the way, lastly, uh, Russia uh, didn't deliver it, uh, the weapon already paid for, if I understand properly. And Armenia's border with Iran and with Turkey are protected by Russian border service. At the same time, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan recently did some very strong declaration. He spoke uh, of the need to diversify security relations because Russia failed to fulfill its allied obligations during the escalation on the Armenian-Azerbaijan border. And uh, recently, the Armenian president said on France uh, to TV channels that the country needs a new military partner besides Russia. And France announced in October that it will supply arms to Armenia. So uh, what about your uh, diversification of the foreign policy to clo to, uh, um, more closer to, uh, to the West, uh, less closer to the Russia? What kind of balance are you seeking for? It's um, not about uh, getting closer to someone uh, in contradiction with our relations with our partners. But given the situation and given the facts that we went through during the past years, uh, we understood that uh, the need uh, of diversifying our relations and having security component in the relations with uh, our partners of ours is also very important. Um, unfortunately, uh, in 2022, September, when uh, Armenia's sovereign territory was attacked and was occupied, uh, Russia and uh, other CSTO partners of ours didn't have a, even a political will uh, to state that uh, we territorial integrity of Armenia was violated. Um, on, on the contrast, uh, European Union and EU member states came with uh, very strong uh, statements, but not only statements and also actions. The deployment uh, of European EU monitoring mission to Armenia-Azerbaijan interstate border and in the mandate of this mission was clearly mentioned that it's deployed to Armenia-Azerbaijan interstate border. Meaning that uh, there cannot be excuses that the border is not delimited, etc., etc., what we heard from our CSTO colleagues. Um, this was uh, uh, an example how we were trying to diversify uh, our security, or not to di diversify, but to recreate and rebuild a new security architect architecture for our country. Um, on the other hand, uh, you're correct, we are di diversifying the markets from where we are buying uh, weapons, which are for defensive uh, purpose only. And France is one of the partners, uh, India is another partner of ours. And um, we are determined uh, to cooperate in the sphere with 
other colleagues as well, uh, bearing in mind that we have a right uh, to protect our sovereignty and territorial integrity, and we don't have any intention to attack, attack any of our neighbors. Thank you very much. I have many questions, but I see uh, time is running. So I uh, prefer to take two very quick questions from our audience for two very quick answers. Please. Yes or no questions? <laughs> if you don't have questions, I have a, a lot of questions. I don't see uh, Andreas. Go ahead. Okay, because we have just three minutes and any questions, I would like to summarize briefly at the end of our session. Can you name, please, three major challenges for your country today on the national, regional, and global level? Who will to start? No, I can. Mr. Well, um, on the national level, it's as always ensuring uh, sustainable economic growth in the very challenging environment. Thankfully, we have uh, a positive growth, growth of 4%, something like this year, but uh, we are not complacent and we need to make sure that this economic growth is uh, spread and the benefits uh, benefit. Uh, as, ma as wide uh, the scope of the population as possible. Uh, on the regional level, I already mentioned several things, uh, but perhaps I should highlight that uh, the biggest challenge that we face on the regional, uh, the, the biggest opportunity, perhaps, uh, challenge slash opportunity, lies in the word connectivity. And mm. uh, this is the buzzword right now. We want uh, it to be developed we see this Belt and Road, Global Gateway, PGII by G7, all as complementary and uh, as benefiting not just our region, but all these outside players. On the global level, I think the biggest challenge is how to make sure that the United Nations system again works. Our president uh, addressed this issue in uh, numerous statements, including at uh, the United Nations General Assembly, stating that the uh, role of the General Assembly needs to be strengthened as the most representative body and the Security Council needs to be reformed. Uh, and the voice of the middle powers, of which Kazakhstan is one, should be strengthened. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kastanyan. I guess the challenges are pretty the same. Uh, for national level, mm -hmm. this is to continue the ambitious democratic reform agenda that we started in uh, 2018 after the Velvet Revolution and to uh, and these reforms will and are uh, supporting the economic growth of uh, my country. Uh, on the regional level, of course, this is the normalization of relations with uh, our neighbors and opening of uh, regional uh, communications. And uh, on international level, this is to make the international tools and mechanisms adequately working without any reluctance. Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, the geopolitic prevails and in that case some of the regions are under the shadow. And, um, the presence in this panel, in the audience, and is a clear uh, identification of another identification or, or example of this. Because uh, during the panel of very honorable Minister Kuleba, the audience was full. During the panel, this panel, when we are talking about the challenges in Central Asia and South Caucasus. And I do believe that these regions are not less important. Uh, what is the, clearly not the, the case? Uh, the hall is half empty, although it's half mm -hmm. full as well. And there were no questions. 
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are perfect uh, with our timing. And uh, I would like really to thank uh, Roman Vasilenko, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan, and Vahan Kastanyan, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Armenia. Thank you so much thank for you. this substantial conversation. Thank you.
Well, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to give you a little time to to come in. I'm Virginia Robert. Uh, I'm the foreign desk editor for Les Echos, the French business daily. And uh, we're going to talk about a very incredible electoral year coming ahead. I hear an echo. Is that normal? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, Quand probably normal. Pas bien. <laughs> Did you hear the echo too? Mm -hmm. No? The sound is very loud. Um, so to discuss this incredible year we have ahead of us, uh, I have with me um, Igor Jorgens, who's uh, from Russia. He's a man of insurance. He's been involved in the insurance industry for many years and several associations. And he's also involved in the Russian International Affairs Council. Next to him is Isabelle Lasser, who is a journalist just like me. Uh, she's the diplomatic correspondent for Le Figaro, the French newspaper, very well known. She's been a defense uh, correspondent, diplomatic correspondent, foreign correspondent, war reporter. So she's done it about all. And she just wrote us, um, um, a book about Putin and uh, Macron that is uh, going uh, very well. The book is. Maybe not the relationship, but the book is doing very well. And next to me is uh, Hiroyu Akita, who is a senior writer for Nikkei. He publishes commentaries and columns on foreign affairs and security affairs. And uh, he's worked uh, all over the place, in London, in Washington, in Beijing. He's been a foreign correspondent, so he knows uh, foreign affairs very well. And behind us, I see Monsieur Gruffa, who joined us uh, finally through a video link. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, he's a banker, and he, I met him in, in New York when he was working for Citi at the time, and he's involved in, in many, many uh, different projects. So before we, we start the panel, I'd like to share with you um, a study that came out yesterday, actually, and it's a study published by International Idea, and that's an intergovernmental um, group that is based in Sweden and that monitors the, um, the state of democracy. And the findings are really pretty appalling because it, show, it shows that in 2022, the world has entered the longest democratic recession ever observed, which means that for the sixth consecutive year, democratic values are losing ground everywhere. And I mean everywhere, I mean in Europe, I mean in the Americas, in India, in Russia. And declines have occurred in the very foundations of democracy, revealing weaknesses in the electoral processes, in the ability of legislators to act as checks on executive overreach, and also the difficulty for people to access the institutions of justice. You have countries, for instance, like Tunisia, Afghanistan, Belarus, Nicaragua, or Myanmar, that have shown great recessions, regressions last year. And this institutional weakness is compounded by continuing declines in core democratic rights, including freedom of expression, freedom of association, and, as and, and assembly, and sorry, and freedom of the press. And Europe, of course, is not immune, because according to the report, the rule of law has weakened, and it won't surprise many of you, but in Hungary and <laughs> Austria, where freedom of expression falters, access to justice is more difficult in the UK as well as in France, where the freedom to assembly is also fading. Poland last year had many factors deteriorating, and the recent elections won by the opposition might, might pave the way for a betterment. So it is not an overstatement to say that globally, democracy now faces pressure everywhere, with authoritarian regimes tightening their grip, and too many elected leaders adopting authoritarian tactics to cling to control. Meanwhile, you have misinformation campaigns, political polarization, and rising inequality that erode people's trust in democracy. So, as you probably agree with me, it is of paramount importance that democracy shows their resilience. Not all political regions are equal. And next year's elections will show indeed if the democratic process is able to rebound. So to start the discussion, we're going to start with Isabelle, who will give us a roundup of this election year, so we have a good grasp of what is happening. 44 countries are going to have either a new president or a new parliament. We also have elections in, in Europe. So it's, it's something that is quite extraordinary. Yes. Um, 2024 will be an incredible year 
regarding uh, the elections organized absolutely everywhere in India, the biggest democracy in, of the, of the, in South Africa, in Iran, Brazil, Nigeria, Taiwan, Russia, maybe in Ukraine, and of course um, in, in Europe with the European elections. So, my, and, and USA, of course. Uh, my question would be, I mean, my, I will try to understand if, it's, uh, if the, all this election will be a continuity or a breakup regarding the major geopolitical trends uh, we've seen these last years in, in the world. My guess is that it will be continuity. Um, I mean, uh, except the USA elections, most of the elections in the world um, will have, I mean, the results will have a very low impact on the geopolitical trends we are uh, viewing today. Uh, Russian election, it's, I mean, no suspense. Iran election, very few suspense. Belarusian, the same thing. Um, I mean, the majority of the autocratic regime will uh, organize themselves to win the election. Uh, coming to the democratic countries, even if um, the power, the BJP in India is challenged, there's a few chance that uh, geopolitical, that the foreign policy of India, which is based on the multi-alignment, will be changed. Um, even which is not, for example, which is not at the, at the moment the most uh, uh, probable. Even if in, in Taiwan the DPP loses the election, and if the opposition, which uh, uh, is um, asking for uh, an appeasement politics toward China, even if they win, and I could just come back from Taiwan three days ago, and it's not what is expected, you, you will not see from one day to another Taiwan just becoming uh, again in the, in the China uh, area. The, the important elections have already been organized in 2023. In Europe, it's Poland and Slovakia, which has changed their uh, political drive, and also uh, Turkey with the reconduction of Erdogan. Of course, you will tell me there's a big, an exception, and a big exception, which is uh, the, the American election. And the perspective is tr if Trump is reelected of uh, big consequences first, on the help to Ukraine, and second, on the future of NATO. But even that is not sure, because um, can we uh, really expect Donald Trump to um, sell off the future of the Western world by cutting from one day to another the help to Ukraine? I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, my point would be that even if Trump is reelected, is elected, um, is coming back next year in uh, Washington, it will, um, I mean, this election will be only an accelerator to the trends, the geopolitical trends which still exist. And these trends are not at all in favor of the Western world. If you liked 2023, you will definitely love 2024 because on the menu we have the generalization of the use of force, which uh, month after month is replacing the rule of law will have um, the continuing of the collapse of the, of the international order from 1945, and with it, the um, international inst institutions, which were a guarantee for peace, like UN, and also the disarmament uh, treaty, will also have new challenges to the Western world, the continuing of the decrease of democracies, 
um, and the um, um, augmentation of the of the autocracies uh, will have the um, cont continuation of the split of the world in two parts, not camp, but part or much more family. One is the South Global and the other is the uh, Global North. And whatever the election, the result of the election will be uh, in India, in South Africa, in, uh, in Russia, uh, even in the state system will, will continue and will be boosted. So for me, as a uh, Western journalist traveling all around, um, more than the elections, the determining influence on the geopolitical trends in 2024 will be um, who's going to win the war between Russia and Ukraine, and uh, secondly, what will be the consequences of the war between Israel and Hamas. And meanwhile, waiting um, for uh, next international order, international order with new rules that everybody will have to work on. Uh, the previous one will continue to collapse and we'll have a more crisis to come in this world which is becoming a jungle. One may be the crisis between Taiwan and China. Others could happen in the Balkans and of course in, uh, in Africa. I will end by a sentence of uh, Joe Biden. Yesterday he was having a conversation with the president of Chile and here's what he said. He said, in my view, um, there comes a time, maybe every six to eight generations, where the world changes in a very short time. Here we are and I think what happens in the two, three years are going to determine what the world looks like for the next five or six decades. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So a very defining moment, but not especially com coming from the elections, as you said, because the most important ones were this year, Poland, um, Slo Slovakia. Uh, Slovakia, of course. Um, nevertheless, there's the big one next year that everybody's looking at, and it's 2024. I'm turning to you. Actually, I'm seeing you here too, Jean-Claude. So maybe we can have a highlight on what is happening in the United States and uh, where, where the debate is going right now. The floor is yours. Good morning, good evening. Hope you can hear me well. I wish I could be with you. Unfortunately, okay. when I was about to board my flight, I had a slight health issue to deal with, and unfortunately, I couldn't board the flight, and I miss so much being with you and networking with many of you who are long-term friends. My apologies. I will try to cover in a few minutes uh, what you, I guess, expecting me to talk about, uh, which is the U.S. presidential election, and I would say more generally the election in November 2024, both from the domestic standpoint, but also from the point of geopolitical environment. Uh, you know what's happening in uh, November 2024, which is almost exactly a year from today. The president will be elected for four years. The House of Representatives will be elected for two years. And in the Senate, 33 senators, which is about one third, will be elected for a period of six years. Let's deal with uh, the Senate and the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, 20 Democrats and three independents that normally caucus with Democrats are standing for re-election. Some of them are not standing for re-election, but say those are the seats and then uh, 10 Republicans. Uh, so the total of 33. The forecast at the moment is that 14 are solid Democrats, one is leading Democrat, five are leaning likely Democrat, and three so-called toss-up where the result will depend on the day of the election. And the Republicans are almost all likely to be re-elected. Uh, there could be a change of majority in the Senate but right now, as you know, there is a majority of Democratic senators, 51 to 9, and there is the casting vote of the vice president. So the Senate could be changing majority. It will largely 
depend on what I call the coattail effect of the presidential election. The House of Representatives, 435 members, 221 Republican, 212 Democrats, that since the last midterm election in November, exactly a year ago, and two seats are vacant. My prediction is that after the zoo that we've seen for the election of the speaker, it's very unlikely that the Republican will be able to uh, keep the majority in the House, and uh, the House could again become democratic by a slight majority. So we are now in the period where each party, and as you know, there, there might be several candidates, but at the end of the day, the two parties, the United States, Democrat and Republican, and we have the time where each of them is choosing their own <clears throat> candidate for next year election. The president, this is the tradition, whether it's Republican or Democrat, a president with what we call an incumbent is likely to stand without being challenged for the election. Yet, Joe Biden is facing some opposition for a variety of reasons within his own party. First of all, his age. If he's elected in November next year, he will uh, assume his function at the beginning of 2025, and he will be 82 years old. And when he finishes mandate, he will be 86. He will be the oldest president in the history of the United States. He's also facing other issues. He's facing issues of his vice president, Kamala Harris, who's never been convincing and who's not liked and respected even by his own, by our own party, the Democratic Party. She's never been able to impress. And as you know, I mean, if something happens to the president, Kamala Harris immediately steps in and becomes the next president. Americans, starting with the majority of Democrats, are very uncomfortable with that. And then he has issues with his son and the business, I would say, business activities of his family. Uh, so it, the matter is, it, it's quite simple. The people know that he will be, unless something happens to him between now and the election, he will be the candidate for the Democratic Party. Yet this is not the candidate that the Democratic Party would like to have. Biden was elected in 2020, largely because he was the alternative to uh, Bernie Sanders that pe people find too left in, and therefore, uh, and he didn't really campaign, and he was lucky to face Trump, who had a lot of issues. So uh, he was elected. This time it's going to be much tougher. So people are not convinced that Biden is candidate to uh, face Trump, assuming Trump is the nominee <laughs> of the Republican Party. Now let's switch to the Republican Party. Uh, same story on the Republican Party. Trump is leading in the polls, but effectively only 40% of the people who are at the primaries, and I, I remind you at the primary, only vote the people who are as Republican or Democrat. So if you you can vote at the Democratic primary. If you're Republican, you can the Republican primary. But those who are independent, and most of the, the majority of Americans are neither Republican nor Democrat. They are registered as independent. Trump only gets 40% or less of Republican voters. 60% don't want Trump. Now, the problem is that they don't agree relative to Trump. So Trump is, like Biden, not the candidate of the party as it stands now, at, at least the majority of the Republican voters. For about, first of all, his personality. I mean, some people and quite a few people don't like his personality, his style, uh, his attitude, and so on and so forth. Then he has a lot of legal issues to deal with. I mean, personal issues, you know, sexual assault, but also he took some classified documents when he had function and brought them to his, his in Florida and really stopped and didn't dare and lie about it. Then he reached the election. Then there was this uh, famous January 6, 21, when there was an assault on the Capitol, which shocked a lot of people in the world, but shocked a lot of people as well. So, uh, and I can go on and on. and. 
and Trump essentially is perceived as a benevolent person. He has done a number of things when he was president because he, he, he followed some of his advisors, some advisors who were better than some others. But net net, people don't feel that Trump, who is also not so much younger, I mean, maybe a couple of years ago, Biden is the, is the American would like to have as the next president. So, so what could be the outcome? You know? My <laughs> view is that it's going to be Trump, Biden, certain. So, uh, as I said, could have health issues and other issues between now and the election and be replaced by a governor. Not, not this for sure. And Trump is facing challenges. And although he leads in the polls, he leads in Iowa, he leads in New Hampshire, he leads also in South Carolina. Two alternatives are waiting in the wings. Governor of Florida, Ron, personally, uh, Ron DeSantis won his election during uh, the election of 2020. I don't think that, uh, I mean, it was a very significant, but he's done a number of missteps since we elected and his campaign is not going well. So uh, he is relatively strong, could be a trap. Now I see him sort of gradually fading away. So the star in the party is uh, Governor Kiheli, former governor of South Africa, who was also ambassador of the United Nations, originally a family from India, a Sikh family from India. And she, they came to the United States she was a locally in South Carolina, had a sort of one and a half term as governor of the state and was appointed by the ambassador to the UN. She did an effective job, what I would call the Reaganian part of the party, the traditional Republican who are strong on foreign policy, free market and limited government. So I would say a traditional she she was loyal to Trump when she was doing her job for the United States. At the same time, she was able to take positions that are less rigid and less conservative than some other Republican, particularly on the critical in the United States with women's rights, including right to abortion. As so, you know, the majority of American people are in favor of abortion, not any abortion, not for an extended period of time, but the majority of Americans are in favor of abortion. It so happens that the majority of the Republican Party is so-called life, and okay. this is conflicting with the view of the majority. Thank you. So that, that was the first round. I I it for, you were very long already, and we're going to come back with more questions. So if you don't mind hanging up with us for a little while longer, just to answer questions later of on, course, of because <laughs> we need we need time for everybody here. So now we have the basics: Biden on one side, Trump the other. Nikki Haley's climbing up. Some of you have some hopes for her, but we're not sure. But there are a lot of things to talk about, and especially how geopolitics are getting into this uh, this election, which never happens. And I know you're keen to talk about this a little later. But it's going to be to have interesting for us to have okay. other perspectives sure. on this election. And uh, with Mr. Akita, he's going to give us his view of how Asia is seeing this this uh, election coming up and what it means for for Asian countries and also maybe allude also to Taiwanese elections. Okay, thank you very much for having me. <coughs> uh, since I'm from uh, one of the uh, most dangerous geostrategic location, uh, surrounded by Russia, North Korea, and China, and Japan is just next to uh, Taiwan Strait and Korean Peninsula, and Russia has been occupying uh, Japanese territory for about uh, 70 years. So please allow me to be a, a bit allow me to present a bit pessimistic view. In that context, I'd like to make uh, uh, three points. One is uh, about the prospect of U.S. presidential election. I don't go, go into detail because, you know, he... Yeah, and Dr. Yeah, gave he, us a lot yes. of details. Then, secondly, uh, its implication, U.S. presidential election implication for Asia or for U.S. allies and partners. And then, thirdly, uh, about the Taiwan presidential election next January. So first, prospect of U.S. presidential election. I traveled to uh, southern part of the U.S. last month, like uh, Georgia, 
to meet many Mr. Trump's supporter, supporters, and I did. And that reminded me that two things. One, they are very, very serious. They are seriously supporting Mr. Trump. But more importantly, uh, many people say that U.S. economic situation is terrible. Though objective economic data says unemployment rate is quite low and the U.S. economy is kind of growing. Mm -hmm. So I asked the uh, political scientists about it. And they say it is by, uh, by partisan bias. So people do not accept objective data anymore. So this means that I think that U.S. election next year is not a topic to analyze based on objective data because people don't buy it. But rather, it is de facto a political civil war. Oh. So political, if it is a political civil war, uh, maybe a prospect would be very, very highly polarized and whether Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump will win, it's going to further deepen the division of the United States. So that is my first prospect mm -hmm. on the U.S. presidential election. And secondly, uh, second point, implication of U.S. presidential election to the uh, U.S. allies. Whether Mr. Trump will become president or not, I think that uh, U.S. election will further accelerate so-called Plan A dash trend. Plan, plan A, Plan A world, is the world in which U.S. maintain dominant power mm -hmm. and strong leadership, so that U.S. allies or partners could cheap riding on U.S. security umbrella or US, rely on U.S. leadership. That is a plan A world. But the maybe first Trump administration brought world to plan A dash world. So we are now at the plan A dash world. That is, uh, U.S. allies or partner still keep relying in on U.S military presence or leadership to some extent, but the, they realize that Plan A is not the sustainable anymore. So make more effort to defend itself or to make more security con or military contribution to sustain U.S. military commitment. For example, Japan made a decision to launch biggest military buildup after World War II, uh, namely uh, double its defense budget within five years. And also Japan reached out to, uh, reaching out to Australia, UK, South Korea, France, to enhance security cooperation to support or complement US military presence in, in, the, in, in, in the Pacific. So I think that uh, US presidential election will be highly polarized. And if, of course, it is if Mr. Trump get erected, the world will further accelerate the shift from plan A to plan A dash. But even if Mr. Biden get elected, people, it will highlight how U.S. will be, uh, U.S. have to change, challenge, uh, face the challenge internally. So I think uh, regardless who will be, uh, get elected, the world will accelerate. Uh, it, Plan A dash trend. But for the country, who can, but some of the country, maybe plan A dash, that is to sustain US military commitment or leadership, will even, maybe for some country, it will not be possible. Maybe Middle East, the US is reducing footprint. So for that country, next year will be the beginning of the real plan B world. So my point is that shift from plan A to plan A dash or plan B world. So that is the second point. And third and last point is about the Taiwan presidential election. 
uh, the next January. I think that whether ruling party's candidate or opposition party's candidate win, there will be a common ground. That is a status quo, maintenance of status quo. Okay. Uh, according to a public poll, majority of Taiwan people really wants to maintain status quo. So if ruling party candidate win, maybe they try to, he will try to keep a distance from mainland China, but will not call for independence. <laughs> If opposition party leader will win the, pre win the presidency, maybe he will try to embrace more dialogue with China, but will not embrace China's economic or political sphere of influence to the extent to change the status quo. So that is a prediction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's interesting because Isabel said these elections are not really going to count because it's not going to change much uh, afterwards because what matters is what's going to happen on the battlefield in Ukraine and in uh, Israel. And you're saying that whatever the elections are going to bring about in the States, definitely we're going to see a, a, an importance lessening for the United States Sl as, as the big ally. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to turn to Igor, who's Russian. So he's going to talk to us about his view of the American elections, but also talk to us about the Russian election because Putin should announce very soon that he's a candidate, which should not be a big surprise. Uh, but how is it viewed from the inside, especially when a war is going on, people and soldiers are killed? How does he present himself to, to the Russians? And, and, and your take on the American elections also. Thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs> Thierry de Montbrial, because from 2008, being a participant of the World Policy Conference, that's, that's worth uh, uh, an award. Uh, there is no suspense in Russian election. Eh? Uh, if it takes place on March 2024, as it is planned, 80% of the population or those who will come to vote will, will vote for, for Mr. Putin, okay? Uh, this is the genesis of the system, this is the history, this is the geopolitical situation. Uh, having said that... War doesn't change that. Having said that, uh, unfortunately they didn't give me a clicker and I had some slides, but you have to believe uh, me. Yeah. You have to believe me that uh, sociology shows that, number one, among young people, there is a big fatigue of the face uh, because Mr. Putin is in power for, for the last 23 years and it's obvious then that uh, uh, some young people want to change. Second, even if something happens, something very unexpected, and then uh, Mr. Putin, for example, says that I'm not running, uh, the same young people are divided into two equal uh, categories. One would say, we want a stronger military to head us. And another one, ferociously saying, no military at all, we need some peaceful and, and civil development of, of, of Russian Federation. So here you have a split even among the young category of the voters. Forget about the older ones who would 60% vote for somebody with the military background to, to head them, okay? So this is the second. Both of them, both categories and both age groups would vote for more social justice. And the talk about the progressive income tax, which is going on for, 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 for decades, and we still have a flat. 13% uh, uh, income tax. Uh, the, 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 the talk about the uh, oligarchs who are around the, the Kremlin and they run the country and, and not us running the country and so on and so forth. So uh, whoever wins uh, should take this into very serious consideration. Uh, very telling was the reply, uh, what about the mutiny of certain Mr. Prigozhin. Probably you heard of the mutiny this summer when uh, somebody very close to, to power, the owner of the private army who fought in Syria, in Ukraine, all of a sudden raised up and from Rostov on Don went to Moscow and was stopped only 100 kilometers from Moscow. So the reply of both young and old was 50% supported them. 
That's telling in terms of the general mood of those who are going to go and vote. Okay, so this is, the, this is it. You have to take con into consideration the feeling of social injustice, the, the need for change, at least in the younger uh, part of our population, and nevertheless, strong hand and preferably something military, uh, somebody military uh, on top of us. Uh, again, I will end up this part by saying that 80% of those who will come will vote for Mr. Putin. It's organized, but it's also uh, genuine uh, support for the figure who is, who is leading the country at the moment. Uh, very strong and influential people around him, around Putin and visible on, uh, uh, on the political screen and political stage of our country, they say, why do we need election anyway? 80% is a given. Uh, the supporters are given. We're in the war. Why bother? Why, why do we disattract attention of the people? Uh, I would say that Putin will not buy this because he needs a referendum on what's going on. So he will probably need a, a real and clean results from the different territories. We don't forget that Russia is one-seventh of the land mass with 100 nations and nationalities. It's very telling and interesting to know who reacts on what and how at this present stage of the serious geopolitical conflict. So it's like a survey for him. It is a survey, survey and a referendum <laughs> for him and for people around him who run the country uh, in his name or together with him. Having said this, I should say that given the circumstances, about 30% of the survey, 30% of those in, who participated in the sociological poll, they didn't know that we are having the election and didn't care less. And so from this point of view, this indifference also is very important to take into consideration for anybody who is doing the, the, the politological uh, management of the situation. In, in view of this, uh, American election is, is of more <laughs> hype and interest uh, for the average uh, uh, Russian than, than probably ours. And from this point of view, there is no question that the mainstream uh, media is for Trump. Whether they are given a sort of advice or that's their honest uh, opinion, uh, no, no matter. But it's obvious from all of the analysis of the mainstream, I'm not talking about telegram channels and social media, but uh, the mainstream would, would definitely uh, provide all kind of support to Trump and all kind of... Uh, Oh, he's old, he's falling from the tarmac, etc., etc., to Biden. It's obvious. Same would happen in French election if, hap if it happens tomorrow. Same kind of arguments will be in, for, in favor of Le Pen and against uh, uh, Macron. Uh, if the, the decision of uh, uh, Great Britain on participation in EU would happen tomorrow, uh, they would be for Farage. And, and, and against uh, anybody who, who is Eurocentric. So th that's obvious, that's the result of the geopolitical situation. And uh, again, no matter what, after March 24, if everything goes according to the normal plan, uh, very serious messages will be delivered to Kremlin to take care of uh, what's going on. And from this point of view, uh, of course, we are now junior partner of Chinese People's Republic, and certain elements will definitely be taken care of, not only in Moscow, but in Beijing too. So a big reshuffle of the political staff, is that what you're saying? We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, we, in terms of reshuffle, they talk about reshuffle all the time, but we know that Mr. Putin is very loyal to his uh, and to his entourage, I don't think I don't think of great reshuffle, but the accents should be should be changed seriously. Well, thank you for for this assessment, Jean Claude. I know you're back. I don't know if they can put you back on the screen behind us, but uh, I wanted to ask you. Yes, I'm you're here. back here. Yeah. Um, you had disappeared for a while. Um, we, you, when we talked over the phone, you said that something that never happened in U.S. elections before was the theme of foreign <coughs> policy becoming of importance to Americans, and that usually never happens.
But this time, because of the war in Ukraine and because of what's happening with Israel and the Hamas, <coughs> it has become a big um, challenge for the politicians. Can you tell us a little more about this, <coughs> please? <coughs> yes. Uh, traditionally, I would say there is a consensus between the Republican and the Democrat on foreign policy. And uh, I heard what some of the panelists were saying about the quasi-civil war in the United States. This is true that we have a bipolarization of American politics, but uh, this bipolarization is no longer just on domestic issues, it's also on foreign issues. And uh, let's talk about uh, Ukraine for, for a period of time. When uh, Russia invaded Ukraine a year and a half ago, there was immediately an overwhelming support to help Ukraine and not getting involved directly, obviously, in, in a war, but <laughs> providing massive support, financial support, but also military support. And uh, this military support has been overwhelmingly support at the beginning, endorsed by, I would say, both sides, the Republican and the, the Democrat. But over time, we've seen gradually less support from some part of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is not just one block. You have, I would say, the Trump minority. You have the traditional isolationists who are not supporting foreign uh, involvement and that's led by people like Rand Paul. And then you have, I would say, the Reaganian part with Nikki Haley, but also people like uh, Tim Scott and uh, Mike Pence and so on, who want the United States to be involved and play a role, if not dominant, at least significant in, in foreign policy. That's until very recently, Biden has been able to get from Congress, both the House and the Senate, the financial help that he needs. And let's face it, you know, very cynically, you might say, the United States has been benefiting from the war in Ukraine for three reasons. First of all, remember some time ago, your French president was saying NATO is brand dead. I mean, NATO has never been stronger. That's one fact. And two major countries who had stayed neutral since World War II are now joining NATO, Sweden and Finland, which is extremely significant. So NATO has never been stronger. And the countries that are on the border of Russia wants NATO to be more involved, to protect them, because they believe that if Ukraine falls, they're likely to be the next target. So that's number one. Number two, the money that has been spent by the United States is coming back in the form of military uh, orders. You see, for example, when Germany who was not spending that much on defense, but Japan as well and so on, <laughs> where, who are they buying from? From the United States. So uh, they're not buying from Europe. They're buying from the United States. There are very few examples. So, and third, on the energy side, US, which is more or less self-sufficient and Trump played a role for that, is now supplying Europe with the natural gas that they used to get from, from Russia. So the United States has been benefiting from this war from an economic standpoint and from a strategic standpoint. At the same time, there's less and less support for additional head to Ukraine, simply because this war is lasting longer than many people were expecting. And there is no obvious solution in the very near future. We know that Trump would probably drop to a significant extent the American help to Ukraine. But part of the Democrats are also now more hesitant. And one reason is simply the fact that we now have this war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. And Again, there's no consensus on this war. You've seen people on the right and on the left being reluctant. Biden has been extremely supportive of the Israeli uh, counteroffensive on Hamas and the ground invasion in Gaza. But at the same time, part of the 
Democratic Party, the left wing part of the Democratic Party, is now voicing some disagreement. And Biden, to be elected, needs to have the vote of these people. As you know, I mean, there's no Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren running against him. He's unopposed from a practical standpoint. It doesn't mean that he may not lose vote. That could be critical in some states if the war lasts for too long and if the civilian casualties in Gaza become, I would say, unbearable. So we have a situation where, yes, the next presidential election in the U.S. could have significant impact. The question of Taiwan is very critical. There is a minority of people in the United States who would support an American involvement should China attack Taiwan in the very near future. But this is only a minority. The Americans feel in majority that they can only get involved in a foreign war or foreign conflict if there is a significant component in the American society that supports this involvement. That was the case, for example, during the uh, Ireland-UK uh, conflict. There was always a support for the Irish side on the American because of the large Irish community. Okay, so, so what the you say uh, Jewish community in the United States, you're probably aware of that. You know how many Jewish people in the United States? 7.6. <laughs> There's more Jewish people in the United States than in the state of Israel. The state of Israel has a population of, of uh, 9 million people, but only 43% are Jewish people. So we are in a situation where there is, and in New York City where I live, one, I mean 1.6 million people are part of this Jewish population. The Muslim population in the United States is three and a half million people. And the Muslim population is not just Arab. There's all, there are people coming from Africa, there are people coming from Iran, there are people coming from Somalia and Egypt and so on. You also have 3.5 million Arab people. So, but in 2050, the projection is that there will be 8 million Muslims in the United States, which means that the Muslim population would surpass the Israeli population. Bottom line, I think this election in November might see some shift of vote based on consideration of what's happening in Taiwan, what's happening in Ukraine. But frankly speaking, if you watch American TV and listen to the news and read the newspapers these days, nobody talks about Ukraine anymore. We used to have Ukraine all over the screen. Now it's all about Gaza, Israel, this. And this is a real concern, I know, for this, for the Ukrainian government. But because the uh, new speaker is pushing some funding, but the, is separating. Biden wants a package to support Ukraine and Israel. And, and the Republicans say, no, we should split. We should vote on the help to Israel and we should vote on the head to uh, Ukraine. And we know why they do that, because they're probably not likely to support additional money for Ukraine. But it's interesting to see that, as in Russia, somehow the elections are going to be a survey of what people think, and especially regarding foreign affairs in the United States, which is something we really didn't have a big grasp on up, to the, up, up until now. If there are any questions in the room, I think we have 20 minutes. Yeah, there are a couple. So if you can bring a mic, somebody, please. So I, I see two. Um, there's one gentleman in the Monsieur Fouché and another gentleman in the, in the back. Excuse me. Um, yeah, if you can raise your hand. Uh, it's, oh, can you give it to Monsieur Fouché, please? Là, devant. Sorry, next time. Okay. A former ambassador and a géographe de renom. A short question to Jean-Claude. Do you see an alternative candidate on the side of the Democratic Party who would be the equivalent of Nikki Haley for the Republican Party. Thank you. 
Short answer to your question, governor of California or governor of Michigan? That would be Gavin Newsom, the governor of California? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So there's a question over there, uh, the lady with the mic. And I think the young man, want, you had a question too, right? Okay. Thank you. I'm Daniel Andler from Paris, Sorbonne. Um, I'm dumbfounded that none of you ever mention the role of social media and the role of artificial intelligence in the amplification of well-known uh, propaganda uh, tricks. I mean, uh, the, 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 the journalist from Japan said people are immune to uh, rational arguments. Not so much, I'm not so convinced. They're not immune to propaganda when it's done in a certain industrial way. Anyway, whatever your opinion are, is on this important and well-known topic, uh, what, what do you think about that? And what do you think, the, what, what is going to be the role of these uh, AI-powered uh, propaganda systems for the coming elections. Well, this is the perfect timing for a question because this was actually one of my questions, but I'm very glad you brought the topic. So, what the power of generative, generative AI, do you think, like, for instance, politician should have some kind of uh, transparency during the elections, saying, now this is our roadmap, we're not going to use AI, or if we use AI, that's how we're going to do it. Uh, is this something that should come up now in the political discourse and campaigning? So maybe uh, Mr. Akita? Um, yes, I think that uh, uh, it is a very, very serious problem, and I think there should be some uh, restriction. Um, because the situation is that uh, political landscape is polarized, but also, especially in the US, I can feel that there is a huge polarization of media itself. So when I turn on the CNN, I listen, you know, I watch some t news program, but when, then I turn to uh, Fox News, it's totally parallel world, and then I switch to another one. So I think that the even objective uh, broad TV program uh, provide different angle. So uh, without any restriction on the free flow of information in uh, unrestricted uh, cyberspace, it is very, it will create, amplify very chaotic uh, situation and it can be easily disrupted or manipulated by some actor. Say that. So, Igor, I'd like to have your take on this because you know there's a lot of accusations against Russian trolls during the elections, especially in 2016 in the yeah. States. What do you answer to this question? Because it's a real fear. Yeah, since um, the official election is overly organized and fully controlled, then in the mass social media, you have a lot of different uh, uh, opinions, some of them very exotic. Some of them goes a little bit, you know, uh, beyond uh, reasonable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the only effort which I know of during the last election, when opposition called for voting on anybody, be it communist, socialist, or extreme uh, rightist, but who are against the ruling party. Okay, so this experiment ended up in 1%, 1.5% of the result, you see? So from this point of view, when the country is organized like we are organized, and when the election is controlled the way we are controlled, then this effort of social media, a lot of noise, no, no uh, efficient electoral result. That's well, that, number one. But for number two, outside number two, number two, a lot of people left <coughs> our country after, especially young, productive, creative, left after the beginning of, of the conflict with Ukraine. They are split altogether. We were discussing with some of them today. They are split and they don't have unity at all. They keep accusing each other in all kinds of mistakes rather than mobilizing for one candidate who would represent a real opposition. Well, maybe, Isabel, you could address this as a journalist when you cover foreign elections. The fact that now we have to be eager 
of so many fake news going around that the elections and the freedom of speech is really manipulated. Uh, it's making it very complicated for journalists to work. Uh, what do you think of it? Well, it's m one more argument to go uh, on the ground and not to cover elections through social um, uh, resort. But, uh, I mean, I think it's one of the uh, weaknesses of uh, democracy. Countries like Russia and China have been uh, investing for years in warfare and uh, cyber uh, initiatives. Um, the elections in, in Europe uh, and the, in the States have been act for uh, for years and you have this uh, i mean europe is j is just uh, uh, realizing it uh, you know for now two or three years but the ch i mean the, the changes come v very slow for years we have considered that in the cyber area for example the our purpose other democratic countries was not uh, to have an attack department in the cyber area, but only a defense uh, department. So I think we have 10 or, and I mean, if, if it's, it's also, um, we have not in, in, in invested in this area for uh, also for, for moral reasons, you, you know. Uh, so it's very difficult today to be, I mean, to, to, to be if, uh, to, to protected with efficiency. I, I just come back from, from Taiwan, and, and this is very interesting because Taiwan is uh, subjected uh, each, during each elections uh, by um, cyber attack from China, um, influences through the North medias Korea. of the Kuomintang and the, you know, f paid by, by, by China. And this year, they succeeded to, uh, to low down the level of uh, fake news by um, forbidding the, um, I mean, uh, you, you know, the, the system was that China was influencing um, the Taiwanese people through, uh, by investing in the religious um, uh, institutions. So um, Taiwan succeeded to, to cut the, the transfer of money coming from China to Taiwan. So this year, you have a decrease of, uh, I think, 40 or 50 percent of the Chinese influence directly in the, in, the, in the Taiwanese influence. So this is an example, but we are, we are far away, you know, uh, of what should be needed to do. I know that in France, yes. I mean, we're just starting, and you said we have a very defensive position yeah. right now, yeah. not offensive at it's all. It's a taboo, because, it's a taboo. Boy, it's, uh, so I know there was another question. Uh, I, I don't know if you have a microphone. Oh, and there's one just... Okay, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> just work it. Um, John Andrews here from The Economist. A question for Jean-Claude. Um, is it plausible that uh, Joe Biden can somehow persuade Kamala Harris with a good job offer not to be his running mate? And if so, does he need to find a black woman as her replacement? Um, and clearly, Gavin Newsom would not be such a woman. And if you take the Republican side, um, do, do, you, do you think Nikki Haley is actually basically running to be Trump's uh, running mate? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's too late for Biden to replace Kamala Harris. He's made the announcement Kamala Harris will be running with Biden if Biden is the nominee, as it's likely to happen for the Democratic Party. So uh, if Biden wanted to replace Kamala Harris, it would have been done months ago, essentially when he announced his candidacy. So she's the candidate for vice president. And people, and this is, frankly speaking, one of the arguments that the Republican will be and should be using. When you look at Biden, the way he behaves, what he says, the way he expresses himself, people have to think that Kamala Harris is likely to be the next president. I wish him well, but Kamala Harris is likely to be the president that the Democratic Party will elect if they vote for Biden. 
That's number one. Now, <clears throat> you uh, asked the question. I had the privilege of meeting twice Nikki Haley when she started the campaign during uh, fundraising events in New York. And I had conversation one to one with her. And she said it very, very publicly. She said, I'm running for president. I'm not running to be the vice president. And I truly believe her. I think, let's frank, you know, she's 53, 54. If she doesn't make it this time, she has a very good chance of being the nominee for the next election. Four years from now, she will be 57, 58. So uh, I, she, she, Trump is likely to be the nominee of the Republican Party. Trump will obviously choose someone to be his vice president. Uh, good luck to the person that who's going to be chosen by Trump, because uh, this is this election is a toss-up. I, I have absolutely. If you look at the polls, you know, forget about the primaries. If you look at the polls, it's really very very close and. And so many things can happen between now and the election, particularly for Trump, also, who facing so many issues. And Biden, you know, inflation, the southern border, the problem with the, the family. So the fact of the matter is that, frankly speaking, Trump thinks only about himself and uh, he doesn't care. He will have a vice president candidate. It's very unlikely to be Nikki Haley or, or Ron DeSantis for that matter. It will be somebody else. It could be a governor uh, of uh, the state of, I'm not sure if it's South, uh, I forgot her name. You know I mean, the governor of North Dakota or South Dakota was a woman, uh, not an African-American, uh, it's a white woman, but she's a governor and she's very popular in some conservative movement. I forgot her name, uh, skipped my mind, but I'm sure you can find her. I think she's the governor of, South Dakota. Okay, so we have to look for Nico Halley, but four more years. I think there is another question. Uh, that's what I think, yeah. Yeah, that's what you said, yeah. Um, I saw somebody else, yeah, some hands are raised in the back, please. Uh, somebody's going to bring you a mic. Axel. Hello, I'm Axel uh, Gilden from the French magazine L'Express. Uh, to follow up on this question, is there a, is there a scenario where Joe Biden steps down before summer. And um, the conve it happens the old way. In the, the convention decides for, for a new candidate. Or uh, Joe Biden has to, to he's impeached because he's, he's sick or something. What happens then? Another scenario for Biden? Uh, impeachment, I don't believe it. I mean, uh, impeachment is not for sickness. If, if it's impeachment, it's it, the Democrat are able to link the fundraising of his family. Uh, there's two checks have been produced where he received 10% of amount of money uh, received by his brothers and his son. But it was mark loan repayment. So, I mean, I don't, Biden is not going to be impeached. There's not going to be enough evidence to, and I, I'm not sure if he's really corrupted. I mean, the family has been trying to use his name for, benefiting by getting money from uh, shady characters in foreign countries, whether it's Romania, uh, Russia, China, and so on and so forth. They've been, all people do that in the political scene in the United States. They've done it to an extent that's unprecedented, but uh, that's not going to be enough. No, the only thing that could prevent him from being the nominee would be his health. If he had a major health issue, he may have to step down, but that's the only reason why I would see him. Otherwise, he's going to, you know, there's some, I just learned yesterday, for example, that, you know, you have to register in every state for the primaries and so on. He's not even registering for primary in New Hampshire. He's taking for granted that he will be the nominee of the party. So only a, a, a significant health issue would prevent him from being the nominee. But that, that's what usually happens when you have an incumbent president. He, you know, he doesn't go through the primary process. Uh, Alors, you want to follow up? And I think somebody else has a question behind you, if you just, can pass the mic afterwards. Just go to clarify, it. I just yeah. meant impeached by his health. I didn't mean impeached for uh, judicial yeah. region, okay. reasons. No, 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 no. Okay, no, no, I take it, I take it. And my answer to you is that 
that's the only reason why he wouldn't stand if, if he had a major health issue. And in the back, there's another question. Yes, hello, Nicola Pio from Tilt Capital. Thank you very much, very insightful. Maybe a question drawing on Ms. Lasser's point on continuity. Um, is it correct to read what is happening right now in 2024 being maybe a step in this direction that there is a, I would say, a continuity towards a, a big move globally towards far-right extremism, which is in fact fueled by fake news and social media, etc. How do we get out of that? To be frank, as a citizen, European citizen, I'm extremely concerned <clears throat> by the fact that every time we move and we see a scandal in the, in the sense of manipulation, it goes in the direction of far-right extremism. And it's very hard to fight on a, on a rational basis the arguments of this, uh, of this trend. Thank you. Well, the fact that there's more and more uh, votes for populist uh, uh, candidates in, in general, each time you have a new scandal, it brings out more nationalism and populism. But it, it's, it's often true, but it's not always the case. Like what we saw in Poland, after some years of government, uh, the opposition was, was able to, to find another path. So, I mean, we have to be confident in, in people who are voting and, you know, who are able to, uh, to choose differently. But it's true. And if you look at Europe, for instance, I mean, a lot of nationalistic countries have been building up and we have a lot of governments and coalitions now with the far right, and that never happened before. So is this something that you're concerned about, this movement towards more nationalism that we see in elections? If I don't betray your thoughts, no. We, alors, okay. uh, well, uh, Monsieur Akita and then Isabelle. So uh, I worry more about the fragmentation of the global world order uh, rather than uh, rising, nas rising nationalism in each, in, each, in each individual state is a very serious problem, but uh, I worry more about the, you know, uh, defragmentation of the international system through the next year's series of election is more serious. And uh, maybe people sp speak about multipolar, multipolar, but the polar means you have a polar, right? US, Europe, and maybe China, or hopefully Japan or India, polar. But the maybe world will be more like a multi-universe without, without a strong polar, mm -hmm. but the universe, mm -hmm. universe coexists together mm -hmm. without any order. Mm -hmm. That is, that is more dangerous. And, and that was a big concern of the two round tables we had this morning that are really interesting, saying it was, it was time, those elections are also a time to pull together and find out what are our common objectives and what is the world order you need to rebuild on the economic side, but also on the yeah. political side. Isabelle, you no, no, but uh, the, the question of uh, disinformation, I, I do uh, really agree with you. It's really frightening because uh, what we see today is um, each time when you have two parts, it's uh, just, I mean, the disinformation has uh, absolutely, uh, is overwhelming. I mean, the, the, the facts today are less important as the, uh, as, uh, the, the perception, the emotion, and the ideology, we, we, I mean, we just have, the, the last example is, is absolutely obvious between Israel and Hamas. I mean, depending the, the place where you are in the world, you just don't see the same images. And um, so the, the, it, it, it's very, very hard to, to counter disinformation, but also uh, it's very, very hard to, um, I mean, to, 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 to counter the... Um, the rapidity of the information, uh, the um, emo emotion, which is uh, uh, driven by the in, the in the social area and uh, and on the internet, you, you, it's not audible anymore. And of course, this leads to more extre extremism in each part of the world and on every subject. Well, thank you. Uh, we've touched a lot of ground, a lot of different topics, and it was a. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much all for being here this afternoon and thank you to our panelists.
Well, good evening all. Uh, I hope you can hear me. It seems to be the case. So, bonsoir à tous. We have a hard task together, but we have a brilliant team here who is going to try to uh, keep you up and awakened, despite the fact that we are the last ones uh, today after what has been a, a very long day. Uh, what we are uh, going to discuss uh, tonight together is the first uh, of a row of uh, discussions that will continue tomorrow around transversal thematic uh, issues uh, that are of major importance for geopolitics and the world of tomorrow. Uh, tonight, uh, as uh, last year, we will concentrate, as far as our table is concerned, on food and agriculture, but as we will see, food is not only about agriculture, and there's a lot to say uh, about beyond food. Uh, we have uh, experienced, since last year, another um, uh, new episode of how geopolitical food can be. Uh, this year, a few months ago, India decided to cut its exports of rice. Uh, because of its own production uh, problems. And it has, of course, hit very seriously many countries, including developing countries and even more in, in, in Africa. So another row of events which is uh, exemplifying the trend towards mistrust and a kind of uh, reorientation of uh, countries towards their self-interest and uh, um, a disbelief on what would be uh, uh, a world full of trust where everybody would concentrate on optimization, op optimizing production and consumption over the world. Now, being self-sufficient, being independent, being uh, immunized from uh, geopolitical threats <coughs> has become, uh, after the um, uh, Russia-Ukraine events and uh, now the uh, uh, changes in food production last this year, uh, the, the, the world for the policymakers. And of course, we are also experiencing, uh, uh, as uh, it was already the case last year, deep changes in the way industrialized countries are producing and consuming. Uh, there is this trend towards more natural, more local, more vegetable food in uh, the West. At the same time, developing countries are also continuing increasing their consumption, their demand, and their uh, um, uh, wish to move towards, uh, um, I mean, uh, developed countries' food uh, consumption uh, standards. And on top of those uh, areas, we have this, continues, this continued uh, renewal in technologies, in the way food is produced, but also delivered, marketed, consumed, etc., which changes the global uh, landscape. Uh, we have also, uh, and that would be uh, the last point that I'm going to highlight as an introduction, uh, this uh, threat around climate and this big question whether food is an ally and agriculture is going to be an ally of climate. Uh, or is it going to be, uh, uh, is there be going to be a lasting contradiction between producing, producing food and, being, and uh, fighting against uh, climate change? So we have a great uh, group here uh, tonight to address those issues. I'm very happy uh, that uh, Mr. McCullen, Mr. Cullen uh, could uh, uh, reach us, join us again. Uh, as it is the, at least the sec as far as I'm concerned, the second year I have the pleasure to interact with him uh, to discuss those issues. Mr. Cullen is the chief economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization. He has a uh, very broad and long-lasting experience in economics, in development, in agriculture. Uh, Mr. Maximo Torreo Cullen has been um, also uh, has worked at the World Bank Group, he has been the ex where he has been the executive director for several Latin American uh, countries, but he has also uh, led the division of markets, trade and institutions at uh, IFRI, a well-known uh, institute uh, here. So, Mr. McLean, you, you will start this panel by introducing us into uh, the broad picture, and uh, you uh, will be uh, followed by uh, two people who will uh, focus more specifically 
on uh, areas that are of major importance uh, for our uh, discussion tonight. Uh, Mr. Kabel uh, Abdallah, who is a manager, direct, managing director and CEO of Canal Sugar, uh, and Emirates, an addition multi-billion dollar agricultural industrial group, which is operating, uh, among others, in Egypt, and which aims to ensure Egypt's self-sufficiency in sugar. Uh, so uh, we, uh, Mr. Kamel, for over 20 years, you have led large regional companies in the Middle East with turnaround uh, mandates, and you will talk more particularly about the um, Middle East. Then we'll have the pleasure to uh, turn to uh, Mr. Okulei, Sam Okulei, uh, who is the Chairman and Chief Executive uh, Officer of LATC Group, which is a property investment firm in Nigeria, which invests in a variety of uh, uh, areas, sectors, including, of course, agriculture, uh, which you are particularly uh, familiar with. And you will provide us with a private sector uh, vision of what is happening also in Sub-Saharan Africa, as with your uh, grounding in Nigeria, which, as everybody knows, is a critical uh, country for um, agricultural production and the largest African country, uh, of course. And finally, uh, you will turn to Mr. Park Yongju, who is uh, coming from uh, Korea, who is an executive vice president of Plant Farm, a leading uh, indoor vertical farm company. You have uh, Mr. Park, uh, 30 year plus ex years of experiences in brand strategies, global market marketing management and product innovation and with a strong uh, sector-specific experience in uh, agricultural production and food industries, which is going to be uh, the issue you will uh, address. You had served previously as the Chief Marketing Officer of Coway and as the Vice President of Global Marketing at Samsung Electronics. Uh, this, the specifics of the issues that you will uh, try to address will be also to um, focus uh, on technology and some dimensions, at least, of technology uh, as our round table uh, tries this year to uh, um, uh, take this angle uh, to give a, a complementary uh, vision uh, compared to what we had uh, discussed last year on those major challenges. So having uh, said that, I'm going to turn right away to uh, Mr. Cullen. Uh, I hope we can hear you correctly. Uh, please uh, go, go ahead. Hi, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we are hearing you very well. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for your kind invitation this, this second year. Uh, and let me uh, try to present where we are and what are the major challenges that we will have in the future and where we need to, to focus uh, enormously. So let me start by, by saying that relative to last year, the news are not uh, what we would have liked to be, meaning that the level of chronic undernourishment in the world remained very high to levels of 735 million people chronically undernourished. And if we project that to 2030, we will be around 590 million people chronically undernourished. Now, if we take out the effect of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, we are talking of levels uh, of around uh, 400 or 500, 400, uh, 119 million people less chronic undernourished. If you can pass the slide to the third one, please. You, next. That one. Okay, so basically what this graph is showing, what I was referring is 735 million people chronically undernourished, projected to around 600 million by 2030. And there you see the effect of the COVID-19 and, and the war in Ukraine. Next, please. Now, also, if we look at the latest report that we just launched today, and we look at the new hotspots, we see that the situation is not improving at all. Uh, and basically what we are observing is that there is 18 hunger new hotspots comparing to 22 countries, comprising 22 countries and 22, and, uh, 22 countries and territories. So this puts in a situation where we have countries which are in a very severe situation a situation which is uh, worse uh, than what we had uh, before, and especially now with the latest events, we have increased those. Uh, now, if we go to the next slide, 
Uh, what is important to, to mention here is that this agri-food system is going into significant problems of risk and uncertainties. And that's what will drive the future of what we are observing. These uh, risk and uncertainties are not only on the humanitarian side, but are also on the macroeconomic side. More than 61 countries in debt distress, problems of exchange rate because of the interest rate increase, and significant linkages of the energy sector with biofuels, but also with fertilizers. And of course, the problem of contamination of land and destruction of land. All that affects directly the agricultural sector through inputs, through trade, logistics, which affects overall production, and that will affect, of course, the prices. And in addition, we have debt stress. But the challenge is that all this is under a lot of stress of water and climate change. And climate change will affect in four dimensions, will affect on extreme temperatures, excess of water, lack of water, variability of the climate indicators which make more difficult for farmers to make decisions, but also pest and diseases evolution because of climate change. Next, please. Now, in this context of risk and uncertainties, we know that we have passed by now six of the nine planetary boundaries. And what that means, if we move to the next slide, it means that we are moving into something that we don't know means that we are moving into biophysical dynamics that are nonlinear and could be exponential. So the frequency of these events could significantly increase over time, and that's something that we need to carefully look at. Because what will happen is what we are observing today in Spain, for example, that the payments to the insurance has doubled or tripled because of the frequency of the weather events. So that is the environment we will be facing. Now, if we go to the next slide, there are four key drivers or transformation drivers that I want to raise uh, pretty briefly. First, the urbanization, which will continue and it will continue in space. Second, industrialization. Third, the importance of carbon neutralization, as you were mentioning. Our belief is that we need good food for today and for tomorrow. And that what means is not only to produce more, more efficiently today with less, but also to be able to make it more sustainable. And that is what brings climate investment towards the agri-food system rather than the reverse, because the agri-food system have enough, of, enough space to improve substantially and have the major marginal returns in terms of reduction of emissions. And the fourth is digitalization. But let me touch on the first three of those. If we go to the next slide. In this figure, what we see is how urbanization uh, and how is the relationship between urbanization and the share of urban population in total population and the share of agriculture, including fisheries and fishing, in total gross domestic product. At the global level, the share of urban population grew from 37% in the 1970s to 56% in 2019, while the share of agricultural GDP decreased from 5.3% to 4.2%. And this is substantial, the change that we are observing at the global level. You can see the same in the high-income countries, and then you see in China the big difference of what we are observing uh, today. Now, if we go to the next slide, we also see that the, pro the projection of the population is projected to evolve uh, in the world and high-income countries and China. And in high-income countries, a clear stabilization of population is shown, and even a reduction in the case of China. But this is not what we are observing in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where we are observing a significant increase of the rural population still and yet not converging like what we are observing in the case of, of China. So this means that urbanization will be a significant challenge, and that's something that we need to look carefully because the demand of the commodities that we will be eating will be varying accordingly. If we go to the next slide. Here, I approximate the industrialization by using the share of agricultural value added in GDP and the share of agricultural employment. As we can see, depending on the region, we can observe different dynamics. And while in the last 30 years, proportionally, labor has left the agricultural sector for manufacturing and services, almost everywhere in low-income countries, labor productivity in these sectors has remained almost constant, while it expanded during the structural transformation in high-income countries. Indeed, labor productivity in the rest of the economy has almost stagnated in Sub-Saharan Africa, but in America and the Caribbean, East Asia and the Pacific, while it has barely increased in South Asia and Near East and North Africa. So this shows something extremely important, which is also linked to the informality of these regions and how industrialization will evolve. Now, 
If we go to the next slide, we will see that the agri-food systems also creates pressures on our environment. And that's something that we need to look carefully. It creates effects because of emissions, 31%, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, and pollution. And those are the externalities. But again, what I am saying is that we need to find a solution to these problems because we need to have good food for today and tomorrow. And if we just focus on the greenhouse gas emissions and climate change in the next slide, we will see that 31% of the global emissions, nearly 50% were from non-CO2 gases and generated within the farm by crop and livestock production activities, 20% by land use, change processes, and mainly deforestation, peatland degradation, and 30% by supply chain. So that's the distribution. So there is enormous potential for carbon neutralization. If we go to the next slide, we will see here that our agri-food systems needs to be transformed to achieve this carbon neutralization. And for this, we need to improve governance of natural resources, improve productivity, this means produce more with less, improve production practices, improve consumption patterns and behavior, and use a cleaner energy. So our work here and in the figure, what you show in the red bubbles is the size of the problem and in green bubbles, the size of potential sequestration. So there is enormous potential uh, on the bigger problems in the use of energy, in the livestock use, in manure management, in fertilizers and rice to create reduction. And there is enormous potential in land use and forest peatland, but also in soil management to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. That's why I was saying that the agri-food system could be an opportunity to accelerate this process while at the same time assuring that we produce what we need for today and for tomorrow. And finally, my last slide is just to, to focus about uh, what we can do and, and where we can make a, a difference in this process. And here is where we need to tackle at the same time the emergency situations with an integrated humanitarian peace building policies, but also we need to protect our, house, our households increasing resilience and scaling up climate resilience across agri-food systems. That's the only way we will be able to address the challenges of water and climate and the only way we can contribute to the bigger access of healthy diets, because today 3.1 billion people don't have access to healthy diets. But on the financing part, there are several boxes that we need to look. One is support agriculture and how we can repurpose that, how we can accelerate and promote better incentives of the use of that support to agriculture, and that's the repurposing agenda. The second one is, of course, out of the public sector, but it's the private sector, the international financial organizations, and the other traditional donors. So that's the way we need to allocate resources in the proper incentives. Next week, on the 6th, we are launching the first issue of the True Cost Accounting of Food, which will bring a lot of insights and information of where these incentives should be aligned to minimize externalities from agriculture towards this idea of good food for today and for tomorrow. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Cullen, for providing this uh, broad vision uh, and concluding especially on the uh, policy directions that we have to, to take. One point that uh, I also take from your last slide is that you are using several times the word healthy diets, which means also something that I did not say in my own introduction, that agriculture is also part of our health agenda and uh, which includes also uh, changes in the way we produce agricultural food, but also in what type of food we eat and how we consume it. So thanks so much for providing this big picture. Now we are going to uh, dive more specifically on two key regions. Uh, Mr. Okulehi, uh, Sam, uh, let's start with you, please. And uh, thank you for sharing your, your vision of uh, what Africa is uh, uh, of the African situation, but also your own experience as an investor uh, and providing us with uh, your, this, this experience of a private stakeholder. Absolutely. Um, thank you, everybody. And of course, uh, great to be here again for the second time in a row. And I'm just going to take uh, from where Mr. Cullen stopped, and which is the impact of geopolitics on food production, food consumption, nutrition, um, on emerging markets, especially the vulnerable emerging markets like, like Africa, for example. And the, the essence of this is why governments in uh, Africa and especially other vulnerable emerging markets should, should care, should care about what is happening in the rest of the world. Uh, from Russia-Ukraine crisis or to lately the Israeli uh, 
uh, Gaza conflict or uh, as the case may be, what is happening between the United States and China, between uh, India and China, or as the case may be. And I think the most vivid example of why this is, is important is last year when we started to see the crisis that started in Sri Lanka as a result of you know, the crisis in, in Russia, Ukraine, uh, what started to happen in Africa, in many parts of Africa, um, with the uh, impact of what is happening in those parts of the world on food production in uh, some of these vulnerable uh, markets. And we say vulnerable because it's interesting to learn that uh, for many countries in Africa, the staple foods, the staple diets in these countries are still imported. Whether it is bread, which is consumed in many parts of Africa, and main ingredient being wheat, and wheat you know, coming from uh, Ukraine and Russia, for example, uh, whether it's in maize, corn, which is a very staple in Africa, and it is net imported uh, into Africa today, uh, or whether it's even cassava, for example, in West Africa, which is not just a staple, but a base ingredient for a lot of the products that are consumed uh, in, in Africa beyond food and um, uh, beyond uh, nutrition. So the interesting thing to note here is, for example, why these countries should start to care and why protectionism happening in many parts of, of the world starts to impact um, on uh, countries like, uh, like Africa, for example. And there are very interesting themes that start to happen, and it's interesting that Mr. Colin has pointed out a lot of them in, in his presentation. And you know, some of these very interesting things that start to happen is, for example, protectionism. Uh, we've seen, for example, the, the uh, uh, ban by uh, India on rice exports and how that starts to have a very important impact in countries like Nigeria, for example, Kenya, all over Africa, where rice has become uh, a big staple. And uh, the interesting thing that protectionism starts to, to do is that it starts to make food a weapon. Uh, because there is social unrest in these countries as a result of these situations. Uh, there is a lot of uh, problems that start to, to come out of it, like migration. I mean, we start to see a lot of people uh, migrating from Africa into, into Europe and the Mediterranean Sea now becoming uh, uh, almost a, a cemetery, if you like. And 12 out of the 54 countries in Africa have declared a food emergency this year as a result of the protectionist or the inflationary or the uh, geopolitical impact of what is happening in other parts of the world other than, than Africa itself. So it's important to point out things like you know, health challenges, uh, food as a weapon, uh, protectionism, inflation, and so on and so forth, you know, being the consequential effects of geopolitics in these parts of the world. Now, following this then is what should African countries, or what should these vulnerable emerging markets start to look out for or start to do in order then to make sure that food security becomes uh, a focal point of their policy agendas in order to make sure that there's not only a secure and, and peaceful environment in these countries, but that there is a very healthy population in, this, in these parts of the world. And I think the first thing that starts to become very important is, uh, first of all, building resilience in the supply chains or building resilience in, in uh, uh, the infrastructure that allows you know, for these countries to make sure that they get food back home. And this can, can go all the way from nearization or localization of these supply chains to make sure that uh, urbanization is good, uh, of course, but urbanization, of course, does not have to come at the cost of uh, depleting agricultural uh, uh, lands or depleting investments in agricultural practices to boost production uh, of food in, in uh, uh, these parts of the world. Next to that is technology, research, digitization, if you like. And it was very interesting in some of the presentations that we saw earlier today. If you go around supermarkets here in the Middle East, you find tomatoes, you find cherries, you find berries, and the kinds of things that you would never expect to, to grow in this part of the world, now being grown here uh, in the United Arab Emirates, for example. And that has gone a long way in securing 
uh, the, the food uh, system in these parts of the world. And this is something that African countries then have to start to put a big focus on to ensure that you know, there is localization and there is near, nearization, if you like, uh, of production basis, and this has to be held by technology. It has to be held by research, uh, conservation of water, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, there is diplomacy and multilateral engagement, uh, and for uh, countries in Africa to start to understand that there is every reason to care about what is happening in other parts of the world, that a war in Ukraine is not just a Ukrainian and Russian problem, that uh, the, the face-off between uh, India, for example, uh, and uh, China is not just an India-China problem, or that the, the global uh, trade dispute between the United States and China is not just a United States and China problem. That, of course, it's a global village today, and it's very important that uh, diplomatic relationships or multilateral efforts at solving these problems, either from a regional perspective, ECOWAS, or an African Union perspective, is key uh, and important in making sure that we keep a big focus on uh, all of these. Of course, there is targeted uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Inflation is a big issue today, and inflation is a big issue in these parts of the country uh, in these parts of the world that I'm talking about, not just from uh, a local perspective, but also from a, a global perspective. There is the impact of the fact that, like I said earlier, almost all of the staples in African cuisine and diets today is imported. You have the double whammy of uh, um, uh, the deterioration of the currencies in, the, in these parts of the world vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the US dollar, that is the currency that you require, or euro, or as the case may be, to make sure that these imports are, are brought in. And of course, the inflationary effects of it, the energy costs, and, and so on and so forth. Then last but not least, there is of course the key importance that has to be paid to sustainability and sustainability finance, or climate finance, because of course we have to preserve uh, the production systems in these parts of the world is very important that governments start to make sure that climate related finance or sustainability related finance is paid a very important uh, uh, attention uh, because for example uh, the kinds of resources that we need to make sure that food production is, uh, is uh, kept at its premium is extremely important whether it is water whether it is uh, uh, forestation, or as the case may be, is, is paid a very keen, uh, uh, keen attention to. Now, uh, in summary, the, the essence of this is to start to understand, of course, the impact of geopolitics on, on you know, food systems, and these are some of the very important things that, that need to be done in order to make sure that these countries have a very, very keen focus on why it is important to start to care about what's happening uh, uh, in, in the rest of the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Okulhi, and uh, also for helping us making uh, one step further after Mr. Cullen's presentation and highlighting uh, how intertwined are the issues and uh, how uh, uh, geopolitics uh, and food security uh, have uh, tight relations. Uh, and. Um, <clears throat> It's not only about producing and consuming in Africa, but also managing the relationships and caring about what happens in the rest of the, of the world. And uh, I suspect that we are going to face uh, now a, a different situation. Uh, Mr. Kamel in uh, the Middle East, uh, which has uh, strong specificities, uh, including uh, environmental speci and geographic specificities in this uh, major channel. and. Uh, here we are at uh, the right place to discuss those issues. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure if the presentation is up and running, but even without it. Uh, first, thank you all for still being with us. I know we stand between you and your uh, breaks for the evening. Uh, it's indeed a very important uh, topic, especially in the Middle East. The good news for the Middle East is that uh, national food security has been an item for at least the last 30 years in the Middle East. Um, while it's becoming a hot topic around the world, we've been dealing with it for, for a long time. But there has been major changes uh, over the years, especially over the last almost uh, eight years 
in terms of how we look at uh, national food security. Let me highlight my contribution here is that I come from the private sector. However, the role or the projects we do is, are in public-private partnerships with the government. For example, in Qatar, uh, a couple of years back, we flew in cows by plane, first airlift of cows. We worked within one to two years to ensure 100% self-sufficiency uh, of dairy uh, products in Qatar. Today, as was mentioned, we are working in Egypt to again ensure self-sufficiency in, in sugar uh, by uh, doing land reclamation for a land as big as Singapore, desert land, by using uh, disruptive or new technologies in this. But let me look at food security. Historically in the region, it was easy. It was about availability, affordability, accessibility. And essentially, governments would import it because only 3% of our land overall are fit for agriculture. Almost 97%, depending on the country that you are in, uh, is not, does not have the soil or the water needed for you to do agriculture. Uh, government had lots of money, so they can import and subsidize food programs around the uh, region. For example, in Egypt, 70 million people receive some kind of food subsidy for, uh, for bread. 70 million out of about 110, 120 million people. So, but this uh, model is not sustainable. You know, oil prices will not always go up. We heard earlier today they will start maybe going down. Uh, governments cannot continue to run uh, budget deficit. And we had another complication, really, which is the health crisis in the region. We have the highest, or the second highest, diabetes rates around the world. So what happened over the years is that diabetes, uh, heart problems start coming early. We have them at ages of, in the early 40s versus 50s in other parts of the world. Again, government responded by spending money on healthcare, putting the hospitals, sending people first abroad, then putting hospitals in. And now they realized also it's not sustainable. It's neither sustainable to subsidize imported food, nor is it sustainable to continue spending money on treating sick people from chronic disease. And that's now where food security has graduated into. It's about wellness, nutrition. It's not about now making, let's say, poor people or rich people uh, just having food in their tummies. It's about making sure they have the right food in their tummies so that they do not get sick, so that I don't have spent too uh, money on them buying insulin for their sugar, sugar problems. So when you have this change in food uh, security approach in the region, which said we need now to have good food, we cannot continue to import it expensive for many reasons, and we cannot continue to have people eating unhealthy food. So now we are working to ensure we have some kind of self-sufficiencies or at least a reasonable a domestic component production of agriculture. And that's what we are seeing things happen. What made this happen? Technology, pure and simple. Without disruptive technologies, we would not have been able to reclaim the desert. We have disruptive, uh, without disruptive technologies, we wouldn't be able to optimize the production and the use and minimizing the use of water. And without uh, these uh, technologies, we wouldn't be able to develop higher yields for cows, higher yields uh, for, for sugar, higher yields in every area of the agriculture side. Do we face challenges? Indeed, many. The public sector has different expectations from the private sector. Major mismatch between the public sector in the region and the private sector. Goals, expectations, timelines, return on investments. Add to it another component, we really need uh, always R&D, research and development, and our regional companies, and I've run two of the larger ones in agriculture, do not have the funding to do significant R&D investment. So we need the third component in the public-private partnerships, which are universities. The universities in the region are well-funded. I was an ex-academic, but regretfully, uh, a lot of the academia is fo are focused on having a higher research index than maybe having a relevant uh, research. Uh, we know in the industry, whenever we mention academia, they say, watch out, these people uh, do research that prove that blind people do not drive. You know, and we say, of course not. They have a relevant impact for research. We just need to tie them with the food security, the government, the policy making, and the, and the private sector. So where we stand today, 
Uh, it's the best of days because now food security is the end topic. No longer are investors chasing more buildings and more real estate, and people are looking at investing in agriculture, but also it's the toughest times. Indeed, as was mentioned, when you are looking at one healthy earth, uh, you know, one healthy water, one healthy soil, one healthy food, all of this will contribute to one healthy human. And we have several bottlenecks nowadays, especially when we add the regional geopolitical situation. The tensions that used to be here are coming back very fast, and they are driven and will be driven increasingly by agri-issues or water issues. For example, the water issues will impact the Turkey, Syria, Iraq food supply and agriculture, as well as the Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, Egypt water, water supply. Add to it, all these countries use common underground water, and increasingly, as we do land reclamation, we are using or maybe overusing the underground water, so we're ending up with a lot of issues there. Uh, hopefully, technology will come to the rescue. Instead of having lots of cows to get meat, we get our energy from alternative proteins so that we'll have less cows, less gas emissions, and uh, we'll be able to have also healthier, uh, healthier uh, food in the process. So let me uh, stop here and we'll wait for the Q&A, except to, to repeat uh, that technology has been a saver for the region on food security, and that the region has been among the pioneers in promoting nutrition and healthy nutrition now as a direction, instead of just more food uh, for people. I know. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Kamel, for all those messages and uh, two of them, uh, which I think we'll uh, all uh, re remember. A message about health and the situation of diabetes and heart diseases. By the way, something which is also taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is also experiencing this major change in health uh, challenges. And also this call for technology and uh, science as a, a driver for sustainable uh, food production. And I suspect that we are going to continue digging into this issue with Mr. Park, uh, which uh, I hope will have uh, his uh, uh, <laughs> presentation on the, <laughs> on the screen. No, no uh, I don't think I will have a presentation. Uh, so, so, you know, my, my background is marketing. And I used to prefer like a show and tell, but some technical difficulty, I am not able to show some you know, good uh, images. So I will focus on the, the telling the story. So the, the question is, you know, the controlled environment agriculture, CEA, whether uh, this technology can be the solution to you know, food crisis or food shortage, right? I was really glad to hear uh, the the UA Minister of uh, Climate Change actually mentioned about uh, she's strong support of uh, you know, CEA technology. Because uh, you know, Middle East is the area many uh, CEA companies are actually focusing on to really uh, deploy uh, their technology. But when you really think about uh, food shortage, there are many different uh, dimensions. You know, the first one would be whether you can have enough food for the, the human uh, races on Earth. Or, you know, some countries, they really uh, worry about, uh, you know, food sufficiency and then uh, self-sustainability. This uh, self-sufficiency issue came out a lot uh, after pandemic, when there is a disruption in uh, trade, and then also like the regional conflict like uh, Ukraine war, those are actually causing, uh, you know, the issue with uh, self-sufficiency. And then, if you really think about, uh, you know, different countries and different regions, you know, each country or different regions has uh, different needs for, uh, you know, controlled environment agriculture. One example would be, like, think about Antarctica, right? The, the most cold climate on Earth. There is no, uh, you know, plant, but... Uh, Currently, the Korean researchers in Sejong Research Center in Antarctica, they are growing, you know, the watermelons, you know, cucumber, pepper, and tomato, all different kinds of fruits and vegetables in uh, container farms. And those researchers are not uh, really uh, farmers. They don't know how to grow uh, those vegetables and fruits, but all the system is actually monitored from central location in Korea, 
and then the expert in that monitoring uh, room is providing instruction to the researcher. So the, the results is, you know, they can really enjoy fresh uh, fruits and vegetables, so that uh, improving their well-being, but also, uh, you know, by uh, cultivating those greens in, uh, you know, cold places like Antarctica, it's also good for their mental health as well. And another example, cold uh, example is like Mongolia. I know uh, many controlled environment uh, agriculture company, they are really focusing on hot uh, weather, but uh, you know, the Mongolia has, uh, Mongolia has been importing 40% uh, of their uh, vegetables and then almost 95% of fruits from uh, other countries. When I visited Mongolia, the quality of uh, the leafy greens are really, really bad. You know, uh, I visited their you know, very premium supermarkets, but uh, the leafy green quality is uh, you know, as poor as I almost cannot, uh, I almost don't want to buy it, right? And then if I, when I ask Mongolian consumers uh, whether they consume uh, vegetables, and they say yes, and then I ask what kind of vegetable they consume, they say it's uh, like uh, tome uh, potatoes, you know, sweet potatoes, and like, uh, you know, it's all uh, root greens. You know, for them, they never, uh, you know, enjoyed eating uh, the leafy greens. So one of the projects uh, being uh, conducted in uh, Mongolia with support from a local Mongolian company and then the Ulaanbaatar city is building an indoor vertical farm uh, near outside of uh, Ulaanbaatar and then producing uh, 70 tons uh, of uh, leafy greens uh, every month. So we strongly believe uh, this will uh, improve the, the health of uh, Mongolian consumers, right? And another example is uh, the Northern Canada. Uh, the one uh, city in Northern Canada, uh, they have a very high uh, obesity and then diabetes rates among uh, you know, young uh, kids. The reason is, the, again, is that they don't have chance to eat uh, leafy greens and fresh vegetables. So the local city actually uh, called uh, help for support to uh, Korean uh, the Institute, uh, KIST, the Korean Institute of Science and uh, Technology. So what they have done is they actually developed uh, the vegetable called uh, bak choy. Uh, in an uh, indoor vertical farm. And we call uh, that bak choy as super bak choy. That's because bak choy has uh, some special ingredients which help, uh, you know, uh, reducing uh, fat, uh, fat from the body and then also uh, reducing the obesity. And the KIST was able to develop bak choy with uh, 2.4 times higher uh, ingredient, which, uh, the ingredient in the bak choy, and then they also uh, able to produce bak choy two times uh, as fast as you know uh, traditional farming. So those are the some uh, you know examples in the uh, cold country, right? And in a hot country like in Dubai, as uh, the minister of UAE said, they are already uh, using uh, controlled environment agriculture in here, right? For producing tomatoes, you know, blackberries, you know, and leafy greens. But uh, another project uh, currently being undertaken in uh, UAE is actually producing uh, the animal feed in indoor vertical farm. I found a statistic saying the Abu Dhabi is second, uh, large, second country in terms of importing alfalfa. And they are importing alfalfa from like US and uh, also in China. And their import of alfalfa has grown, I think, 35 times, and 35% for the uh, past 10 years. But think about you know, producing alfalfa in the US, and then you have to dry the alfalfa so that you can actually transport to UAE. And then once you get alfalfa in UAE, now you have to add water into the alfalfa and then mixing uh, animal uh, feed, and then feed to the cow, right? So 
I, I hope I can produce alfalfa from indoor vertical farm, but we cannot. But uh, we can actually produce uh, barley sprout very easily in the indoor vertical farm. And barley sprout ha has very good nutrient for the cattle. And then also it's much cheaper than alfalfa. And then also there are many uh, research done on mixing barley sprout to uh, TMR, the animal feed, can improve uh, the productivity. One research says uh, the, the meat, the, the weight growth of the, the beef can uh, be quicker uh, more than two times. And then the, the quality of uh, meat can improve. For the, the cow milk, cow, uh, the milk cows, the milk production can improve by 20%. And then the protein content in the milk can also improve. So we are actually working with uh, one of the, the local company in uh, Abu Dhabi to you know, develop the, the barley sprout uh, into a vertical farm. And then we want to conduct uh, research uh, with uh, the, the cattle company as well. Let me <clears throat> and then. You know, uh, today the UAE minister actually mentioned about uh, the agriculture consumes the most uh, resources. I think that's really true. Uh, I heard 70% of fresh water are wasted or used in uh, agriculture. You know, it's very simple. If you give water to the plants, 95% of water just disappear. It's only less than 5% of water is actually consumed by a uh, plant. But uh, controlled environment agriculture, we use uh, less than 5% of water used by uh, traditional agriculture. And then, uh, you know, we can also recycle the water. So the water consumption is very low. And another statistic says 30% uh, of uh, the agriculture land disappeared in the past, uh, I think, 30 years. But in uh, controlled environment agriculture, we don't uh, make land uh, you know, bad. And then we can actually uh, increase the productivity of uh, you know, agriculture by uh, you know, six times, eight times, 10 times. Basically, we can actually stack up the, the layers. Then we can uh, produce much more uh, product. And Another good uh, side of uh, controlled environment agriculture is no pesticides used. Typically, I believe six billion tons of uh, pesticides are used in uh, agriculture, but uh, we don't use uh, any uh, pesticides. And in terms of uh, the, the waste of uh, food, only 67% of uh, you know, the, the crops harvested in traditional uh, agriculture can be edible. So almost like one third, you know, you cannot eat. But the, the crops from uh, indoor vertical farm, the rate goes up to 97%. So we, we don't uh, waste anything. And 45% of uh, fresh vegetables are wasted uh, during the transportation. And then 40, about 50% uh, of uh, also the, the fresh vegetables are wasted because uh, you know, it doesn't the uh, supply chain issue as well. But by producing uh, you know, the, the, the crops locally and then uh, reducing uh, food miles, you don't, you're not gonna have this kind of waste. And in addition to saving the waste, you know, we can produce uh, the vegetables uh, throughout the year, uh, three, 365 days a year. And then the productivity rate is uh, at least uh, two times faster than uh, traditional agriculture. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, if you look at countries like, uh, you know, Singapore, they also want to do, uh, you know, the food, uh, self-sufficient food supply within Singapore. But they have very uh, limited land. One of the benefits of uh, you know, indoor vertical farm is we can 
actually do agriculture anywhere, any place in the city. So one example is uh, the metro farm in uh, Seoul. So we actually converted unused space in Korean Seoul metro station into a smart farm. So I, I actually wanted to show the picture, but when we think about uh, changing that place, that place was completely empty, it's dead space, but uh, we revived that space into you know, indoor vertical farm with a salad cafe, and then also we developed uh, you know, the agriculture academy for uh, kindergarten uh, kids. And also with the Singapore uh, Food Agency, we have been discussing about uh, you know, using the land below the, the underpass. Because uh, below the underpass, there is no sunlight, so that land is completely wasted. But we are actually utilizing that land for uh, indoor vertical farm. And another uh, project currently being uh, discussed is you know, developing indoor vertical farm in Manhattan. Right? The, the vegetable price in New Jersey versus uh, Manhattan the Manhattan is typically uh, 2.5 to 3 times higher than the, the price of uh, vegetables in New Jersey. That's because uh, the transportation costs from New Jersey to uh, New York. There is only one route you can transport a uh, vegetable to Manhattan, which is the, the George Washington uh, Bridge. And then, you know, after the pandemic, there are lots of empty spaces in the buildings of Manhattan. So, uh, excuse me, Mr. Park, could, could I kindly ask you to conclude uh, this series of uh, very exciting projects? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last few so words. So, the Manhattan uh, is another one. So, we want to make self-sustainable, uh, you know, farm uh, with the, the restaurant uh, connecting to the, the, the farm as well. But, uh, you know, the... The CEA also has uh, many uh, you know, issues because uh, we are being criticized uh, with using uh, lots of energy, but I believe uh, uh, we can solve that pro problem because the, one of the things we are currently focusing on is the consumption of uh, energy in our LED lights. And for example, we were able to reduce uh, the power consumption by 10% every year. Mr. Park, could I kindly ask you to, so that we, uh, th thank you, thank you very much. I think w w the, the list of examples that you have been giving uh, is incredibly, uh, is incredibly uh, stunning and uh, highlights how much productivity can be increased and also uh, all the extreme conditions or frontier conditions in which uh, food can be produced efficiently with economic models that, that are viable. So, and uh, all the examples that you have given are also uh, leading me to uh, go back to one word that you, Mr. Kamel, mentioned, was, that was alternative proteins. So, uh, alternative proteins is uh, meat without uh, cows, you know, uh, including up to uh, uh, 3D printing, etc. So I know there's a lot of curiosity about this issue. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask all of you uh, in two minutes each, uh, whether you think this is a possible solution for uh, the future of food, not only as a tiny niche uh, uh, area, but something that could really be a uh, full-scale uh, solution. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Cullen, if you have uh, correctly uh, heard me, and if you'd like to start, you know, really two, two, two three minutes uh, each, just giving a feeling about what is, you know, something that for everybody is uh, absolutely beyond <laughs> understanding to up to a certain extent. Please, if you can ref uh, tell me again what is the solution you're referring to. Uh, I, I cannot hear you correctly. I uh, I, I'm you asking whether you think that alternative proteins uh, can be uh, a, a full-scale solution for nutrition and not only uh, some kind of uh, niche uh, scientific uh, experiment. Sure. 
Okay, so look, I, I, I don't think is the only solution that we have to look at okay? because the, the importance here is that it's not just proteins, but it's other elements that are required in a nutritious diet and a healthy diet. And when we look at all the rest of animals, for example, there is a diversity of micronutrients that are provided, which are important. I think the challenge on the other side is how we are able to balance things, because we have countries that overconsume proteins and countries which are completely under-consuming protein. If we are able to achieve that balance, I think we can bring that solution which is more efficient and could resolve significant problems of under-consumption of proteins we have, and at the same time cope with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially related to livestock uh, production. So, it's one element which could contribute, but I don't see it as an overall solution to the challenge. So there are alternative solutions to alternative proteins. Okay. Mr. Kamal, would like to continue? Yeah, first, uh, this is relatively in, in new area. I mean, it's only on the last five, six years. I think everybody tried the Impossible Burger and another uh, similar product. It's here to stay. We are still at the pre-paradigm era. We don't have a clear way of how to do it. And more important, we don't have assurance of the health and safety long-term benefits uh, associated with it. But if you think of life on Mars, for example, and here we always say in the desert in Egypt, uh, we are reclaiming Mars because we don't have water, we don't have soil, uh, we don't have electricity, what have you. If you think of life on Mars, let's say, of course you will be using what you call uh, food in the lab. Uh, uh, so I believe it's here to stay, it will grow, it's important. Definitely continuing to have more and more cows and more and more gas emissions uh, as a source of us uh, getting uh, meat is not going to be sustainable. Uh, and we have to wait uh, to see what will happen. But it will go mainstream in another couple of, couple of years, I believe. Already major, major investments are done there. And uh, we'll have to see yet the economic return Still, there is no positive economic return on this, but I think it will continue to, to happen. So, Kulehi? Yeah, I think so as well. I think that um, alternative proteins would, uh, at the moment it is niche, and perhaps it will continue to be niche until it is no longer uh, a niche. And perhaps what would help it to not become, uh, not continue to be niche is technology, it's, it's research. Uh, this evokes, for example, the question that uh, many years ago was at the point of uh, debate with regards to technology and its genetically, uh, genetically modified uh, foods, for example. Before now, there was a lot of debate about the health uh, benefits or the health implications of uh, genetically modified foods. But today, food technology has shown us that it is not only possible, but possible to do it safely to fortify foods with the nutrients that are, are required, whether they are uh, proteins or vitamins or as the case may be. So with regards to whether uh, alternative proteins will be able to provide at scale the kinds of uh, 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 benefits that we need in order to, to, to make it economically viable is, is still questionable. But I think what is encouraging is that it's becoming more and more possible with technology, with science, uh, to fortify with more nutrients what we, we consume uh, already. But it's definitely a, a very interesting topic that should be on the, on the table of both public and private sector. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. Mr. Park, would yeah, you concur? I, I, I agree. Like, theoretically, you know, almost everything is possible, right? Like, uh, you know, the fortifying uh, vegetables, you know, is possible. And then we can also, uh, you know, modify the taste of the uh, vegetables, right? If uh, in certain region they produce uh, best carrot, then we can study, you know, the, the, the land and then the climate of the region, and we can mimic the same condition in the indoor vertical farm, and we can produce the uh, same type of uh, food. But, you know, we still need a uh, you know, long way to go, but uh, as uh, you know, all the technology develops, it starts with the niche, and then it becomes uh, the main uh, technology. So I think uh, it's not gonna solve all the problem, but uh, it could be a big part of the 
the solving problem of food in the future. Okay, so I understand that you are cautious, but rather positive, if I could summarize mm -hmm. this kind of feeling. Now, maybe let, let's turn to the room, to the audience. Uh, would there be uh, questions, comments, uh, Philippe, you would like, Mrs. Kwon? Uh, uh, yeah, may I say I'm a bit surprised, uh, because in listening to you, I had the impression that the food problem was just a technological one, and with some money uh, invested in the private sector, there wouldn't be any more food problem. Uh, you didn't speak about one individual called the farmer, neither, perhaps a bit, our friend from Nigeria, did you speak about uh, public policies. May I remind you that in the 30s, Europe was a net food importer, that in the 50s, the PL 480 was created in the United States to send food aid, especially grains, to India. That very India, which is now threatening uh, the uh, food markets with the embargo because they are exporter of rice, of sugar, of wheat. Uh, where are the successes of Europe over India? Perhaps technologies, yes, but at first it was public policies, the common agricultural policy in Europe. And what is uh, not enough studied uh, the Indian agricultural policy with a guarantee of remunerative prices for farmers. Don't you think this is this thing which is important? That's true that Africa is dependent, is importing. Nigeria, you're the world's biggest uh, with Egypt, in fact. Uh, Nigeria and Egypt, you're the world's biggest wheat importer. In the 50s, Nigeria was the net food exporter. You were the biggest uh, exporter of palm oil, if, if I remember. So don't you think that the first problem is a problem of public policy, of uh, agricultural policies, and unfortunately, in some of your countries, farmers don't vote, or their political power is fairly limited. Well understood. The, re the rebellion of public policy, Philippe. Uh, yes, so let me, me ask yeah. let me, before we, we close. Maybe I'm going to ask Mrs. Ah. Kwon also to intervene because we don't have much time left and then all of you will get a chance to uh, uh, conclude. Mrs. Kwon? Certainly, I feel... Uh, thank you very much. First of all, for, thank you very much for sharing uh, with us your very extraordinary activities. And after uh, Mr. Uh, Shalman's uh, question, I feel certainly, you know, my question <laughs> is not very, very important. But um, I personally uh, convinced, I'm convinced that uh, the technology is really uh, one of the very important solution uh, to the problem of uh, our food insecurity issue. And, and especially just for that, I have a small question to Mr. Park. And I'm uh, personally very, very uh, fascinated uh, by this um, uh, smart farm technology. But, you know, as a, a, a one of the person who uh, like very much to eat very uh, good food, uh, my concern is, you know, all products from a smart farm uh, do you think uh, uh, they can contain the same uh, nutritional quality or taste? Yeah. Okay, so again, <laughs> Who would, yeah. you know, good. I think there's a third question if you, if you want yeah, to take all the questions. Unfortunately, very quickly, please, madam. Yeah, it's very please short. Um, yeah. Yes, I was just surprised to hear uh, that uh, genetically modified uh, GMOs, what it's all, the GMOs are sort of uh, normalized now because they appear to be safe. What if that? Uh, is there something official about that now? And uh, they are normally the uh, 
the World Organization, Monsieur is here, maybe he will confirm, has not uh, really approved that. So can you give clarity on that issue? Thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. So GMOs, so, maybe two minutes each, yeah, so please. that we stick uh, into our time frame. Mm -hmm. Mr. Park, if you wish so, to start. I, I think the, what, uh, the method we use in indoor vertical farm or controlled uh, you know, environment agriculture is different from like uh, GMO. So we don't do any uh, you know, the fabrication uh, to the, the crops. The only thing we do is we basically use water and nutrient, and we don't use soil. Soil is actually something it can hold the crops, but we use some other uh, methodology to hold the, the crops and then basically feeding uh, nutrient. So when I say, you know, the theoretically uh, modifying the taste or the ingredients, it's mainly done by controlling uh, climate. So for example, the, the Korean strawberry is very sweet. If you try Korean strawberry, the, the sweetness is more, twice more than the, the strawberry in uh, US. They are typically grown in you know, the traditional uh, the, the greenhouse. The reason Korean strawberry is uh, sweet is not because it's modified. It's because of the, the temperature difference between the, during the daytime and during the nighttime. So th that's the techniques we are using it. When I say controlling the climate, so if you want to make strawberry sweeter, then you, know, you, you can control the, the difference in the temperature. Some of the... Uh, thank the, you, Mr. Farber. Okay, Unfortunately, two, two everybody seconds, has seconds. to get a chance. So very quickly, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, two two seconds. Like some of the, the crops with the high uh, the, the functional ingredients is all, also done by uh, you know, changing the, the light and then changing the temperature. You know, we don't do any modification. And normally the, the crops we produce has the same nutrient as the crops produced in the, the traditional farming. Thank you very much, Mr. Park. Uh, Mr. Huli, uh, uh, what First, was the, the question from uh, uh, Madame Biloa. I think that, uh, again, science has, has helped to demystify uh, a lot of things. And there is genetically modified food, and there is today the improvement, for example, in seedling or in the, the makeup of, of, uh, of, of food that, that creates better yield, for example. I'll give you an instance. Uh, I own an agriculture business and we supply the supermarket chains in, in Nigeria. And today, with science, with you know, uh, better seedling, uh, you're able to produce in a 200,000 meters a greenhouse controlled environment agriculture situation more food uh, to supply the supermarket chains than we were able to do in 200 hectares of you know, open air farmland uh, today. There, what is important in all of this is the safety and health and how to prove the safety of the, the seedlings that we use to produce uh, food today. And I think that the issue of GMO is still one of those issues that are out there. I don't know what the official policy uh, uh, on them is, but certainly science has helped to prove that some of the practices that were yesterday seen as taboo are actually uh, uh, safe today. With regards to the question over there, yes, it starts with policy. And this is very ironical, especially for us coming from, from Africa. Um, many, many years ago, Nigeria gave the first uh, palm uh, seedling or palm uh, uh, um, uh, trees to Malaysia. And today, the reverse is the case where palm oil is imported from Malaysia into Nigeria. Very sad situation, but yes, it starts from public policy, from governments realizing that uh, there is a big impact in not doing anything, and there is a big impact in doing something. And coupled to that is that private sector starts to see the economic benefits of making sure that there is resilience around supply chains. Today you have a lot of uh, uh, the, the meals, the, the flour meals, for example, uh, in Africa, starting to see that you have all of these machinery and production lines, but you need supply chain um, uh, 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 contribution from places like Ukraine, for example, to, to get wheat 
uh, you know, to make sure that the, the factories are running. The more these people start, the more the private sector starts to realize the impact of this, then maybe the hands of uh, governments are forced with regards to public policy. But spot on, it's, uh, it, it's the truth. Uh, Cameron? Uh, this is a very important thing that you raised. Uh, at Canal Sugar, we work with 6,000 farmers. We'll reach about 20,000 farmers within three more years. You are right. Uh, the farmers do all the work, and they get maybe 10 cents on the dollar from anything that's done. If there is uh, food waste uh, due to supply chain, the farmer is the uh, he or she, and mostly it's she, the farmers. People think of farmers, they're only men, mostly they're women. They are the ones uh, who suffer. When it comes to public policy, people in agriculture, people forget the Treaty of Rome before the EU was probably in the beginning purely an agriculture uh, project. Uh, the farmers are suffering all over the world. One of the issues is the uh, uh, lack of development in the public policy format, in the legislation format. They don't have access to legal papers for their land, so they cannot get financing for, for the land because generally it's the land is given or inherited or is owned by several people. So they have to go to the industry, the other part of private sector who will charge them so much uh, for uh, ensuring funding. And then the same thing on access to technology and access to, to seeds and, and what have you. Uh, you are right that uh, this is, uh, this is a, a shame that agriculture remains as part of the GDPs of most countries, relatively much smaller than other parts, uh, the other sectors. And you are, you are spot on. The farmer is now an educated person. And sooner or later, if he or she will not vote with their, with their uh, electrical vote, they will vote with, uh, in different ways. And it could become a ticking, uh, a ticking, a ticking bomb. So uh, I, I appreciated the, the question. We didn't address it in our presentation because that wasn't part of our brief on discussion. But we would need a quick uh, update of public uh, policy, of environmental, of legislative uh, changes that will cater to the, uh, the traditional farmer. What we do is mechanized farming, which is different, but we will not be successful without working with the traditional farmers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh Mr. Kamel, and uh, uh, yes, 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 I'm not forgetting you because I'm sure that uh, as, a, as a FAO official and senior official, you would be very happy to address the issue of public policy. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. And, uh, and look, at, I, I refer to many issues related to policy. For example, the, the repurposing agenda is completely linked to policies linked to the information of the true cost accounting, which will be modifying significantly the way we align policies. But also, when we talk about innovation and science, which is central, uh, it's one of the elements that we need to accelerate together with data, but also with institutions. A, new, a good policy of innovation and science requires policies behind to set them up, requires institutions in place. If not, it would be very complex. So for sure, uh, everything that we have been talking, at least everything that I talk, is linked to, to, to the design and policies, but we need to be careful not to bring distortive policies that could have worked in the past, but not necessarily will work today. We are in a different environment, and we need to be very careful not to create new distortions. Second, I, I think it's important uh, to correct some issues. Uh, Biofertification cannot happen, does not in increase nutrition capacity. The only way you can increase nutrition capacity of a crop is through biotechnology, which is not biofortification. And the other element which was uh, wrong, uh, GMOs are not accepted and generalized, of course not. GMOs are, are managed and decided by each country, uh, and there is a lot of scientific evidence behind them, especially more than GMOs on gene editing today, uh, but this is country by country decision and the institutions and regulations have to be in place in each of, of the countries. So, so we need to be careful uh, with that. And even in Europe, of course, uh, GMOs are not there, and uh, there is still discussions on gene editing. So again, there is a lot of evidence already in place that we need to bring to inform people, but we need to assess all the different elements. And finally, on the, on the control environments, horizontal and vertical, so you can have control environments horizontally and vertically. Horizontal have been cost-effective. UAE is an extreme example because it's very costly to produce food in the UAE, but they are profitable in China, Vietnam, Singapore. It's very profitable. Vertical farming is also starting to be profitable in terms of control environments. There are very good examples in China and Singapore and other regions of the world. So again, it's a way to satisfy food 
for the urban areas because you get closer to them in terms of production of vegetables and other high value commodities. And that is not GMOs, that is not a biotechnology, it's basically it's a high level precision agriculture to manage properly micronutrients to the, to the plants and, and water provision and of course uh, uh, the heat that is needed. So again, it's, it's a technological innovation when you are in the high end of high value commodities, which is starting to be evolving rapidly and to make give access to urban, especially for uh, households. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Cullen. We are, we are now, for these very interesting comments, we are now at the end of the session. I just would like to add, uh, personally, that I've spent uh, uh, now at least three decades of my professional life uh, supporting governments for establishing uh, public agricultural policies in developing countries, uh, in Asia, in Africa, etc. And uh, it's uh, building on uh, Philippe's uh, comment, it's of course a sobering situation to see that in many developing countries, not all, of course, but in many developing countries, agriculture uh, has a much lower share of uh, budget, investment, and policy attention than it should if we wanted to address all the issues that we have here. So that's a reason for which I'm particularly uh, grateful uh, to the WPC, uh, Thierry, Mrs. Kwan, for insisting on having this discussion on agriculture, because it's, it's not only about discussing the substance, but also just per se, because there's discussion uh, around it, and whatever we say, that it shows the importance that it has in the global agenda, an importance which is really uh, underestimated by uh, many uh, policy players. So uh, thank you very much for allowing us to uh, have this type of discussion. Continuing, maybe if there is another discussion next year, trying to deepen even more uh, some of these uh, policy dimensions at the global level, but also at the national level. Uh, level and trying to dig into this, this agenda. Now, I think that all of you will have recognized that we had uh, an, an, uh, a fantastic group to address those issues uh, on the screen and in the room, and that they have uh, enlightened us uh, with their vision on policies, private uh, investments and, and initiatives, uh, science, uh, that uh, opening new doors into our vision. So please uh, applaud them and thank them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the final session of day one in the plenary ballroom. We invite you now to join us in the dining hall for dinner and a conversation with Kevin Rudd. Thank you. <laughs>